Hello, my name is Sumit Shukla and in this particular video, I'll be helping you with all the basics that you need to start your journey with the library Pandas. But before we start this video, don't forget to check out Scalar's free masterclass on Scalar's event page by industry leading experts. The link is in the description box. In this particular video, first of all, we will start with Python basics and then we will proceed with Pandas basics. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe to our Scalar's YouTube channel. So let's start understanding about how we can work with Python. Now, if we talk about any programming language, we have to first of all understand some basics, like what exactly is data? What are the various data types? How we can hold that data? And then processing comes into picture. So we will first of all understand understand the basic and then we will be talking about how we can write simple program in python followed by next thing is pandas so how to basically start with python let me write down some raw data one two three four five six two point seven three point six four point nine 5.8, 2.88, then Sumit, Shukla, Data, then Scientist, and then we have, let's say, True, False, True, False. Now, all together, this particular this this all together we can call this thing as data this is basically my raw data or maybe information now each information over here or maybe each data point over here belongs to a certain type so here the very first series of data belongs to the type known as integer and in python we call them as int or maybe represent them as int then we have floating point numbers so these are my decimal numbers floating and we call them as float in Python. Then we have a string. Now these are my textual data. So I'll call them as a string. And they are represented as str in Python. And then these things are known as the Boolean data. We call them as Bool, B -O -O -L. So these are my data types. These are my data types. And this is particularly my data. Now these are the representations. So how we will represent or maybe how this particular data is represented in Python. So this kind of data is known as integer data for which we use int as the description maybe this uh, representation now the next point is how we process this data before we process this data we need one more thing let's take a very simple example let's say if i have to prepare t so i have to prepare t what all components I need, what all raw material I need. So let's quickly write down the raw materials. I need uh, the very first thing is tea leaves. I need maybe milk. I need sugar. I need water. I need, um, let's say ginger. What I'll, uh, maybe you need a stove also. But the very important component 
that we need before we can even process this raw material is the container. So the very first thing that we need is the container. And that is what the necessity comes when you have to process this raw data. So if I have to process this raw data, I need a container. So if we have to process raw data, what I need, I need container. And these containers or maybe the data containers that hold the data for processing are known as the data objects. They are the data objects. So the data objects that we have are list, tuple, sets, a string dictionary. Now these are my data objects that we have in Python. A data object is nothing but a data container which holds the data for processing. As simple as this. Now we have understood three main important terms. Number one is the raw data that we have followed by various data types and the data containers or maybe the data objects. But you guys must be thinking that why we have so many data objects? Why not only one? Why need why we need so many containers? Now let's take a very general example. Let's say if I have to prepare or maybe if I have to cook rice, will I be using the same tea container? If I have to prepare chapati, will I be using the same tea container? If I have to fry something, will I be using the same tea container? The answer is no, we will not be using it. So in our kitchen, for each specific item which we are looking to cook, we have a specific container and the same idea goes with Python also. Here we have different type of data containers because each container is designed for a specific task and it comes with certain set of rules and regulations. So here each data object is designed for a, a specific task and comes with certain rules and regulations. So this is the concept of data objects. Now, once we have understood what is my raw data followed by what are the data types followed by what are the data objects, let's try to now understand the term variable because this is a most confusing term. So let's try to understand with an again with an example. Let's say we have some containers. So this is my container number one, another container another container with a different shape and another container with a different shape. So we have four containers over here. Let's put some content into them. Container one, container two, container three and container four. So each container over here is consisting of some kind of balls. And in order to make it different, I'm just putting random number of balls. Now, let's say we have a boy or maybe a kid, a kid, a child. And you want this kid 
to bring out this container for you now how you will explain this particular kid to bring this container now this particular kid does not understand count so you cannot say that bring a particular container which is having five balls because this container and this container both of them are having five balls you cannot ask the boy to bring a container which is having combination of red and blue ball because both the containers are having combination of red and blue ball now the very easy way to help this particular kid bring out one of the container is either you can number them or you can name them so numbering and naming both are the same thing so i will name them i'll call this as a this as b this as c and this as d and that is what the concept of data objects are a variable is nothing but a name given to a data object or a data item so here this a b c d these are my names which we have given to these containers right so what is a variable a variable is basically a name given to a data object or a data item when i say data item i basically means integer float a string boolean that basically act as a reference that act as a reference so please remember that there is a difference between a data object and a variable data object is a container it holds your data while variable is just the name or a reference given to a data object or a data item for example list float string or boolean so i hope you guys are now clear with the four major terms what are what is my raw data what are the various data types in python what are the various data objects which are basically data containers in python and at last what are the various variables so now let's understand how to write a simple python program now if you wanted to use python you have multiple ways if you want to quickly start working with python you can use google collaboratory google collaboratory is basically a product from google and if you wanted to access it you can just google google collaboratory google collab python and this first link which says collab.research.google.com you can use this to quickly start working with python so here in this session i'll be using the same platform so that you guys do not need any kind of installation we have another method also you guys can also install anaconda which is the very best or maybe i would say a very easiest way to start with python when your objective is to use it for data science so here we do not need to install anything when we, when we use google collaboratory it is very fast we do not have to make an installation we do not have to download it it is basically a cloud interface we get a web interface which is connected with the cloud so that we can quickly start writing our code and processing our code so how we can use it you have to just go to collab.research.google.com and you have to make sure that you are connected with your google account so if you are using gmail account that basically means you can use this platform for free of cost once you get this kind of interface just click on new notebook and it will launch a new notebook which is basically the interface on which we can write our code now this is the interface that it looks like but before we can start writing our code we have to connect so connect to the server so that it can connect to the python server and we can start processing our code so i'll click on connect and you can see over here it is allocating the resources connecting to the server and once it is connected it will, it will show you connected and it is connected now now 
let's first of all print very simple command which we always do in all the programming languages to print something so let's print print hello world and if i want to execute this i can either click on this play button this will execute my cell or the shortcut key is shift enter to play this now you can see that the output is immediately displayed below the code cell itself so this particular line it, it is known as a code cell where we can input our code where we can write our code now the next thing is let's try to create variables so a is equal to 12 now here please remember one thing that this equal to sign is known as assignment so i'll keep on writing the text uh, to basically note down every points so is equal to means assignment so here what we are trying to do we are trying to assign the value 12 to the variable a so here please remember a is going to act as a variable which is going to refer to the value 12 and if i want to execute it shift shift enter and now if i check a i'll just put a and execute it you will get the value 12 if i check the data type so we can just say type type of a that is integer int so the type is a inbuilt function in python which helps you to find out the data type of a particular variable it can help you with the data type of a variable or a data object also now let's assign or let's create variable for other uh, data types so b is equal to 12.2 again here we are assigning the value 12.2 to the variable b execute it check b and type of b that's float now we will create a variable c with a string so let's say sumit shukla let's execute this check c and let's check the type of c that's a string similarly d is equal to true now here as soon as i write true please remember here if i want to declare true as a boolean object we have to put it with a capital t we cannot put it without the capital t so if i put it like without capital t like this it will not be considered as an object it will be considered as a variable and since we haven't assigned any value to this variable you will get error so name true is not defined because we haven't defined true yet we have defined a b c these are my variables which we have already defined but we haven't defined true so in order to make this as boolean i have to put capital t and execute it and if i check the type of d that's bool so let's print all of them in one shot a b c and d and you can see that all the values are getting printed 12 12.2 sumish shukla and true now we have created the assignment operator we have understood how we can assign a value to the variable we use one more operator which is known as the equality operator so if i use this is, is equal to sign for two times this is equality now what is the meaning of this equality check so if i say a now you remember that a was 12 if i say a is equal to equal to 12 now this becomes a equality check code where we are trying to check if the variable a consists of the value 12 or not 
So if my variable a is holding the value 12 or not. Now since we already know that variable a is holding value 12, we'll get the output as true. But if I say a is equal to equal to 13, we'll get the output as false because a is not holding value 13, it is holding value 12. Similarly, we have the not equal to operator. Now how we can define not equal to? We can, we can say exclamatory mark equal to that is not equal to non equality equality check. So let's check it out. If I say a is not equal to 13, that's true because a is equal to 12. So this is how we can use the equality check operators to basically compare if a particular uh, if a particular variable is holding a certain value or not. So we have understood about assignment, equality check, not equality check. We have declared some variables. Now let's do a quick mathematical operations. So here we are not going to cover everything, but we will be covering all the basics which you need to work with pandas because here the objective is to get you guys started with pandas. So we are understanding the little bit of Python first of all, and then we will jump to pandas. Now here we have understood that how we can assign a variable, how we can check the data type of a variable, how we can perform non-equality and equality check operators. Now let's do a little bit quick maths. So let's say I'm having two values, a is equal to 12, b is equal to two. And here we have two variables, a and b, if I say a plus b, I'll get 14. So this is addition, a minus b, that's subtraction. If I say a divided by b, a slash b is divided by b, that's six. Uh, here for division, we have a total of three operators. Uh, so let's quickly look into them. So I'll add a text. So the very first is a single slash, which is known as the float division, you will get the absolute float value. The second one is double slash. Now this one is known as the floor division, floor division. And I'll tell you what is the meaning of floor division. And then we have the modulus operator percentage, which returns you the reminder. When you divide a number with some another number, the number or maybe the reminder that you get is returned by this percent operator. So these are the three operators which we have for division. Let's create a variable a with value as 13, b as 2. Now if I say a divided by b, I'll get 6.5, right? Now if I say a slash slash b here i will bring this float value towards the nearest lower integer so if you assume a number line and 6.5 is over here then the nearest lower integer is 6 and that is what this particular division is going to do so this is floor division what it will do it will bring down the float value to the lowest or the nearest integer down the line, not above the line, down the line because it is floor. So I'll get the answer as six. The next thing is percent operator. So if I say six percent two, this will return you, sorry, percent P. This will return you one because when we divide 13 with 2, so two ti 6 times 2 is 12, you will be left with a remainder of 1 and that is what is returned by this particular percent operator. So these are my some division operators. Finally, we have multiplication. So if I say a star b, that's a multiplied by b. But if you want to take power, so a star star b, that is a to the power of b. 
so here i'll say it is a multiplied with b and here i say a to the power of b now now we have understood the basics of like python how to basically write a simple uh, how to declare variables followed by how to do some mathematical operations but we need few more uh, details before we can start with pandas we need to understand what is indexing we need to understand what is slicing and also we need to understand how to write a simple for loop and also how to write conditions so we'll cover up these or uh, these four topics and then we will jump to pandas so let's understand how to perform indexing and slicing what exactly is indexing and slicing before we talk about this let's quickly create a list now list in python is declared using square brackets so list can hold anything we are not going into the details of how various data objects are created and what are the conditions to create a data object here we will try to understand indexing and slicing and then we will try to understand the other operations followed by pandas so 1 2 3 4 2.3 4.5 6 7 8 9 10 and uh, sumit and then true so this is my list and let's create one more list which is the part of this outer list so we have a list l if i check the type of l this is a list and this list is having another list as the last element now list as a data object can hold anything into it and each data point over here is represented as an element let me take you to my presentation to help you understand what is an index and everything in detail so let's quickly create a list 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 sumit and 1 2 3 now here each element so each data point over here is known as an element so each data point in a list or in any data object is known as an element so here how many elements we have if you quickly count it is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 because this is one element so a total of seven elements are there in this list now there is a concept of what is known as index 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 is basically a virtual number given to each element of a particular data object now index is of two types or two kinds one is known as the positive index second one is known as the negative index so we have positive index we have negative index your positive index starts from 0 go all the way up to n minus 1 where n is the number of elements your negative index starts from minus n go all the way up to minus 1 so if i try to map my positive index it will be 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 and my negative index minus 7 minus 6 minus 5 minus 4 minus 3 minus 2 minus 1 so this is the positive index while this one is negative index so we have positive index negative index now if i want to fetch any element 
out of this particular list there is a concept known as indexing so indexing is basically the process of extracting one element out of any data object out of a data object so if i want to index i'll just say l a square bracket i now please remember these square brackets are used as operator to index or slice so for indexing and slicing and i'll be using these square brackets whenever i have to index and slice this is universal in python so anywhere anywhere in python if you have the task of indexing or slicing you will just use a square bracket now i i here is basically the index number so indexing if i have to perform i will first of all write down the variable name followed by the square brackets followed by within that i need to declare the index number let's quickly take one example if i say l of 0 i'll get the output as 1 if i say l of -1 i'll get the complete list because that's my last element if i say l of -6 i'll get 2 so you can use pi a uh, positive index negative index that's not a problem that's what is your indexing let's quickly understand slicing also so let's create a list 1 2 3 uh, 4 sumit true 7 8 9 let's assign the positive and negative index so 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 then minus 7 minus 6 minus 5 minus 4 minus 3 minus 2 minus 1 one more easy method of assigning indexes for positive you can start from 0 and proceed from left to right for negative index you can start from minus 1 proceed from right to left that will easily help you to assign the index now slicing what is slicing slicing is basically the process of extracting group of elements or more than one element out of the list or any data object so if i have to perform slicing i'll say l of because l is my variable name a colon b colon c where a is your start index b is your end index and c is your step size so remember we write so let's say if i have to extract 3 4 sumit i can simply write l of 2 colon 5 colon 1 now why i have written 2 colon 5 colon 1 so let's try to understand that this one here we have index number 2 so i'll start my extraction process from index number 2 i'll go all the way up to index number 5 but it is up to index number 5 so remember this is up to it is not it is not including 5 it is not including b it is up to b and i'll extract every element at a frequency of one step so one means frequency at what step you will extract the element so i am saying one after the other so you will get output as 3 4 and sumit 
and this output will always be in a list because the initial data object is a list so your slicing output will also be in a list that is how we perform slicing now let's quickly understand indexing and slicing with an example in our python interface which is google colab so here we already have list and now let's see indexing so if i say l of 0 we get the first element 1 if i say l of minus 1 we get the last element if i say l of 0 colon 5 which basically means a start from the index number 0 element l of 0 colon 5 which basically means a start from index number 0 element go up to the element which is at index number 5 and extract at frequency of one step because one is default so even if you do not mention it it is not a problem if i extract it or if i run it i am getting one two three four two point three because one two three four two point three this is index number zero index number one index number two index number three index number four so up to four we have extracted everything now let's try to understand how to write a simple condition in, in Python. So in Python conditions are declared using three clause. The first one being if followed by elif followed by else. If, elif and else. How we do it? So let's say if I'm having a variable a is equal to 12. And I wanted to check whether this number is a is a, a even number or a odd number. And I wanted to print that. So I'll say if a percent 2 is equal to equal to 0. I hope you guys now remember or maybe understand this code. So I'm saying if a percent 2, if I divide a with 2 and if the remainder is equivalent to 0 then so for writing then we use semicolon sorry it is colon print even else colon print odd and now you can see we have we are getting even how to write uh, maybe a, a conditional block which is having multiple conditions so let's say I'm having a number 15. Now I have to check if the number is divisible by 3, I have to print div 3 or div 3. If the number is divisible by 5, I have to print div 5. If it is divisible by both 3 and 5, I have to print div 3 comma 5. So this is what I have to do. So let's say if a percent, uh, a percent, 3 and a percent 5 is equal to 0 and this also is equal to 0 then I need to print then I need to print div 3 comma 5 now I have to write a uh, conditional block which is else if so in python we use lf lf a percent 3 is equal to 0 then print div 3 and lf a percent 5 is equal to 0 then print div Five. Else, I'll print a statement which says the number is neither divisible by 3 nor by 5. And let's try to ex execute it. We are getting div 3 comma 5 because this number 15 is divisible by both 3 and 5. If I change the number to let's say 12. I'll get div3 if I change the number to let's say 
10, I'll get the IV5. If I change the number to let's say 7, I'll get the number is neither divisible by 3 nor by 5. This is how we can write simple conditional block. Now let's quickly understand how to write a loop. So we have already created a list L. Now let's say I have to iterate through this list. I have to iterate from one element to another element in this list. So in order to write a loop, I say for then i in L print i. Now this is a simple loop block. This is a simple code block to write a for loop. Now let's understand this. This is very simple. I am saying for which basically means I wanted to write a for loop i. i is a variable. Now this i can be anything. You can have i as since we are talking about iterations that's the reason we call it as i. But you can have j, k, l, m, your name, my name, anything. So i and where from where I'm getting this i in l which is l is my list rate object. So I'm saying write a for loop where I'm taking the variable i from the list l and print i and that is the reason you can see that we are able to print each of the element. This is how we can write a simple for loop. Now these were the topics or maybe I would say we have not covered any topic in much detail but I try to give you a, a sense of or maybe an overview of all the basic topics that you need to start with pandas. So now let's start with pandas to understand how we can manipulate data. Now pandas is a library and pandas is basically the, the full form of pandas is panel data. And there are multiple full forms. Uh, there is no correct full form. What is the, the extension for pandas? But pandas is a core library for data manipulation and handling. So whatsoever you think of doing in Excel, and whatsoever you wanted to do in Excel, like you wanted to filter the data, format the data, slice the data, maybe uh, sort the data, apply pivot on the data. So everything that you can do in Excel is something which we can do in Pandas. But since Pandas is working on top of Python, it is really fast and optimized. So it was, so it works very easily with large data set. So now in order to start with pandas, we have to first of all understand the concept of the data objects in pandas. As we have learnt in Python, the base Python. For base Python, we have the data objects which are less tuple, sets, a string, and dictionary. Similarly, for pandas, the data objects are number one, series, and number two, it's a data frame. Series and a data frame. Now these are the two data objects for the library pandas. As you guys already know, if I want to process the data, I need a container. So these are the two containers in the pandas library. Now let's say I'm having a CSV file. and I wanted to process the CSV file or do some kind of data manipulation on top of this CSV file. So the very first step that I'll follow is to load this file into a pandas data frame. Pandas data frame, which is basically the data object for pandas. 
so i'll get a result like this and now i can perform any kind of data manipulation so data manipulation and analysis now this is the reason we need the pandas data frame which is basically the data object for pandas library so for pandas we have two data objects series and data frame what is the difference between them a data frame is a basically a data structure which comes with rows and columns so we have multiple rows and we have multiple columns so let's say this is my column number 1 column number 2 column number 3 column number 4 column 5 column 6 and this is row number 0 row number 1 row number 2 row number 3 and so on row these are known as your row index and these are known as your column headers and here we fill the data now this complete structure is known as a data frame while each column of this data frame each column of this data frame is known as an series so combination of multiple series creates your data frame if i extract one column out of the data frame it would be a series but combination of multiple series so this is series 1 series 2 series 3 series 4 series 5 series 6 so the combination of multiple series creates a data frame so even if i'm having two series s1 s2 and if i'm extracting two columns out of a data frame it would be a data frame if i extract a single column out of a data frame it would be a series so that is what a series and a data frame is now let's try to understand this complete logic how to work with pandas what all basic operations we can do with pandas and how pandas can make our life easy when it comes to processing huge amount of data in python let's directly jump to google collaboratory now here we'll be trying to understand how we can do various operation with the pandas library to analyze the data to process the data title this as pandas the very first thing that i need is the data now you can either generate your data or you can get the data from the existing source so i can get the data from a csv file from a excel file from a json file from a html file so there are multiple source from where we can get the data put it in the pandas data frame and then perform the analysis here if we want to do any operations using the library pandas the very first thing that we have to do is to activate that library or maybe call that library because that library is by default not available to us as of now so the easy way to do this is in python we write import so i wanted to import the library pandas as pd i am saying import the library pandas as pd now pd is basically a keyword it is like a variable you can say it's not exactly a variable it is basically a keyword or a alias that i am using for the library pandas so instead of using pandas everywhere in my code i will be using pd as a keyword to use any of the functionalities that comes within pandas library now this keyword pandas or maybe this keyword pd is not something which is compulsory to use you can use ad you can use dd you can use sd 
you can use your name you can use my name it is up to you but since in the data science industry since in the technology world those people who are using python pd is a very popular word and it has become like a benchmark or i would say it has become like a default keyword that everyone prefer to use so i would suggest all of you to stick with pd so that even if somebody is trying to read your code they can understand that you are trying to use a function from the library pandas because pd is a alias a very popular alias for pandas library so let's run this and you can see we have a green tick mark which basically means we have successfully loaded the pandas library now let's try to create a series so i'll say pd dot series and series with a capital s and i'll pass a list to it to this so 1 2 3 4 our series is a data object that you can see comes with a default index so these are my row index so this value is at row index 0 this value is at row index 1 and so on now if i preserve this to the value or the variable s1 and if i check the type of s1 it is pandas core series and finally you can read it is a series similarly let's say i'm having a dictionary now we haven't talk about dictionary in detail but dictionary is also a data object in python which consists of data in a key value pair format so i am having a dictionary which is having a and having values in list 1 2 3 then i am having b capital b and i am having values in list 4 5 6 and then i am having c and then i'm having another list with 7 8 9 now this is my dictionary and i wanted to convert this dictionary into a data frame i'll say pd dot data frame now please remember in this function d is capital followed by f is also capital and i'll pass my dictionary d now you'll see that this has been converted to a structure which is looking like a excel file having rows and columns so this is a data frame i can preserve this in a variable let's say df df stands for data frame and now if i check the type of df it would be a pandas core frame it's a data frame so we have understood how to create a series we have understood how to create a data frame but this is not how we are going to proceed the process that we generally follow or most of the, the time we are going to follow is getting the data from some source and then processing it or maybe loading it in pandas data frame and then trying to do some manipulation on top of it so that is what we are going to do in this particular video also let's first of all get the data now since we are using a interface which is running on cloud i have to first of all upload the data in this cloud interface so here in this particular video we will we are using how to upload the data in this particular cloud interface but we have another video also where i have explained everything regarding how to upload the data in using excel files that you have in your local system also so you can refer to that video also in order to upload a file in this google collab platform the very first thing you have to do is click on this file option then you will find out the upload to session storage click on this and then you can navigate yourself to the location where you have the data i will i have the data in the download folder and this is the file which i was looking for the train file and i'll open it it is basically asking us to ensure that this file is only available for one current session 
So as soon as I close this file and I come back to this platform tomorrow, I would not find this file available to me. So I have to re-upload it. This is what this warning means. So I'll click OK, which I am very much OK with this process. And my file has been uploaded. Now I'll go to these three dots and I'll copy the path and I'll close this now. Now in order to load a file into a pandas data frame, I'll say df is equal to, df is nothing but a variable, pd dot read underscore csv. Because this is a csv file. This file is a csv file. So I'm using read underscore csv. Now, if I delete this, if I just write pd dot and you can see that I'm able to get all the functions which I can apply with PD. So there is read underscore CSV and we will have multiple other options. So let's write R E A D and then it will show me all the options which starts with read. So read clipboard, read CSV, read Excel, feather, FWF, GBQ, HDF, HTML, JSON, ORC, Percat, Pickle, SAS, SPSS, SQL, SQL Query, SQL Table, Stata, Table, XML. These are all the sources from which I can get my data, put it in the Pandas data frame and then we can process it. As of now, my objective is to get the data from the CSV file, so I'll use read underscore csp parentheses and I'll paste my location. So control V. Now this is the location. Now please remember, since we are um, mentioning the location, it is needed to be in inverted commas. So I'll put inverted commas and I'll execute this. Now my code was successfully executed. Let's check the type of DF. It is a data frame. Let's check the data frame DF. Now here you can see that this is how the data looks like. We have some rows. There are a total of 891 rows, some columns. And this data is all about whether a passenger survived or not in a Titanic incident or in a Titanic incident that happened. So this is a Titanic survival data. Now, what are the various operations which we can do? So once you have uploaded your data, once you have uh, the data frame created with your data that you wanted to process, analyze or manipulate, the very first thing is to inspect whether the data was correctly uploaded or not, whether the data is having all the rows and columns as expected or not. So we have to inspect. Now pandas provide us with some inspection tools. So the very first one is df.head. Now what this function do, it returns you the top n rows. By default, the value of n is five. Uh, you, can, you can read the description, it says return the first n rows. This function returns the first n row. And by default, so here you can see that return, it says int is equal to five, which basically means by default, the value of n is 5. So if I run this, I am getting the top 5 rows 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Similarly, we have df.tail, and this particular function returns the bottom 5 rows, returns the last 10 rows. By default, n is 5. So these are my bottom 5 rows. Then we have df.shape. Now, shape is an attribute which basically means it returns you a value, but it will not take any value as an input. In df.tail, I can provide this function with an input. So I can say one. So it will return me the last row. Yeah, I can say uh, three. So it will return me the bottom three rows. But shape will only return you a tuple or maybe an output where you have the number of rows followed by the number of columns. So this data frame, which we are trying to analyze, it is having 
891 rows with 12 columns. Now we have one more function which is df dot columns. Please remember this is not a function. This is a, an this is an attribute. So here it returns all the column names. Now once we have inspected the data frame, the next operation is to find out or maybe to extract a particular column. So df dot head, it returns me the top five rows. Now, I let's say I wanted to uh, fetch out this column survived. So I'll say df, as you guys already know, we have learned about this previously, that if I have to perform indexing or slicing, we use a square brackets. So I can say df is square bracket, then I'll mention the name of the column survived and I'll execute it. Now you can see that a particular column is returned as a series. So if I check the type of this particular code, which is returning a series, this is a series. But if I try to extract two columns, so I'll say df a square bracket. Now within this square bracket, since I have to extract more than one column, I have to provide this as a list of column names. So I'll say list and within this list, I'll mention the column. Let's say I want the column survived and passenger class. Survived column comma P class. Now you can see that once we extracted more than one column, it got extracted as a data frame. So if I quickly check the data type or maybe the type of this particular output, it is a data frame. So this is what the difference is between a series and a, a data frame. Series is basically the uh, the building block of a data frame. When you combine multiple series, you get a data frame. Now let's understand how we can perform basic mathematical operations on a column. Given the survived column, let's say I wanted to find out the number of customers who survived. Now, since the data is having ones and zero, where one means the passenger survived and zero means the passenger did not survive. I'll simply take the sum of this column. So wherever there is a one, I'm going to add all the ones and you will get the total number of ones. So I'll say dot sum. If you have to apply any operation on top of a column or maybe a data frame, we use dot and then the function. So dot sum. So we got 342. So these are the number of passengers who survived out of 891. So we can check the percentage also. 342 divided by 891. So this is returning me the ratio. I'll multiply this with 100. So I'll put this in brackets. You don't have to put it, but just to make sure that my code is nice and, nice and clean, multiply with this with 100. And you have the answer as 38.3. So out of all the passengers, only 38% passengers survived. Let's try to extract one more column. Let's say now I'm extracting the column as sex, which is gender. Let's run it. Now here you can see that we have males and females. If I wanted to count the number of males and females, they have multiple operations like how we can group the data, how we can group and aggregate the data. But in this video, we are trying to keep everything very simple. So let's not talk about grouping, but we have a very simple function which can help you to do this. The function name is value count. And it will quickly return you the count of each category in 
descending order so since males were more than females we got we got the first row as male 577 female 314 so this is basically a series which is returned as an output now similarly let's say i wanted to find out a uh, passenger class how many passengers were traveling in each of the class so we can simply say df p class dot value underscore count and here we have the answer so most of the passengers were traveling to the third class followed by first and then followed by second now let's say i also want to uh find the maximum find the minimum so let's say given the fare column i want to find the maximum fare minimum fare average fare how we can do this quickly extract the fare column then for maximum max similarly for minimum min similarly for average we have mean and finally if i wanted to find out standard deviation in any other metric we have the functions for them also so dot std for standard deviation so these are the mathematical functions which you can apply uh let's say i wanted to find the count the number of rows so for count we have c o u n t count and it will return me the num the total number now let's say i wanted to perform calculations using these these outputs so i wanted to find out average by manually writing the formula so df fare dot sum and then i'll divide this output with df fare dot count so here this is this particular part is going to return me the total fare this is going to return me the number of rows and that is basically my average 32.204 and that's what we got over here also right so this is how we can combine multiple formulas to fill basically perform various mathematical operations so this is what we have understood like these were the very like very basic operations that we can do with pandas we have a lot more detailed video on this now let us move on to very very simple input and output in python so before we move on to input and output in python let me quickly show you if you want to read something if you want to read a particular value in java what you have to write right so i'm just going to compare the languages over here so in java you would do something like this import java.io.star right then you will do public class main class right you will do public static void main string args right you will do throws i o exception right and in there you will do something like buffered reader bi equals to new buffered reader new input stream reader uh uh reader system dot in right and then when you finally want to use something if you want to read something you will say string of uh, input a string my input equals to br dot read line right? this is what you will have to write in a language like java to read a simple simple value a simple string from the user now this is this is horrific right this is horrific in python you don't have to do any of these python you don't have to do anything that complicated python is very simple it is very elegant basically what you can do is you can simply do input give me a string right 
you can do it as something as simple as this right you don't really have to put this as well so you can remove this you can remove this as well so if i if i just if i just write input with these two brackets and i hit enter it will wait right? it did not give me anything back the reason it did not give me anything back is because it is waiting for an input okay it is waiting for an input so i can give some input over here some input over here and when i press enter this input will be returned to me right this function will give me back whatever i have input sorry i can also store this in a variable so i can say x equals to input if i do x equals to input it is one once again waiting for input and i will have some value over here right and when i press enter this value has been this value has been assigned to x so if i if i do x over here then you will see that okay this x has this value right perfect now when you are so it is it doesn't really look nice right when when i did some input over here it doesn't really look nice that the person does not really know what to do it it tells me nothing it just waits around not the best thing right? so what i can do over here is i can come and say input and i can give it a prompt right i can give it a prompt like give me a string okay so now when i press enter this prompt will be displayed this prompt will be displayed so that the user knows that okay i have to enter something so something is entered right now once again you will see that all right it 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 does this does not look pretty right this does not look pretty so usually in your prompt you would want to include a space at the end right? you would you would create something like this you would write something like this so you will in, in this string itself you will include a colon and a space so that you get this pretty output over here right so that if you type something then it is clear that okay this was the prompt and this was the input all right so this is the basic way we do inputs in python cool now suppose you want to read an integer right suppose you want to read two values suppose you want to read two numbers and you want to add them up okay so let me just clear this screen so what will you do if you do a equals to input right so let me enter 10 and if you do b equals to input let me enter 50 right and if you try to add them up a plus b Right. If you try to add them up, you get this weird result: ten fifty. Ten plus fifty is not ten fifty, right? Ten plus fifty is sixty. Right. So what happened over here was, whenever you do an input, whenever you do an input, the value is returned as a string. Right. So don't worry about what I'm typing right now. But if I ask for the type of it, right, then it will say that okay, it is a string. Okay. What I am trying to get as input is a number. What I am trying to get as input is a number. So for example, a thing like type of 10 this will be an integer so i am trying to get an integer so what you will have to do is you will have to convert this number into an integer convert this string into an integer the way you can do that is simply put the int function around it right so if you have int 10 right if i have int 10 it will give me back the number 10 okay i give it a string with 10 and it will give me back a number with 10 so i can come over here and say a equals to input sorry int input right and now it will wait for an input it will take that input it will convert it into an integer and then it will save it in the variable a is that clear so if i press enter now i can enter a value 1 through 2 4 and now a has an integer if i ask for the type of a now it will be an integer all right perfect so what we are going to do is we are going to say a equals to int input right and so we have some value over here b equals to int input We have another value over here, and now we can do a plus b, and it will give us the back, give us back the result thirty. All right, very very basic stuff. Okay, moving on. So now, basically, what I want to introduce is so this this still feels a little weird, right? This still feels a little weird that when we ask for input, we have to get to give the input immediately. So now let us move on from the REPL. So this black portion is called the REPL. Right? Let us move from this to a file. on the left you see main.py this is a file this file is stored over here okay this file is stored over here in this directory files all right so let us try to write our programs over here in the left part okay so i can write the same program in the left part i can say a equals to int input right and over here you will see something popping up so this is called intellisense this is called autocomplete Right, so your editor, if your editor is good, it will try to tell you. It will try to give you some documentation. It will try to help you in writing the code. Okay, so it will tell you that this int that this int function this converts a number or a string to an integer. Right. Similarly, if you go to this input function over here, right. If you go to this input function, 
it tells you that this reads a string from the standard input. All right. So I can come over here and I can say a equals to int input. And I can say b equals to int input. And then I can say print. I can actually say a plus b. Right. Now let me try to run this. Let me try to run this. So to run this, I will hit this big green button over here. Right. I will hit this big green button. Now, when you have Python installed on your system, finally, this is not, I mean, there's no, there will be no big green red button over there. Right. So we will see how to how to run the Python from our terminal, from our command line, when all of you have installed Python. Right. So in the next class, we'll see how to actually run Python from the command line. But for now, to run this program, to run this program that we have written in this file, all we need to do is hit this button. And as soon as we hit this button, you will see that hmm, nothing is really happening. That is because it is waiting for input. Right? It is waiting for input. So I can give it a number like five. I can give it a number like six and it ends. It doesn't really give me anything. It doesn't really give me anything. The reason it doesn't give me anything is because I have not printed out these results. Right? I have not printed out this result. So when we were in the rebel space, if I did one plus one, the rebel automatically printed out the value. Right? The rebel automatically printed out the value because the rebel is sort of interactive. Right? This will not happen in user. When you're writing actual code, if you want to print, you have, you have to specifically tell the computer to print. So if I, if I come over here and I say print, right now, if I execute this program, the program will print, print. But before that, let me, let me make one more fix. So let me come over here and give a prompt over here. Right? So I can say enter first number, right? And I can come over here and say enter second number, right? And now when I execute this program, now when I execute this program, you will see that, okay, now I get a pretty prompt over here. Now I get a nice prompt over here. Enter first number. My first number is suppose 12. Enter second number, it is suppose 54, right? And then it will give me the addition back. 12 plus 54 equals to 66. Is that clear? Yes, this is how we do input and output in Python. Simply the input function, if you want to convert it into an integer, you you pass, you pass it into the int function, right? And to print something, you simply print the value, okay? Very simple. Perfect. So this is basically what I want to leave you with today. I mean, today we just covered the very, very basis of Python. Going forward, we will step up our pace. So towards the end of this particular video series, what we want you to do is we wanted to create a, a complete web application in Django and deploy it. Right. So you will have your own website up and running. Okay. So to do that, we will have to pace things up a little. Do not worry though, if you have any questions, whatsoever right feel free to post it in the chat okay during the class if you feel that i'm going too fast or if you feel that something is not clear feel free to ask a question in the chat questions are always welcome all right now once again before tomorrow's class what all of you have to do is you have to go to this particular link real python python 3 installation and setup guide right so the url for that is realpython.com installing python right realpython.com Installing Python. This is the particular link. Okay. So just go over there and see how you can install Python on your operating system. All right. So once you're done with that, we will resume the class tomorrow. There's one more thing. Uh, so if you look in the video description of this particular video, you will see several links. Right? So first link will be to this particular, one of the links will be to this particular repository. Right? One of the link will be to this particular GitHub repository. It will start with github.com. Okay. There will be another link that link will take you to a discussion forum. That link will take you to scalar chat, right? So that, that link will take you to an interface chat.scalar.com. So that is a community where you can come and interact with other students, right? So whoever is watching this YouTube series, those people can come over there. They can chat live with each other. Uh, other students who are at scalar Academy. Right. So at our tech university, those students will be there. So you can chat with them as well. The TAs, the mentors, the instructors, right? Me included. So we will all be present in the chat. So if you have any questions, any further questions, anything that you would like to ask, anything that you would like to clarify, anything that you need help with, just post it over there and we will be able to reply to you. All right. So links in the video description and see you tomorrow. Same time. Okay. 6.30 to 7.30 is the class. Tomorrow we are going to paste it up a little bit. Please make sure that you have Python installed. Perfect. So let us end the class and see you tomorrow. Same time. All right. Bye bye. Basically, we'll start with the recap for the previous session. Uh
let's just begin with the recap from the previous session so basically uh, we discussed about variables in the yesterday session let's say that a variable lecture day is 2 and we try to print this variable so what do you think will be the output for this so i'll be using vs code as my text uh, code editor and basically we have this integrated terminal here and to run the uh, file i can just say python 3 and the file name so it gives the output as 2 right so now uh, basically uh, we also learned about numbers so numbers which can be integers float or complex right so if you remember let me create a variable square area that is 36 right and let me create a variable circle area that is something like 6.28 and let's say iota is minus 1 raised to the power of half so if we try to print out all these variables let's say i print out square area and circle area and then let's say iota so what's going to be the output so if we use a comma in the print statement basically that separates uh, all those variables by a space by default uh, end line is the separator so uh, using a comma here we can print multiple variables directly so if i uh, run this program i should get all these variables 36 6.28 uh, you see there is a space here then again there is a space here and you can see that we get the a third variable that is iota which is a complex number right so numbers can have these three types so all good till this point any doubts about variables and numbers so we also looked at some basic mathematical operators so for example we looked at plus we can say square area plus circle area right so this should basically give me 42.28 so if i try to run this i will get a 42.28 here right so any issues till this point it so uh, let's also see we also looked at some other mathematical operators that we can use let's say 4 into square area and then let's say we try to uh, use the division operator iota by square area so you see that it will give you these three uh, three lines right and you can remember that by default end line or basically end line is basically backslash n this is the default separator so whenever you print anything the def by default uh, you will see a backslash n that is a new line right how to print new line okay rohit is asking a question rohit says how to print output in new line without multiple print statement okay so for that basically we can use let's say uh, we can say we can use the for, for uh, format strings so let's say i can say print f and basically what i will say is i let's say i want to print out square area circle area iota so i can say square area then a backslash n so whatever is inside these curly braces will get printed then circle area backslash n and then iota so let's try to run this uh, i'll just use an integrated uh, python interactive so vs code also provides this uh, python interactive shell right from the file we can use this let me uh, show you the output of this just it's taking a few minutes yeah so you can see that okay square area i think uh square area is defined here let's just try to print square area till this point okay basically i have to uh, re rerun all these uh, all these things let me just rerun all the code from the beginning
okay let's use that one only this is a little slow here let's use the terminal itself that would be easy yeah okay so let's try to run this thing now so it should basically uh, we are doing here a formatted string right whatever is inside the curly braces will get printed like whatever is the value of that variable so you can see that all these three values 36 6.28 and iota value gets printed here right so that's how we can use formatted strings or we call them f strings right so you also learned how to take input from the user uh, so basically about end and separate keywords hers you can try to look up the documentation right let's continue we also learned about taking the input so let's say i want to take two numbers as input from the user so uh, number one is int of input number two is again int of input and then i try to print their sum so that's how we can do this and now it is asking, it is basically waiting for an input from the user. So let me give 100 and 200. So you see that the output gets printed here, that is 300. Uh, so Arijit, the issue here was not this. I basically switched to a different, like I tried to run the uh, file in a different uh, environment. So that's why I had to redeclare. So let's continue. Print number one from uh, plus number two works here. So that's how we take input from the user. And uh, one more thing, like there is one special value that is equal to none. So that here basically means nothing. So like in other other languages, you have null. So it is something like that. So if a variable has no value, we say that it has none value. Okay, it's uh, waiting on input two and three five. And finally, you can see that none get printed here. So variable which has no value, we give it the value none, or it will have the none value, right? Uh, so Himanchu is asking, which editor are you using? I am using the VS Code editor. How to take inputs in a single line? Harsh, we will look at that later. Uh, Sayateja is asking, where can I access the lecture notes? You can access them from the Scalar Academy intro to Python repository. Uh, Tarun, if you couldn't understand anything, just uh, look at the lecture notes once. Uh, like if you have started, was uh, this was just a recap of the previous session, right? So maybe you might have to go back at the previous session once to get these things in detail. So let's continue. Uh, now we will start with control flow today. So we will be basically be learning control flow. Yeah. So. Uh, Aditya is asking about certificates. So one basic announcement here for uh, today's session is like we will be providing you some uh, digital certificates which you can be which you will be accessing able to access after the end of these all the sessions that we will have. So after the entire series on Python gets ended, you will be having a test. We will be creating a test that you can access and that will skill uh, test uh, basically will assess what all you have learned from the sessions right so if you will be able to score above a threshold you will be getting that certificate so that we will be sharing complete details at the end of the lecture series right uh, so rahul uh, just try to uh, think about that uh, once yeah will the notes be there on github with the name yeah so notes repository you can see let me also add it here. You can see the lecture two notes in this, right? So let's continue the session. Basically, uh, let's now go to operators. So we'll first look what operators basically are there. We just saw the addition, multiplication, sub subtraction, division, integer division, these kind of operators from yesterday's class. So today we will be continuing and building upon some more operators, which we need to basically do control flow. So our main agenda for today is understanding control flow. So let's uh, start with some of the operators. We'll look at some relational operators first. So relational operators are basically like less than, greater than, greater than, equal to, less than, equal to. So let us say you have a variable a equal to three, right? And you want to know whether 
a condition a less than 3 holds true or not so you can just uh, create a variable less than a less than 3 and say a less than 3 right so this equal to is basically an assignment operator so equal to is an assignment operator it is not checking for equality it is assigning so if i say a equal to b so what basically happens is this variable a gets the value b so value b gets assigned to the variable a right value b gets assigned to the variable a right so what do you think will be stored in the variable less than 3 so basically uh, there are two type of boolean variables that come into picture here true and false right so a condition would have either a true value or a false value so here a less than 3 what do you think a less than 3 is true or false so uh, what should be the output in table less than 3 what do you all say false so everyone says false right so let's try to print the variable less than 3 and also let's try to print what is the type of variable less than 3 right so let's try to see uh, python3 operators.py so you can see that the output is false and the type of this variable is class bool right so this variable basically stores a false value a boolean false value right had it been a less than equal to 3 the value here should have been true right so that's how you can use the conditional uh, relational less than and less than equal to operator similarly there is greater than and greater than equal to right now uh, there are two or uh, two more operators that are equal to double equals and not equal so let's say we want to check whether a equals to 3 so equals 3 so i can simply say a equal to a equal to 3 right so this condition gets evaluated and then this gets assigned into this variable equals 3 so if i try to print out equals 3 this should give me the variable uh, result true so as you can see it is true let me comment out the above ones so you can see a is equal to 3 so that's why this variable equals 3 gets me true so now what if let's say i say equals 3 is a not equal to 3 right so then if you uh, let's say not equals 3 right so this variable exclamation equal to refers to the uh, refers to the relational operator not equal to it will return true if a is not equal to uh, 3 so let's say if we try to print not equals 3 it should give us a value false why because a is not uh, not equals 3 right a not equals 3 is false because a is equal to 3 right had it been 5 so if a had been 5 5 that it would then it would return true because 5 is not equal to 3 that means it is true right 3 is not equal to 3 was false so any doubts till this point everything is clear till this point shall we uh, resume okay so similarly we can compare uh, strings as well okay similarly we can compare strings as well so let's say that we have two strings let's say we have string one s1 equal to interview bit s2 equal to scalar so when we say print s1 s s1 is less than s2 so what it will does is it will compare the strings lexicographically so in the dictionary order basically it will check starting from the first character if i is less than s so basically i is less than s so it will return true so as you can see the last print that will be giving us true right so had i been using here let's say s1 is small s right s1 is scalar and s2 is capital s right so then basically what happens is then this will print a false why because small s is not less than capital s so in in uh, in computers basically in programming the uh, characters are stored in ascii format so you can just remember this this is a american standard code for in information entertain and basically the capital letters come before the small letters so you can just remember this fact and try uh, researching more about this right so let's continue if everything is clear if you have any questions please ask Okay, so let's now continue. We will uh, resume with the con uh, control flow. 
so now we have learned about some of the operators uh, okay let's also look at some of the logical operators so there are three more logical operators that are and or not so basically before we get to control flow we must know how to operate on these conditional or the logical operators right so if you can uh, see let's say we have a variable x equal to 5 and i say result 1 is simply nothing but x is less than 1 or x is greater than equal to 10 so what do you think is going to be the output of this variable so here what we are doing is we are combining two conditions so this this will be having one result one boolean value this will be having another boolean value so when we say two boolean values or so that will return true when either of those boolean values is true so here x less than 1 is false x greater than equal to 10 is also false so both of them are false so the output should be false so you can see that the last uh, statement returns a false right so uh, if i had if i had said that x is equal to 11 so then it would be giving me a value of true why because the second condition x greater than equal to 10 now returns a very uh, value true so either of the two conditions have to be true for the or operator to re uh, return true similarly for the and operator both of the conditions have to be true so if i now say x less than 1 and x greater than equal to 10 and i try to print result to so it will basically give me a false value here why because x less than 1 is now false right so this and operator will give an output of true when both of the conditions are true so any doubts till this point <clears throat> yeah pratham you are right if the first character equal then next so that is how the strings will be compared lexicographically you are ex exactly right so there is one operator not as well so that will basically return the negation or the opposite of uh, the condition so let us say if i say print not of result 2 so that should basically print a true here because result 2 was false right so you see the last one will be returning a true here right so let's continue now you have learned about the logical operators and the relational operators we are good to go for understanding conditionals so basically the motivation behind the uh, conditionals is that in our general life also decision making plays a very important role right so in general life in real life we have to make a lot of decisions right so in programming also we have to make a lot of decisions and depending upon the output of a particular condition we will be evaluating a condition and based on the output will be uh, going to some part of the code and if that condition is true then some part if it is false then some part so likewise like let's take a example so let's uh, say that uh, you your mother tells you to go to vegetable market and says that buy uh, buy, uh for buying some vegetables vegetables and tells you to buy cabbage uh, and also says that if cabbage is not available then buy broccoli so you have to go to market you first ask whether broccoli uh, whether the cabbage is Uh, available if it is then you will buy that otherwise you will buy broccoli right and in the third case when none of these is present in the vegetable market you will simply come back home without anything right so these conditionals uh, are very important in real life decision making and also in programming right so uh, that's why we have the constructs like if else and else if so in python we will have elif for using else if so first let's uh, simply write down a program that takes an integer as input so we are taking an integer as input and if this integer is less than 1 so there is a parameter x and if this parameter x is basically less than 1 or greater than 10 so then the uh, message is read so let's say we will have to print that the message is read right otherwise it is a polite message right so what we can say is if x is less than 1 so whatever is the condition so this condition will get evaluated as we have seen in the uh, operators there are these conditions that we check right so it will have a boolean output true or false right so this condition gets evaluated now after this what piece of code gets executed so you have to write a colon so the syntax is if 
followed by the condition then you write down a column and then you press enter so if you have uh, if you are using some code editor it will automatically give some indentation of two spaces or four spaces right otherwise you just press a tab right so whatever is inside if that will have to be indented to either two two spaces four spaces something like that so whatever is inside here now will be the part of if so if x is less than 1 let's say uh, this is the block of code which gets executed if x is less than 1 right so we can say if x is less than 1 print that it is a read message right oh sorry yeah thank you rohit it is input yeah so otherwise if x is greater than 10 then also we will say that it is a read message right so that is one straight forward way of uh, doing this thing so let's try to run this program so i provide the input let's say i say 14 so it will give me read message let's say i give minus 1 it will say read message let's say the input is 5 so it will not print anything right uh, Pini Seti has asked one doubt. When I press Control I instead of clearing the screen, it's displaying Control L. So uh, you can just type clear. If you are in the Python prompt, you can just type clear. Uh, okay, so you can. Uh, I think you can say Control C. Control C. C T R L plus C. So just look it up. Or from control D, you can uh, exit the Python console, uh, REPL and from control C, you can give an interrupt, right? So let's continue. So uh, do you see a problem in the above code, right? So first of all, uh, so Tofik is asking a question that according to previous lecture, after hash, all terms will be ignored. Okay. Is my screen visible to you clearly? Okay. So let's continue. So basically, uh, after hash, whatever is there is a comment, right? So only this line of code will not get executed. Only the line number eight is a comment and does not get executed. Does that make sense? Just give me one minute. <clears throat> okay. So uh, basically only this line is a comment and this will get executed, right? So whatever is inside this block, let me say print hello world. So this also will get printed, right? So let's uh, try to run the program. Uh, sorry, I'll say Python 3 conditionals.py. Let's say we give the input 10. So it will print nothing because none of these conditions was evaluated to false. Let's say 11. So both these statements get printed, right? And let's say minus 10, then also both these statements get printed, right? So if I have something here, print i, that will not get, get printed, right? If I say minus 10. So only these two lines get printed. So I hope that answers your question. So let's now continue. Fine. So the issue with this piece of code is that there is a redundancy in this code, right? So the redundancy here is that you are having the same line of code repeated multiple times, right? This line of code is being repeated multiple times. So let's say that once you have to change your program and like, let's say uh, somehow you have to print some other message and you forget changing the line here, right? So that will lead to an inconsistency, right? So redundancy always leads to inconsistency in code, right? So the better way here is to combine these conditions, right? If x is less than 1 or x is less than 10, then print root message, right? So this is a better way to write down the same piece of code. So it will work the same as before, but it will be a better coding practice, right? Sorry, it should have been x is greater than 10, right? So I hope you understand this part. 
so let's now continue uh, so bayagani is asking what is the name of that compiler so this is basically vs code i am using and i have installed python 3 over here this is not a compiler yeah this is a vs code tech, uh, code editor that i am using yeah editor is vs code python is basically a interpreted language right yeah right so it's vs code yeah rohit so let's continue so again the issue here is uh let's say that we also had to print a polite message in the other condition so let's say that our requirement gets changed and we have to print polite message for all other cases that is one less than equal to x less than equal to 10 what i can say is if x is greater than equal to 1 uh, and x is less than equal to 10 right so in this case we will simply print polite message right so let's try to run this piece of code let's say 5 so you will see a polite message comes here let's say 11 it will give us rude message so now this code works but what again is the issue here is it is not that robust so let's say our condition gets changed let's say this condition gets changed somehow the uh, rude messages come outside the ranges let's say minus 10 to uh, plus 10 right so then we will have to change both these if uh, conditions inside both of these so robustness is not handled here so that is why there is another construct that is known as else if else so what we can say is after else we will write colon again so whatever is inside this else block will get executed when this condition fails so now we have something to handle the case when the condition returns false right so either this gets executed or this right so let's try to run again at 5 it says polite message 11 it says rude message so i hope you have understood a basic idea of the conditionals right so anyone has any questions great so let's continue so now there is one more thing so let us say that our condition of rude message gets changed now now let's say that rude message is only for x is less than 1 so we'll say if x is less than 1 then print rude message and the condition for polite message is same so else so what we can do is there is another construct that is else if so we write it if uh, e l i f l f and we can say the condition x is greater than equal to 1 and less than equal to 10 so what we now have is in the else block also we are checking a condition so if this condition is false then it our control flow will get to this line it will check this condition and if this is also false then we'll get here so here we can say that other message right so now let's try to run this program uh, shashwant uh, shashwat says can we put semicolon in place of colon no we cannot do that shashwat so the syntax is you have to print colon to indicate that a new block is starting right uh, vikas vs code is basically a code editor where you can write code and it provides an integrated terminal so that it becomes easier right so let's continue now let's say python3 conditional.py i will say minus 10 will give a rude message if i say 5 polite message and if i say any other value that is greater than 10 let's say 11 so it will say other message so the control flow is first this condition gets evaluated if this condition is true then this gets printed and we will get to line number 16 or 17 so if condition at line 10 is true we'll get to line number 16 directly so let's have something here print outside loop so now let's try to evaluate all three cases so if i say minus 10 so it will print rude message and then outside the loop right and again let's say i say 5 uh, so what happens is the first condition returns false so then we'll check uh, we'll check the second condition so it is now the second condition returns true so we'll print this and we'll get outside the if else if else ladder right so this is basically what we sometimes call if else if ladder right first this condition gets executed if this is false then this if this is false then this likewise so if i now say uh, let's say i say 11 or 101 so now both these conditions will return false we'll check this this is true right 
so i hope you have understood a basic idea of control flow uh dhruv was asking a question if the if we used earlier were two separate things while if and else were interlinked yeah dhruv you are exactly correct if is a statement not loop yeah if is a statement manas you are exactly correct if is a statement not a loop right so let's continue <clears throat> so basically uh, now i hope you have a basic idea so now let's try to implement that market situation that we were saying so let us say that our market has these following vegetables vegetable market contains these vegetables so now what we will say is if let's say we were to buy carrot first if carrot so there is a construct so basically vegetable market is a list that contains a list of vegetables so we will go about lists in the next session so where we'll see lists it is a list of strings right so we'll understand more about lists in the next uh, class so if if carrot is present in the vegetable market then we can simply print print that we bought the carrot right otherwise we will check else if broccoli or let's say cabbage is in the vegetable market then we can simply say print bought cabbage and otherwise when none of the conditions falls true we can simply say that came back empty handed right so this is the scenario that we were trying to uh, simulate right so let's just uh, see so uh, basically currently uh, carrot is basically uh, let's see carrot you see it is not in the market right so we will buy the cabbage so it will print bought cabbage right so let's say if we remove cabbage also from this vegetable market it will say that came back empty handed right so you can try to explore about lists and this in operator we will try to cover it in the next session Uh, let's continue from here so now we will look at another interesting control flow that is loops so loops basically we use very often in programming right uh yeah loops let's try to get to loops so basically frequently we want to write down a program that is doing some piece of repeating some piece of thing again and again right so basically like what is a schedule of a software engineer or a programmer he wakes up in the morning he basically has food starts writing code and then basically uh, likewise sleeps at night and the same procedure keeps on repeating again and again right so we are repeating some piece of thing again and again so in real life we do so and similarly in programming we need to have this thing right so we want to write down a program that will repeat some piece of thing so let's say you are playing a game in which you get a score of 2 points for every 1 second so let's say you play a game where you get 2 points after every 1 second as long as you are alive in that game right as long as you are alive in the game right so how will you write so the game developer will basically have some logic that after every one second this this uh, score variable will get updated it will get added two points will get added to that score variable right so we need loops frequently in programming in whatever software you see loops is very common right so let's say that we were we were trying to print two variables onto the uh, variables from 1 to 10 onto the screen so we want to write down a program print numbers from 1 to 10 to the screen so one basic approach is you will say print 1 print 2 print 3 you will continue like this you will say print 10 right so let's see so it will take a lot of time right and likewise you will write a lot of statements so how we can do this simply we have loops right loops comes to the rescue here so we have for loops in python or while loop so let's say that uh, we first look at for loops so for loops are the ones which we use when we are sure about when our loop will terminate so in this case we know that after 10 iterations our loop will terminate right so we have to iterate the print statement 10 times and that will be print, uh, printing some variable which will get on incremented each time right 
so there is a range keyword in python that basically allows us to create a list of numbers on to which we can iterate so in python unlike other languages so if you are from c++ you have seen something like this you can write down a loop like this so if you are from c++ or some other background like c++ java you must have seen some programs like this right but in python you do not have these three things you do not have uh, initialization condition and the updation so in python basically you have to iterate over some sequence or some container so iterate over some container values in some container or a sequence so this range keyword will be very helpful here to create a range of 10 values in which you will iterate so what we can say is for i in range 10 we can say print i so let's try to see what will be the output of this <clears throat> uh vidhan says i joined slightly late as per normal time so vidhan you can just go through the lecture notes and the recording once the lecture is over like i hope uh, you will be able to under understand that part also uh, whatever i will be covering right now uh, will be quite separate like you can uh, start from here also so for loops we are looking at currently how we will repeat some piece of code again and again so the syntax is this is the variable which we are looping on and here we have some sequence or some container so currently we have a sequence range of 10 will provide us so range of 10 will basically provide us with a list of numbers from 0 till 9 so the last value is not included here so that's why you can see that we got numbers from 0 to 9 so what if you were to print numbers from 1 to 10 that was our end goal right so what we can say is range also provides us another feature so as you can see it provides us a start and a stop so the start we can have one and stop we can have as 11 since the last value is not included right so let us see we were to do this thing and uh, if you see now you will get numbers from 1 to 10 right Arijit says, how does it decide if 10 has to be printed or not? So Arijit, it decides this thing. Basically, this range of 10 will give you a list. So let's see that. So let us let me go to a Python uh, in, uh, REPL. So I try to see what is range of 10. So it says that it is range from 0 to 10. So I can convert this to a list. So let's say what is list of range of 0 to 10. So this is basically the list or the container in which we will be iterating. So we'll look more into list in the next section. So uh, <clears throat> let's try to see list of range of 1 to 10, 1 to 11. So if you will see that, it will give us a list of numbers from 1 to 10. The last number is not included. It is an exclusive range. First number is the inclusive range, right? So I hope you get some idea, Arijit, right? So uh, this code works fine now. Sorry. Python 3 loops.py, right? So it is printing numbers from 1 to 10, right? So now let us say that we want to print all even numbers. So how do we do that? So we can also specify the step, uh, the uh, basically how much we have to step, right? In the range keyword. So uh, let's see. So we can say that print. Uh, sorry, for i in range 1 to 11 and will step a value of 2, right? So that is every time the value will get incremented by 2, right? So uh, let's now see, we'll get all even numbers from 1 to 10. Uh, let's print out the previous ones, right? Uh, sorry, uh, this will give us all odd numbers because we are starting from 1. So had it been that we are starting from 2, we will get all even numbers, right? Does that make sense? So uh, Pratham is saying use and uh, end equal to space. Yeah, Pratham. Uh, what about reverse range? So reverse range, uh, Stuti is asking what about reverse range? So just try to look upon that. Uh, just take that as a homework, right? Let's continue. Like we have... Uh, more things to cover like what you can do is uh, or let's just take it so what we can say is uh, we will specify the 
change as minor uh, step uh, step uh, as minus two the step that will be taking step increment so the third uh, argument is the step increment let's say we make that equal to minus two right so now you can see that we can iterate in reverse direction right so even if we were to print a uh, list of range of 11 to minus 2 so we can see that we get these numbers in a negative uh, in the reverse order right so let's now continue uh, as uh, someone pratham had mentioned right use end equal to space so let's try to do that pratham so what i can say here is end equal to space so this will basically use space as a separator instead of end line right so now you can see that we get the numbers separated by space so we can also have a print in the end that basically has a end line as the default separator end line or the backslash n is the default separator right so let's just run that you can see that uh, it gets printed very nicely here so thanks pratham for this <clears throat> right so let's continue now so if we were to do the same thing using a while loop, right? So how do we do this? So while loops we generally use when we are not sure about the termination point, right? We generally use when we are not sure about the termination point. We know that there is some condition. When that condition evaluates to false, we will stop our loop, right? So about the number of steps before termination. Right. In a for loop, we are certain about the number of steps that we have to take. So basically, uh, let's uh, try to write down a while loop here. So let's say a counter variable is one. So now the condition will be while counter is less than equal to 10. So uh, this is the condition. Whenever this condition evaluates to false, we will stop then and there. Otherwise, we'll keep on iterating inside this loop. So we have this colon and then we can say print of Uh, Himanshu is your question answered. Yeah, I think that is answered. We can say print counter. Let's say end is equal to space. And then what we have to do is we will have to increment this somehow. So we say counter plus equal to one. And in the end, we can say print, right? That is uh, for printing the end line, right? So let's try to run this. So you can see that the numbers from one to 10 get printed, right? So now uh, what happens is counter is one. The condition gets evaluated, it is true. So then we print this and we increment counter. So this is basically a shorthand notation. Notation for counter equals to counter plus one. So as we saw the assignment operator, we can write down assignment operator more simply when we have to increment. So this basically is increment and assign. So first counter variable gets plus one and then it assigns it, right? So this these are in C++ also and uh, some other programming languages as well. But uh, the counter plus plus. So if you are from C++ or some other similar programming language background, this kind of thing doesn't work here, right? So just uh, be aware, right? So let's uh, try to see now. Yeah. So I hope you have understood how this while loop works as well. Any doubts till this point to anyone, right? Any doubts? Any doubts to anyone? Uh, there are some questions. If we have to print doubles of numbers, by the way, between given range, uh, let me see what you are saying to ask, uh, trying to ask Priyal. If we have to print doubles of numbers between, uh, by, uh, between given range using for loop, so uh, that also you can try that will be a good exercise so prakash that is just the syntax issue right okay any other doubts aslam what is the thing that you are not able to understand please uh, tell what it is exactly uh, why do we use two print functions so the second print function is just for printing the end line group it, it just prints an end line because we are using a separator here. So let's say if we do not have this. So it will just print like this, right? In the end, there will be a space. 
So just to have this extra end line character, right? We are using this last print. I hope that answers your question, Dhruv. Pashtub, I am using VS Code Editor. I have highlighted this point many times in the session. Uh, Pratham, the separator is used when basically we have to assign a, sep a different separator from end line, right? Can you show pattern programs? Uh, yeah, we'll take that up later. Puja will take that up later. Okay. So let's continue now. <clears throat> so let's try to write down a program that will basically print the multiplication tables of numbers from 1 to n. So let us say that we want to print multiplication. So one more thing, you can use multi-line comments as well in Python using triple quotes. So let's say uh, it's a good, good practice to write down multi-line comments or comments at the top of your program. So we want to write down a program to print multiplication tables of numbers from 1 to n. Where n is the input from the user. Uh, Karthika says, can you please explain in, sir? We'll take that up in the next session. Himanshu, there is already a video on GSOC that is in the Scalar Academy. You can just check that out. You can just uh, search. There is already a video on that. OK. So let's now continue. So basically, right now, we will have to print something like this. So let's say n is equal to 5. So we'll have to print something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 3. So in the first row, basically, we'll get the first multiples of numbers from 1 to n. In the second row, we'll get the second multiples. And likewise, right? In the end, we'll have something like 10, 20, 30, likewise, right? So we have to print this multiplication table. So now, basically, we try to analyze this problem. So there are two loops running over here. One loop will be from 1 to n, and the other loop will be from 1 to 10, right? We have to print 10 multiples of each number from 1 to n. So there are two nested loops involved over here, right? So for nested loops, like you can take up an example, like let's say that in real life scenario, a train has multiple compartments, right? And each compartment has multiple seats, right? So the ticket checker basically goes over each compartment and each compartment goes over each of the seats, right? He then checks the ticket for each of the passenger in that seat, right? So there is a nesting compartment and inside compartment is a seat, right? So here also there is a nesting. There are tables of numbers from one to n. In each number, you have to print 10 numbers, right? So basically, let's try to write this down now. We have understood how we will be doing it. So there will be two loops that will be using it, right? So let's say first we'll take n as input from the user. And then what we can say is for multiple in the range of 1 to. So we'll print 10 multiple. So outside, so consider it is a good, uh, like I will give you a, a tip, like take your rows as basically outer loops. So if you struggle with nested loops, consider rows as the outer loops and the columns as the inner loops, right? So we can say that 1 to 11. And the inner loop will be for number. So in range 1 to n, right? So we can simply print the, what we have to print, number into multiple, right? And we can separate it by a space, right? And after the inner loop gets over, one row will be done. So we can simply print an end line using this, right? So let's try to see what happens. Python 3 multiplication table dot py. Let's say we hit the enter. Samsul, very much thank you. Like you are enjoying the session. We can say 5. So you see that all the tables from 1 to 5 gets printed. Like, uh, so now there is one issue over here, right? So the issue here is the formatting is not so good, right? So uh, let me just uh, write it here. So there is a formatting uh, operator. Like in C++ or other languages, you see there is a printf function in C++ generally. Similarly, we can say here printf percentage 4D. So by 4, I mean the width I will specify for each of the elements. So like if each of the number, I keep it in a width of 4 units, fixed width. 
percent for d and then what i have to print is this thing per, uh, this thing that is number into multiple right so this d basically refers to integer and whatever is inside these brackets i am specifying the integer so this might be a bit uh, overwhelming like just try to look up how to write how to uh, format in python like we have time constraint over here right now so let's just try to run it so now you can see that every element will get a width of 4 units let's try to minimize this let's say 2 units sorry sorry for this let's say python 3 so you see that it is very uh, visible very clearly now right so i hope you have understood this yeah you can search about format specifiers rohit you are exactly right so let's continue now so we'll now look at jump statements so now having looked at having looked uh, at loops we should look at the jump statements that are the break and continue basically so let's first look at a real scenario so where we can use the jump statements like break and continue so let's say you have a program that sends emails to 100 employees right and after sending 10 emails your internet suddenly gets uh, gets disconnected so what will what what should the program do should it try continue should it continue sending the mails to rest of the 90 people that will also result into an error because internet has disconnected right so better is that you break from that loop whatever is that loop that is uh, sending mails to 100 employees and uh, just continue your uh, thing continue your loop after the internet is back right so basically break statement is very much useful when you want to break out of loop at a certain condition right so let's just uh, try to see through some examples so let's say we have this uh, list of names list of strings and now we say that for name in names so uh, the person someone had asked about how do this in operator works so the for loop basically uh, goes through every item in this container this is a list list is a container we'll look about them in the next session so we iterate over each one of them that is we'll go over each of these strings right and let's say that whenever uh, the name we first print the name and if the name is scalar so let's say we try to break from this right so if name is scalar so we can simply say break right so what will now happen is this loop will run like this first string will get printed because uh, the first statement is this then the second statement is we check this condition this condition hits false because this capital s is not the same as small s so these two strings are not equal again this string is not equal now third string is equal so we'll break out of this loop right so let's try to run python 3 jump statement so you see that the first three only get printed right so the last interview interview bit will not get printed right uh, dhruv says what should be taken in outer loop and inner loop so in the outer loop we generally have the rows that are uh, like vertically in the inner rows we have the columns so the outer loop basically does the processing for a row so just try to uh, write down this code once yourself about multiplication table and dhruv you will be able to do this very quickly just try to write down some programs on matrices you will be able to understand it beautifully then right so this is the break statement now let's also see a continue statement right so let's say that now instead of breaking at some point we want to skip some iteration so let's say that for name in names this first check if the name is scalar then we will continue so we don't want to print scalar in small we want to print s in capital always right and then we try to say print of name right so now what will happen is only this third string will be missing from our output right so let's try to print this so you see that the third string scalar is missing where s was small right so uh, <clears throat> let's try to uh, quickly write down one more program here so uh, let's try to understand what happens when we have break statement in a nested loop so let's say now in, instead of just iterating through uh, through these strings directly we want to iterate through each of the characters as well so we'll have two loops again so let's say we want to find out in which string this character i appears what we'll do is for name in names we'll say 
first let's uh, try to print we'll use format strings here we print the name in the outer loop right and then we iterate over each character in this name so we can iterate over each character in name by using for char in name right so this char is just a placeholder variable it could be anything else so then we can simply say print f found this thing name with the letter we have found a name which is having the target letter that is i right and then we can simply say that will break out of this loop breaking out of the inner loop right and we can say break right so uh, one more thing right we'll also have to check that if char equals target right i just missed this part so we want to find out in which string this target character appears right so inside this uh, if statement rohit what we are doing is we'll check uh, the character whether it equals to the target right if it is equal we'll print that we have found out a name with the letter i right so let's try to run this program so uh, let's see so you see that how it happens scalar in the outer loop interview bit in the outer loop found interview bit with letter i breaking out of the inner loop right so whenever you said breaking out of the inner loop so then the outer loop will basically continue right <clears throat> so only the inner loop will break right so just make sure you understand this thing very clearly whenever we have break inside a nested loop the only the outermost loop where the break is used gets uh, terminated right so then we will go to the next loop right so i hope this is clear to you just try to write down as an exercise just try to write down a program that checks if a given number is prime try to use the break statement right as a exercise right uh, shashwat is saying something in the uh, rohit is your doubt clear i did not understand continue statement dhruv we use a continue statement whenever we want to skip some iteration so for example this was the piece of code so now whenever the string is name is equal to scalar will continue we will not go to the line number 14 right so that is what happens right so rithik just try exploring into uh, exploring this on your own we are running out of time so just try exploring this on your own rithik uh, that would be a good exercise so now uh, before we uh, end the session like let's uh, just look at one more concept so we'll look at functions so now uh, function basically is a you can consider a function as a black box that takes several inputs does some processing so it takes several inputs will do some processing and then will produce some output or will return some output and can return some output right so that is what is a uh, function basically so one thing when we write programs is basically we can have a big piece of code file and then the issue with that will be it will become difficult to maintain right so we can use functions and break our code into small tasks that are functions right so why do we use functions for reusability so the main things for uh, we use functions are for reusability right we want to reuse some parts of code so let's say we have a function that find maximum of three numbers right so whenever there is a requirement we have to find max of three numbers we'll directly use that function instead of writing the same three four lines of code again right so the other thing is abstraction so basically a function we only need to use a function we need to know its name and only the arguments that it accepts right you do not need to know how it works internally right so if you used if you use the documentation of languages and frameworks you must have seen that you mostly are interested in a function it will have a well defined name you will be able to get through that only what it does right so some other uh, use cases are it makes it easy to maintain the code right and debugging also becomes easier 
because once you know that the exact function where my code is breaking you can get to that code and try to debug it right so let's try to write down a simple function so let's try to have a print function that will simply print something to the screen so how do we define function is we can just have keyword def so def keyword is used to define a function then comes the name of the function let's say the name of the function is print function and after that what we can have is we can have a bracket inside these parentheses we will pass some optional arguments like arguments are optional let's say we do not want to have any argument we can skip then we'll have a colon as we have in all our control flow statements right now we'll have some logic here logic or the main code of the function right we can simply say print printing hello to the screen right so let's now try to see how we can run this function so to run this function we simply have to say the function's name and then the parentheses right so the parentheses are required they are a must right so let's try to run this thing now so you can see that it shows printing hello to the screen right so also we can have some function let's say we have a function add two numbers it takes in number 1 as input and number 2 as input right and it simply returns so a function can also return something like right so it is like a black box you can consider you also know the processing here right when you are defining but when you are using functions you just treat them as black boxes right that have some inputs and basically return some output so you can simply say here return number 1 plus number 2 so how do we call this function now so let's say we have a variable x as we take it as input from the user we take y as input from the user and let's say then we say print of x plus y sorry uh, this is uh, when we don't want to use the function now we want to use the function so the function is returning something so let's say if we simply use the same structure we followed earlier we simply say add two numbers x and y so will this work so let's try so we given 3 and 4 so you see that it did not give any output why because the thing it was returning we did not store it somewhere or we did not print it so either we can simply say print this thing so that will basically print the output it says 3 plus 4 is 7 right so the other thing that we can do is we can simply say we can store this result in some result variable and then we can print this result right so that will basically print the result now right so whatever the function returns we can store it in some variable so i hope that makes uh, make some sense uh, now uh, basically uh, one more thing so if we have a function that does not return anything so let's go back to this piece of code so this function function print function does not return anything so now if we try to uh, store into result something and try to print it so then you will see that what do you expect here what do you expect here uh, anmol how to take input in same line uh, we'll try to answer that question later in the next session prakash when we look about lists anmol how to add a line in print statement with the result <clears throat> okay i think i covered that part and more earlier right uh dhruv this is going too fast okay uh sorry for this like try to uh, like visit these things try to implement them yourself uh, i think you should be able to get these concepts uh, just go through the lecture notes once all the code that i have written here is available there very structured <laughs> and we have tried to detail every part there so if we try to do a print here it will print none because it is not returning anything right so here if you see that will get answer as none right so although this thing is not actually recommended so instead we can simply have a return none
sorry i think i indented it incorrectly so just make sure one learning here is make sure you indent your code properly because if your code is not properly indented you will get indentation errors right so uh, <clears throat> these are the things that we had for today i hope you have gotten a good good amount of idea about control flow so we looked at if we do a brief recap we looked at some operators relational operators <clears throat> and we looked at logical operators then we looked at conditionals then we looked at some examples then we looked at the loops control flow which is very frequently used in programming <clears throat> and software engineering in general then we uh, created a uh, program to print a multiplication table we looked at jump statements break and continue finally we looked at functions right <clears throat> so try to uh, do this this thing as an exercise try to write down this function that returns maximum of three numbers right <clears throat> so i hope uh, you have uh, understood many things that we have covered if not just uh, try to revisit and just try to go through the lecture notes once so the le lecture notes are also attached in the description just try to go through them once right so any other doubts that you have uh, you can join the scalar chat link that is in the description so for any doubts <laughs> there is a discussion forum uh, scalar chat we have you can join that <clears throat> right so uh, i hope uh, you have enjoyed this session so in the next session we'll start from here we'll continue about the data structures basic data structures in python the lists tuples dictionaries sets just try to look at them before attending the session right so also i made that uh, announcement about the uh, certificates like if anyone has missed that uh, yeah we'll add all the things in the description just one thing let me confirm uh, any any doubts till this point <clears throat> one thing i had to confirm like uh, if there is a quiz that is going to be launched on some social handle just give me one minute if you have any doubts yeah so let me repeat that thing uh, so basically we will be providing certificates as well digital certificates as well if you attend all these python series and at the end of it will be creating a to do application right <clears throat> so basically uh, we will be conducting a test so based on that uh, digital certificates will be provided to you right okay so one more thing uh, we have an interesting exercise for you as well so uh, basically you can uh, just one minute you can go to the instagram account of scalar academy we will be launching a quiz there so just uh, go to the instagram account of scalar academy we will be launching a quiz there just to test your understanding uh, our uh, <clears throat> team has created a quiz for you there you can just attempt it right now it will be launched uh, as soon as we end the session yeah so uh, the quiz will be launched in the instagram uh, you can just follow this the link will be there in the description most probably uh, yeah let me just check it the notes are available in the uh, in the github account so in the instagram account you can just uh, go through that you will be able to find a quiz so the team must have launched a quiz there yeah let me just post it here as well <clears throat> so i hope you enjoyed the session and uh, we'll continue with the same excitement as today's make sure that you attempt the sessions if you like today's session <laughs> right and just try to attempt that quiz right now Uh, i hope it was a good experience and just uh, so you can follow us follow scalar academy and thank you for watching the session bye bye everyone
so we learned about conditionals loops jump statements and also about functions right so let's just recap some of these concepts so first we'll recap the things with the help of examples right so let's try to write down a program that will check if a given number is prime or not right so let us take a number as input from the user so now what basically is a prime number a prime number is one which has only two divisors right which has only two divisors so the first one is the number itself and one right and the first prime is two basically one is not a prime so second two is the first prime right so after that we have 3 5 7 11 likewise so basically we have to write down a program that will tell whether the given number n is a prime number or not let me also move this thing to the right yeah so how do we check this thing right <clears throat> so we know that a number will be divided by like the divisors will be starting from so one is a divisor for all the numbers yes vidhan we are doing that only we are recapping the yesterday's concepts function concept also will recap so basically 1 2 3 like will we have this number n so the max divisor except n would be like could be n by 2 right everyone agrees till this point so from the range n by 2 to n we cannot have any other divisor right except n so what we can think of is like we will write down a loop from 2 till n minus 2 so one will be a divisor for all right so we write down a loop from 2 till n by 2 so if any of the uh, these numbers is a divisor for the number n then we can say that the number is not a prime number right do you all agree with this point so let's say we'll write down a loop for divisor in range of 2 till n n by 2 and we do integer division here and plus 1 Plus one because this range is exclusive, right? Now, how do we check divisibility? We just check that if n modulo divisor is equal to zero, right? Equality operator we checked yesterday, right? Equals zero. We can simply print that the number is n is not a prime, right? And now, since we have uh, come, we came to know that n is not a prime, so we can break at this point. So why why do we need to go further, right? we can use the jump statement we learned yesterday so we can simply say that break here we do not need to continue the loop right so now can we simply say outside whether that n is a prime or not so let's say if we say this like if it is not a prime then definitely it is going to be a prime but do you see some issue here like will this piece of code break for some point break for some numbers so let's try to run this right so let's try to say python3 recap.py and let me provide the number 5 so it says that 5 is prime it works uh, yatin is asking a question why is n by 2 taken so yatin it is because that we will not have any divisor from n by 2 to n so let's say that n is equal to 36 so from 19 onwards so 19 20 so all these numbers after 18 right after n by 2 so there will never be a divisor of the number 36 right so do you get this point now except 36 right 36 basically uh, we will have only one and n as the divisors of the number right did you get this point yatin yatin is this question clear now so now basically what we can do is we can try to test for some smaller values as well so let's say if we say 2 so 2 is prime okay if we say 3 3 is prime right but what if let's say we put 4 so if we say 4 then it will give that 4 is not a prime as well as 4 is a prime right so why because when we do this break it will continue the execution from line number 21 so we need to maintain some information ravi shankar says can you please explain this logic once again so yeah let me explain this so let's say a number is uh, like n is equal to 12 so how what are the divisors of 12 1 2 3 4 6 and 12 so if you can notice that from n by 2 onwards 
there will be no divisor right because if we say that when we divide n by n by 2 we get 2 right so if we say 12 by 6 we get 2 so if we divide by 12 by 7 we will get something in 1 point something 12 by 8 we will get 1 point something right we will get a floating point a decimal value right we cannot get an integer if we divide n by any number greater than n by 2 except n only so i hope this makes sense now ravi okay so the issue here was when we are saying for a number which is not a prime it will be printing both the things so we need to maintain some information that we have checked that number right so we need to have some flag here some kind of variable let's say a checker variable that is initially zero so we can say now checker is one so if checker is one then we will not print so if checker is zero then only we will say that n is prime right so that means we did not print n is not a prime right so you need to maintain this extra variable right did you get this information so now you see that 6 is not a prime right 2 is a prime 3 is a prime 11 is a prime 12 is not a prime right but still can you figure out a particular n where this will fail still there is one corner case missing here so always try to figure out the cases where your code can break that is a good thing right if you follow that vidhan i did not get your point <clears throat> so this piece of code will break at n equal to 1 so let us say if we say n equal to 1 it will print that 1 is a prime but 1 is not a prime right because this range function inside this range we are going from 2 till n by 2 plus 1 so let's say n is 1 right so we will go from 2 till that is 2 by 2 that is 1 uh, sorry 1 1 by 2 which is 0 0 plus 1 that is 1 so you see there is no value which will lie in this range of 2 till 1 right because uh, this left point should not be greater than the right end point right so that is why we just need to have one extra check here that is if n is 1 then we will not print it is a prime so if n is not equal to 1 and this is the case right otherwise we will say that n is not a prime you can see how we are using the if else that we learned yesterday so let's now try to see with 1 1 is not a prime 2 is prime 3 is prime 4 okay so this time it breaks with 4 why again because the checker need to have a value 0 so else if checker is 0 right or what we can have simply is else if n is 1 right so just try to figure out different ways to write this thing uh, just remember that for else if the syntax is elif we do not write else if or something like that remember this thing you might make some mistakes here 1 is not a prime 2 is prime 5 is prime let's say 6 6 is not a prime right so now this piece of code will uh, be working. So Himanshu, uh, Vidhan, I uh, answered that question. We are using a checker because if we have uh, went inside this thing, then we do not want to print that it is a prime, right? Because we have already printed it is not a prime. Uh, Himanshu, the today's agenda is we'll be learning some of the data structures or the containers in Python that are lists, tuples, sets, and dictionaries. So currently, we are just recapping the concepts we learned yesterday. Yeah, Sumit, I have answered that question. Uh, Praveen, I have tried to explain the logic. So basically, we are iterating over all numbers from 2 till n by 2. If any of them is a divisor, we say n is not a prime. Otherwise, we say n is a prime. Just in that case, n equal to 1, we need to say that it is not a prime, right? So does that answer your question? Yeah, Ravi, something like that you can do. So let's now continue. So anyone has any doubts, like uh, make sure you try to implement this thing yourself. There could be multiple ways to implement the same program, right? So you will be more clear when you do this yourself, right? Uh, Rocky break is used because Rocky is asking why is break used? 
so the break is used because that we have already come to know that n is not a prime right so there is no point looping further i hope that answers the question uh so there are a lot of resources shamim you can just try google it yes arijit has a good point we can use square root n that is a good optimization but that is not very intuitive in the first moment so thanks for pointing it out arijit so let's continue if you are clear with this everyone so now we will uh, take one example one more example before we continue so let us say that we want to print out this pattern so we want to print this pattern onto the screen so someone had asked how to print patterns using loops in the previous session so the uh, observations you can have here is it is a two dimensional kind of structure there are some rows here and columns here right so uh, every row will basically have so let's say that the first row row 1 will have has one star amit says you speak too fast okay let me try to be a little slow uh, anand says can return be used so return can be used in the case we were making a function so currently we just have a, a single piece of code we are not breaking our code into functions if you had a function you could uh, you could have used a return so row 1 has one star row 2 has two stars likewise right ith row or basically rth row will have r stars so hope that you have got this point let's say that n is input and we need to print n rows right so how will we do this thing so this is the question right now so basically again you see that we have to loop in two directions here one is the row and other is the column so you can have two loop variables here you can have two nested loops so the outer loop will basically loop over rows so it is a good practice always outer loop is used for rows and inner loop is used for columns right okay amit says that treat audience okay amit uh, i'll take that take your point in, into consideration amit thank you for that amit so basically uh, we want to print this kind of a structure and the outer loop basically represents the rows and inner loops represents the columns right so this is the row 1 this will have the value r equal to 2 this will have r equal to 3 this will have r equal to 4 so now when you are looping over a row in each row you will loop how many times r times so in each row let's say you have a variable for row so let's say that it is also a good practice you to use variables like r and c for rows and columns so for r in range of uh, let's say okay for row in range of let's say we have number of rows equal to n right in range of 1 till number of rows plus 1 right so uh, when we loop over this variable let's just try to print the row number let's just see what happens let's go step by step so if i print 5 so you will see that you get the numbers from 1 to 5 printed <clears throat> yeah i got get this point Uh, sumit it will be more clear once we are complete with this so uh, till this point any doubts how we are printing the numbers any doubts till this point now here you have to print one star here you have to print two stars here three stars here four here five right so basically inside also you need to write down a loop so for column in range of how many times you have to repeat one till row plus one so this will be repeating row times so here basically row will have the values 1 2 3 like this so let's just print out the column value and separate it by space so end equal to space and let's try to print an extra end line so that we get to see it clearly so now let us see so what do you see 
uh, so uh, Neela Manas is asking how long we will take to get data structure. So this is one last example we are taking before we continue. So you can see that we have got this this uh, this kind of structure or the triangle one one two one two three printed to the screen, right? So now instead of these numbers, we want to print just a star here. So we can simply say print star, right? So let's try to run this now. So you see that we get the structure that we wanted to print, right? If I try to uh, say seven, then we will get seven rows. So anyone has any doubts till this point? <clears throat> So one exercise for you will be to try to implement this using a single loop. So that will be a good exercise for you. Try to implement this using a single loop. Any doubts till this point? OK, so let's take one more example before we start with uh, some basic data uh, containers like lists and tuples. Uh, okay, Ashish is asking what does end equal to space means? So that basically means we are separating by space. Uh, Bhakti says, can you please repeat? So what part do you want me to repeat? Okay. So let's repeat this logic once again. So if you see that we are basically having some uh, structure like this. So let's say we were to print this thing. So there is one variable that is looping from 1 till 4. So here r is 1, here r is 2, here r is 3. So we can simply write down one loop for r that will start from 1, go till 4, right? Now inside also we need to write down a loop. So inside there is a loop from 1 till r, r's value, right? So that is why there is this nested loop coming into picture. So right now you just want to repeat each of these values by a star, right? Uh, so if you be, uh, Ashish is saying if, you, yeah, Vidhan, I, did you get this point everyone now? So Ashish, if we just write down this thing, then we will get some issue. So if you just try to print now, so you see that you will get all these things in new lines. So let's try to uh, use the space only here because by default end line is the separator. The range function is exclusive. So uh, Ashish, the range function is exclusive. The uh, last value is not included, right? <clears throat> okay, so let's continue now. So uh, one exercise that was given to you was to write down a function that will basically return max of three numbers. So I hope you were able to complete this thing. So we will not discuss it now. We want to continue further. OK, so let's just uh, continue the discussion on functions once. We'll just uh, learn two more things in functions. Yeah, we always don't require two for loops. Saksham, you are correct. Uh, Yatin, try that as an exercise, how to make equilateral triangle. So let's uh, learn one more thing about functions. So let me just recap how we write functions. So let's say that, <clears throat> okay, let me just recap about functions as well. So let's say we want to write down a function that will return max of three numbers. So first we write down the def keyword and then the function name and inside the parenthesis we have these arguments and after the parenthesis close we need to put a colon and then we need to indent after that. Uh, so there are some questions I am skipping some of the questions because that have already been answered. Okay, so now let's say that we simply return one of these numbers. 
so the return value is what is getting returned to the caller of the function so let's say that we call this function max3 we have three variables a is 3 b is 7 b is 5 so we will simply let's say try to call max3 with a b and c and store the result and then we try to print the result right so let's try to see what happens so you see that you will get three printed because we are printing the number 1 right so that is basically like how we define the functions how we call the functions since the function is returning some value that value is getting uh, getting returned and we are able to store it in some variable and print that value right so the logic to return max of 3 would be so let's say that uh let's say that we store our max in some variable let's say that the maximum number is number 1 so when can number 2 be maximum now so if number 2 is greater than the maximum one right greater than equal to maximum then only the maximum could be the number 2 right you get this point now again if the number 3 is greater than equal to maximum so then maximum would be number 3 so i'm uh, giving you the optimized logic right itself so just try to think it step by step yeah you can use the built in built function hash to find the maximum and finally we can return the maximum so let's now try to run this function so if we run this we get the maximum of a b and c that is 7 right so the logic here is basically we store the maximum as 3 then we compare whether 7 is more than maximum if it is we max update the max then we compare 5 with maximum if it is greater we update the maximum finally we return the maximum right yes harsh you are right we can use the inbuilt max function you are right harsh so let's learn one more thing about functions <clears throat> so basically there are some functions that can have some default arguments so for example let's try to uh, get into some kind of physics here so let's say there is a function distance traveled that takes in the time taken the speed and let's say that we want the speed to be as zero by default and we have some variable for acceleration due to gravity so let's say that is 9.81 so we can specify some arguments which have default values we call them as keyword arguments which can have default values right uh, i am getting some questions can we have more than one return so aditya that is a good question we can have more than one return for one function but basically the one return which will get called which will be executed the first time will be the uh, one that will be returning so like there could be multiple conditions in your function and depending on the condition you are returning some value that is possible rohit uh, like it is up to you <clears throat> up to you you can use vs code as well up to you yes so abhijit that is a good a good thing like uh, that is the first point where you should start i gave you the optimized logic considering the time we have okay so now let us say that we simply want to return <clears throat> we want to return something uh, distance equal to time into speed so speed into time plus 0.5 into or let's say minus uh, anything like let's say if uh, they are in the same direction speed and gravity are acting in the same direction 0.5 into gravity into time squared right so now we can simply return d so now these kinds of functions are useful when there are some values which which can have some default values like now we need not pass this value so let's say that this was not the case this was not the case and let's say that we simply say d is equal to distance traveled of let's say we travel for 2 seconds so now if you try to print d you will get some syntax error so if you try to run this program you will get syntax error so you see that missing positional argument speed and gravity right so speed and gravity are two arguments that are required here right 
So let's give some default values to them. Speed is zero and gravity is nine point eight one. Now, if you run this function, you will get no error, right? Because it is a valid function. Now you get this distance traveled nineteen point six two, right? So that is the concept of default uh, values or keyword arguments. Default arguments, right? So does that make sense to you? So also we can pass in some other other uh, values here. If let's say we have some speed initially, we can pass it. We can pass it directly, or can we can pass it using the keyword as well. So now if we try to run this, we will get this output. Let's try to print this value. So you see that it got incremented by speed into time. That is one into two. <clears throat> so we could also have passed it like speed equal to one point zero, right? So I hope this makes sense. Yeah, we can use constants as well, but let's say that we want to change the gravity value. So we want to pass in something like nine point seven one, right? So that is the concept of default keyword arguments. We might want to change them in some cases, right? Uh, don't we need to declare the type of the function? Because based on the function type, return type will be there. Yeah. So because Python is a dynamic language, so basically we need not have types for things here. Types are determined uh, dynamically, right? So this was a good question. Unlike other languages, we do not need types here. So Hirsch keyword arguments is the name for arguments which can have default values. So there are two types of arguments: one which have default values, with default values, or without default values. So the ones which have default values are known to be as keyword arguments, right? So is this clear to everyone? So the type of variables, uh, I did not get this question. Will the type affect? <laughs> okay. So let's continue from here. So there are some advanced things that uh, that have been mentioned in the lecture notes. You can just try going through them. Right. Uh, Pritham, just you can give that at a try. What will happen if you pass it as one instead of one point zero? Just give that a try. <clears throat> okay. So let's now continue. So there is one interesting exercise for you. Just try to have a list as a default argument. So one interesting thing that we can discuss before continuing further. So let's say that we have a function def who, or le def uh, let's say anything that takes in one variable a. And takes in a list as a default uh, empty. So now, if we try to say l dot append a, and we try to return l. So now, let us say we call foo with three, and we try to see what gets printed. Then we try to pr call print foo with five. So what do you expect here? What do you expect the output to be? So here, empty list is there. Three will get appended. It will return a list containing three. So we'll learn more about lists right after this. So Pranjal, the lecture notes are available on the GitHub repository as always. You can just access them right now. <clears throat> so basically, this is a warning. You should not use default arguments. With lists. So let's try to run this program. So you see that you get three and five. It was expected that this will give three and this will give five. But the thing with default arguments is they are basically created only once in the memory. The default arguments are created only once in the memory. So this was very unexpected output. So just make sure you are very clear with this thing. You never use list as default arguments. So this is something which uh, many people do not know, right? <clears throat> so this list was basically created only once in the memory. Rohit, 
दैट इज वाई सो जस्ट ट्राई लर्न एक्सप्लोरिंग मोर अबाउट दिस थिंग रोहित दैट वुड बी एन इंटरेस्टिंग एक्सरसाइज सो लेट एस नाव कंटिन्यू विद द डेटा स्ट्रक्चर पार्ट विल स्टार्ट विद लिस्ट राइट सो रवि या रवि वी गॉट थ्री कॉमा फाइव let me elaborate once again so the thing is this list was created only once in the memory so there is one thing known as id function so id function returns the identity of an object everything here is an object uh, so Shiv shivanand we are covering dictionaries very soon babu we are using vs code yes shivanand you need to revise the earlier classes so let's try to print the id of l so you see that both these lists are stored at the same location in the memory just try exploring about the id function so basically both of these lists are at the same location in the memory so basically we when we use default arguments only they are only created once in the memory so this i know this could be tricky and a little overwhelming how do you insert something into a list how do you in index into a list today what we are going to do is we are going to take a shift a slight shift and we will be talking about how to organize your code in python right so we will be talking about things like modules how the python code is executed things like packages virtual environment management and so on right once again so after this after we have covered that stuff we will come back to the basic data structures so we will be discussing the remaining data structures like tuples sets and dictionaries all right now once again if you are new to this stream we are doing this uh, live python series Uh, in which we start from the very very basics of python and the end goal is to make a complete application using django a complete to do application using django and actually deploy it to uh, deploy it to heroku all right so you will be able to see the previous uh, lectures if you just go to the video description there will be a link to any the any of the previous lectures all right so without further ado let us begin with today's class all right so Yes, I hope that you can see my screen. Perfect. Cool. So let me quickly let me quickly uh, exit everything and let me open these things once again. So what I'm going to do is first of all I'm going to open a very basic text editor, right? So as we remember in the first class, we started by coding in a REPL, right, an online code editor. But today uh, after that we have been we have moved to a Uh, a local setting, right? We have moved to a local development environment. So I am going to open my code editor, which will be VS Code. You can use any code editor if you uh, that you want. You can use something like Notepad plus plus or VS Code or Atom or Sublime Text or even Vim, Emacs, Pycharm, whatever floats your boat, right? So, but please don't please make sure that it is a code editor. It is not just a text editor or a word processor. Please do not use anything like MS Word and please do not use anything like Notepad, the the vanilla Notepad, all right? So let me quickly open VS Code over here. So I've just opened VS Code over here. Let me also do one thing. Let me open the terminal. So uh, irrespective of whether you are on Mac OS, Windows, or Linux, you will have a terminal. So if you just open this terminal, I'll just open this on the side over here, and I'll just open the VS Code on the left over here. Let me resize the window quickly. Cool. Now what I'm going to do is first of all I'm going to create a new folder for today's class. So let me create a new folder. How do we create a new folder in terminal? We do mkdir, which stands for make directory. So let me quickly zoom in over here. We do uh, do mkdir, which stands for make directory, and then we enter the directory's name. So we can do project organization. All right. So now if I do ls, I will see that a a folder has been created with the name project organization. And to go inside this folder, I can do cd project organization. so now we are inside this folder and currently this folder is empty all right so let me quickly go over here in the vs code and let me quickly create a new file let me create a new file and let me create a very simple file and let me save this file inside this folder so i am in the home directory over here let me go to this folder project organization and let me save this file as example.py all right perfect so let us quickly ignore these warnings that are coming over here let us quickly close as well let us go back to the example right and let us write a very simple uh, very simple hello world program over here 
So I'm just going to write print hello world. Right. Now, how do we really execute this? How do we really execute this code using our terminal? We will have to. So I'm in this project organization folder. If I try to list the directory, so once again, ls stands for list directory. If I list the directory now, I will see that yes, there is a file called example.py in my in my directory. Right? Over here as well, you can see that. Uh, so currently I don't have any folders open, but this example.py, we saved it, uh, my home folder, and inside that, this uh, directory called project organization. To execute this, I will run a command, a command that will look something like this, python3, followed by the name of the file. Right? So python3, followed by the name of the file, in this case, example.py. Now, when I execute this, we will get a hello world back. Now, depending on your system, whether you have Python correctly set up or not, you might get an error or you might get a result back. If you are getting an error, then please make sure that you have downloaded the latest version of Python from python.org. All right. Uh, so in the first class itself, we discussed how to set up Python. We shared some resources. There was a very nice link uh, that we had shared, which uh, allowed you to install Python on any operating system that you are working on. So please, if you are not familiar with how to install Python, please go to that first video and follow it along. All right. Cool. Now, once we have Python installed, we have to kind of figure out where the Python is actually installed. Because as we know, there are multiple versions of Python, right? There's Python 2, there's Python 3. Inside Python 3 as well, there are multiple, multiple versions. So for example, someone might be using Python 3.5, someone might have Python 3.7 installed, and so on. I suppose the latest version currently is Python 3.8, okay? So since you might have multiple versions of Python installed on your system, it makes sense to know which Python you're currently running in, all right? So there are two ways of doing that. The first way is in the code, you can do something like the following. You can import the sys module, you can import the system module, and then you can print the sys.version. So this variable sys.version, this stores the current version of the Python interpreter that we are running. So if I go over here and I run the example file again, or I suppose I did not save it. Let me really save that and run the example file again. We will see that I am currently running the Python version 3.8.2. Right. The alternate, the other way I can do is I can come over here and write Python 3 minus minus version. Right? If I execute this, I will get the Python version once again as the output. All right. Now this tells me what Python version I am using. If I want to find where this Python file is located, right, where this actual executable is located, I can use the which command. Right. So the W H I C H, not that, not that uh, magic doing which. This is the which command, and I can type the name of the command. Right? So I can type the name of the executable that I want to find. So which Python 3, this will give me the location of this Python 3 file. So I currently know that this Python 3 file lives in user bin Python 3. All right. Perfect. So depending on what your program is, depending on uh, what your project is about, you might want to use different versions of Python. Right. Uh, so we will come in a second to how to uh, how to switch between different versions of Python, how to make sure that we have the dependencies managed in a nice way. But before that, let us go back to our code and let us quickly see how Python really executes these files. Right. So once again, we are back in this uh, file. We, we are back in this file over here. Let us delete everything and let us create several print statements. So I will create print. Uh, this is statement one. Statement uh, one. And let me copy this several more times. So this is statement two, statement three, statement four, statement five. Right. So if I execute this file, you all know what is going to happen. If I very quickly execute this file, Python three, example.py, you all know what is going to happen. All these statements will be printed out from top to bottom. Statement one, statement two, three, four, and five. Unlike most programming languages, right, unlike most compiled programming languages, Python strictly executes the file in a top to down manner. So Python will execute this line, followed by this line, followed by this line. And it doesn't really matter what kind of code you have in the file. Python will always read the file from top to bottom and it will start executing things. All right. For example, I could come over here after print statement five, I could define a function. I could, I could define a function and inside this function, I could do print inside function. Right. So if I do this and once again, after that, I can say print statement x. If I execute this file, what do you think the output will be? So 
So Python will start executing the files. Right? Python will start executing the files. It will start from line one. It will print statement one, statement two, statement three, statement four, statement five. What really happens when Python touches this line? Python will execute this line as well. So Python will execute this line. However, this inside function, this print statement will not be executed. The reason is that when Python is executing this line, this is this is a line that declares declares a function. So what Python is going to do, it is going to read this function definition and it is going to create a variable in its memory. It is going to create a variable called foo and that foo variable will hold uh, a pointer to a function. Okay. So uh, after this, we will print the statement six. So actually what you will see printed out is statement one, two, three, four, five and six. But in fact, Python also did execute this line. When it executed this line, it just declared the function. It did not call the function. Right? So if I just run this code very quickly, we will see that yes, one, two, six are printed out and the function has not been called. If I want to call the function, I have to explicitly call it. I can say something like foo and I can call this function using these curly parentheses notation. Now, when I run this code, the statements one to six will be printed out. And after that, this function foo will be called. So after that, the inside function will be printed out. Okay. So this is very simple. Uh, Python simply reads your file from top to bottom and starts executing statements. Whenever there's a statement like a definition, right, a function definition, or whenever there's a statement like a class declaration, so class spam, and we, we might have something over here. So print hello. Right? So all these things, whenever, whenever Python hits line seven and tries to execute this line, it will not in fact execute this inside line as well. Python will not execute this line. It will just store this. It will just create a class and store that in the variable spam. That is what will happen when it executes the seventh line. All right. Perfect. Uh, Vidhan is saying that the code is not properly visible. Can you please change the background theme? So uh, the current theme for the entire thing is dark. So I hope that it is clear to you guys, but let me quickly zoom in. Perhaps this is a little better. Right? Yes. Can you guys see the screen better now? Perfect. Ravindra is asking, we could add an error in function foo, which would tell it run top to bottom. Not really. So Ravindra, if something bad happens over here, if something bad happens over here, for example, if I try to do something like uh, print one divided by zero. Now in Python, I can quickly open Python terminal over here. In Python, if we try to do one divided by zero, we will get an error back, right? The error is zero division error, all right? Now, if I try to do something like print one by zero inside this function foo, notice that this line will not be executed unless I call this function. This line will not be executed unless I call this function. So if I have code that just looks like this, if I had code that looks like this, this, this faulty line is inside the function, but it is the function is not being called. Right? Notice that this line is committed. The function is not being called. This, this program will run just fine. This program will run just fine. And I will see one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I forgot to save it, I suppose. We will see one, two, three, four, five, six printed out. Okay. Now, if I actually try to call this function, that is when I will get an error. Right. So one, two, three, four, five will be printed out. Then six will be printed out. And then when I execute foo, the code, the Python interpreter will go inside this function. It will try to calculate this line and which will result in an error. So I see after the six statement has printed, I was calling the foo function and inside the foo function, I got a zero division error. All right. When you actually, when you actually declare this function, this line will not be executed. So if there is an error in this line, that's perfectly fine. As long as the error is not syntactical, as long as the error is a runtime error, this code will, this declaration will work just fine. The error will happen when you actually call the function. Okay. Perfect. So let me quickly zoom out over here in the terminal perhaps so that this is a little more visible. All right. So the key thing to remember over here is Python executes files from top to bottom. Let's move on then. Now let us move on from one file to multiple files. Okay. So suppose that I create one more file over here. Let me create one more file over here. Let me say, oh, uh, this is some module, some module.py. All right. So if I do a listing of my directory over here in the terminal, we will see that we have two files now, the example.py that we already have and the submodule.py that we have just created. Let me come over here inside the submodule.py. Let me include a print statement. 
print statement inside some module uh, module dot py all right perfect now let me try to import this line in example dot py so let me uh, remove some of the some of the code and let me come over here and let me import some module right let me import some module and let us see what really happens okay. when we try to execute this code what python will do is python so let us say let us say that we are going to execute example.py so python will start reading this file from top to bottom it will say okay i have to import some module as soon as python hits this line it will look for this file and it will start executing this file from top to bottom so the first thing that will be printed out will be this statement right, inside some module.py once this file has been completed once this file has entirely been read out python will come back to this location and it will print the statement one so the expected output here is first this gets printed out then the statement one gets printed out and as we see that is exactly what happens right? inside some module gets printed out first and statement one gets printed out text all right now once again unlike most languages in which your import all your import statements should be at the very top right whatever libraries you are importing they should be at the very top that is not true in python you can you can take this import statement and you can move it anywhere so I can take this import statement and move it under, under this statement as well. So now when Python runs my code, now when Python runs my code, Python will first encounter this line and it will print statement one. After that, it will go to import the module and print this particular code over here. Is that clear? Yes, so let us quickly run this down. Now we see that the things have reversed. Uh, I forgot to save it as a course. Yes, now the things have reversed. Right, so we print the statement one first and then we import the module. And when we import the module, this line gets printed out. I hope that that is clear. Perfect. So there is one thing that we basically learned over here, but whenever we are splitting our code into multiple modules, we should not really execute the code directly. Right? We should not really execute the code directly. Over here, there could be some code, some code that deletes a file. A file. If I'm importing someone else's code, I don't want that code to execute directly. I want that code to be declared so that I can call that code whenever I want. I don't want to call that code directly. For that, Python provides something else. Right? So currently, if I let me let me try to print out a new variable over here. So let me just remove anything and let me just print out a variable called name. Right? So the syntax over here is underscore underscore name underscore underscore. Right, so there is double underscore and in python you can also call this as dunder values right so this is dunder name the way you would pronounce this is you would say dunder name and this just stands for double underscore name double underscore this is a convention that python uses for a lot of different variables all right so you you will be seeing a lot of underscores in python code all right let us quickly try to let's quickly try to execute example.py and let us see what we get hmm when we execute example.py, it says that the name, the name variable holds this value underscore underscore main underscore underscore. All right. And that is that is how you distinguish whether you are being executed or whether you are being imported. Right. So let me let me come over here. Let me quickly go to this module and let me also include the same line over here. Print dunder name. Right. So I'm in some module. I'm printing the dunder name in some module. I'm also printing the dunder name in example.py and let me quickly import some module from that file. So what do we expect to what do we expect to see? We will go inside some module, we will go inside some module and we will execute this line, print dunder name. Then we will come and execute this line. But the value of dunder name for both these files will be different. The value when we are in example.py, that will be done underscore underscore mean. But when we are in some module.py, the value of the done name variable will be different. Let us quickly see what we actually get. So we get over here some module. Right? We get over here some module. Basically, whenever Python imports a module, whenever you import a module like this, in the module, the done name variable will be the module name. So for example, in this case, some module. On the other hand, if you're directly executing the module, if you're directly executing that file, then the name will be dunder main. All right. So for example, in this example.py, I was importing the sub module. So the dunder name was sub module. 
But if I come over here and I directly execute some module.py, if I directly execute some module.py, then in this function, in this file, the dunder name will be dunder main itself. Right? It will be dunder main and not some module. Is that clear? And that is basically how we can distinguish between when our code is being imported versus when our code is directly being executed. All right. Rohit is asking, are these constants? No, Rohit, in Python, nothing is a constant. I could totally come over here and try to change the value. So I could say dunder name equals to hello. Python allows that. Right? I can now print this value of dunder name and it will print out hello for me. Right? So main is printed, then hello is printed. So in Python, everything is changeable. All right. Uh, Dhruv is asking, does import also lead to execution of module? So that's a good question, Dhruv. Yes, whenever you import a module, you're actually executing it from top to bottom. Whenever you import some module, you're actually executing that module from top to bottom, which is why whenever you write a Python module, it is never a good idea to have executable code. The way we actually do things is we define functions, right? We define our variables, we define our functions over here. So I can say def foo and print inside foo, right? But I will not call foo. I will not call foo over here, right? So that when I import this module, only this function gets declared. The function does not get executed. If I want to execute that function, I can come over here and I can say some module, but foo, all right? So if I do this, then I will be calling some module.foo explicitly. By just importing this module, Python will execute this module from top to bottom, but this function will not be called. This function will just be declared. Is that clear? Yes. So once again, if I quickly save both these files and run them, then we will see, uh, interesting, nothing really happened. Oh, I, I ran some module, my bad. Huh. So if I just run some module, if I just run some module, then I should not get any output. Right? I should not get any, out, get any output. But when I run example.py, example.py, example.py will actually import this module, this function will get declared, and then it will finally call this particular function. If I comment this out, if I comment this line out, then you will see that just importing this module will not execute the function. So if I just import this module and try to run this, we see no output because the function got declared, but it did not get executed. All right. Okay, moving on. Now, if you want to detect, if you want to detect whether you have been run as a module or whether you have been imported, how will we do that? How will we do that? Well, very simple. We already know that if our dunder name is equal to equal to dunder main, right? If the value of this variable is this, then we have been executed. Otherwise we have been imported. Yes. So this is why a lot of the times in Python code, you will see something like this. You will see something like this written out. If dunder name equals to equals to dunder main, then you will actually call some functions. So perhaps you will call the main function over here. So def main code uh, print code is being executed. Right? So let me quickly come over here. Let me try to run example.py. Let me try to execute example.py. And over here we see that yes, we get the output code is being executed. Why does this happen? So the interpreter starts from the top. The interpreter tries to run this line. Right? When it runs this line, a function is declared. A function is declared. After that, it will run this line. It will check if the dunder name variable is actually equal to the domain. Yes, it is because we have executed the module and then it will finally call the main function, which will print this particular line. On the other hand, if I try to import this module, so let me create one more file over here. Let me create a file called uh, importer.py and inside this importer.py, if I try to import example and if I try to run importer.py, I will see nothing will be printed out. I will see nothing will be printed out because just by importing example, just by importing example, I am not calling the main function. Remember that when inside importer, when I import example, then this dunder name, this dunder name variable for the main function will contain example. It will not contain this dunder main value. So this code will not be executed. This function will not be called. Right now you understand basically why you see this kind of line in Python code, if dunder name equals to equals to dunder main. All right. And this is a very common pattern that you will see in Python codes. Perfect. Let us move on then. 
So, so far we have been talking about different files, but these files in Python, right, these files in Python, the correct term for them is modules. Right? So every .py file, every .py file is a module in itself. Now we can go ahead from modules to packages. So there's something called packages in uh, Python as well. What we can do is if we want to, if we want to structure our particular program as nested directories, right? Or if we want to make sure that uh, we have, we are in different namespaces, what we can come over here and do is we can nest our code into further directories. So let me give you an example. So currently this is what, this is what uh, the code looks like. This is what my directory looks like. So I have, this is the current directory. Right? Inside this, I have an example.py, I have an imported.py and I have a submodule.py. Now let me create another directory inside this. So mkdir uh, package, right? And I'm going to, so now if I look at it, I will see that a package directory has been created. Inside this, currently there are no files. Let me create a file inside that. Let me create a file inside that. And let me say, uh, inside package or package module, let me call this package module.py. All right, perfect. So let me quickly show you the tree once again. So we have example.py, we have imported.py, then we have a directory package. Inside the package directory, we have a package module.py. And once again, outside we have some module.py. All right, now let us go to importer and let us try to import package module. Let us try to import package module. Or module. Okay. Let us try to import package module. Let us see what happens. Let us try to run Python 3, import it, right? and we get an error. We get an error saying that, hey, there was no package named package module. So what really happens is when you try to import it, Python will try to look in this same directory. I mean, the actual, the actual thing that is happening is much more complicated. But what you can understand for now is Python is trying to look in the same directory. In the same directory, there is no file called package module.py. Why is there no file? Because that file is inside another directory. It is inside another directory. So I can't import it like package module. What I have to do is I have to give the name of the outer directory as well. I have to give the name of the package as well. So I can say something like package dot package module. So now what Python will do is it will go inside this Python directory and then look for the package module. So if I run this, I get nothing back. Basically the code executes successfully. All right. Perfect. Now uh, you don't need to, do you don't really need to uh, understand it right now. You don't really need to know it right now, but I just want to introduce one more concept in packages. You often will see files like, uh, you will often see files like dunder in it. Right? So once again, we see this double underscore pattern over here. Dunder in it is a file that is executed whenever you import a package. Right. So if I say, if I say print hello, if I say print hello over here, and if I come to the importer, uh, let me quickly open the importer file once again. If I come to the importer and if I try to import, if I try to import a package, then if we run this file, we will see that hello is printed out. The reason hello is printed out is because whenever Python, whenever Python imports a package, Whenever Python imports a package, if this file exists, if the underscore underscore in it underscore underscore dot py file exists, Python will execute that. Okay, this file will initialize the module for us. Is that clear? Now there's a lot more to packages and modules and namespaces in Python. We are not going to go into so much depth because I mean that is basically beyond the scope of what we can cover in one hour. Okay? If you want to learn more about it, feel free to go to python.org. Python.org. And over there, you will be able to go through a tutorial that will give you all the insights and all the in-depth information of how packages and modules work. Perfect. Now let us quickly switch our gears from packages and modules to something called virtual environments. So I'm not sure uh, how many of you are familiar with this, but just like on your system, you can install different softwares. Just like that, with Python, you can install different libraries. So for example, if I come over here and I execute Python 3, if I try to import a library, something like matplotlib, this is a library that helps with drawing charts, that helps with some numerical or uh, some graphical data visualization. If I try to import matplotlib, it is telling me that no module named matplotlib exists. Okay, so this library is not available to Python at the moment. Similarly, if I try to import PQDM perhaps, 
this this gets important because PQDM is installed currently on my system. Right now, let me quickly show you where these values are, where these things are installed, and how to install a particular library. So, if you want to see what all libraries are currently installed with your Python, you can do something like pip pip tree list, and this will give you a list of all the things that you have installed on your system currently, along with this Python. Right, so in this, you will see that TQDM has been installed. So uh, this thing called TQDM, this library called TQDM is installed on my system, which is why I could import it. Right? But nothing like matplotlib exists on my system. Right? There's no matplotlib installed on my system, which is why I cannot import it. If I want to install this, I have, have to say something like pip3 install and then the name of the packet. So matplotlib. So if I do this, this matplotlib library will be downloaded from the internet and it will be installed on my system. It might take some time. So now it is completely installed. Now, if I go back to Python 3 and now if I try to run import matplotlib, this will work perfectly fine. Is that clear? So once again, to install a package, uh, install a library, we have to do pip3 install the name of the library name of library right and if you want to see what things are installed along with python what libraries are installed with python we can do something like pip3 list all right perfect now this is usually what we i mean this we will usually never do this this is a very very bad practice currently what i'm doing is i am looking at the global python installation on my system right so just like we saw that we were executing this python 3 so this Python 3 was installed in user bin Python. This is the global, this is the global installation of Python on my system. Now, when we deal with larger projects, dependency management becomes a challenge. Right? The term is dependency management. That becomes a challenge because some projects might be using a different version of a library, while some other person, while other project might be using a different version of that same library. Also, managing for, for a particular project, suppose that you are going to ship your product, right? You're going to give your uh, give your project to a friend. How does your friend know what all libraries they have to install to make sure that your project works, right? So basically, basically managing all the dependencies of your project, that is something that we call dependency management. And for dependency management, uh, to, to keep in mind that dependency management is, under, uh, is necessary for us, we never use, we never install things in the global Python installation. Instead of that, what we do is we create something called virtual environments, right? So to create virtual environment, first, what you will have to do is you will have to install, you will have to install sudo app install Python 3 virtual env, right? So the command over here is sudo app install Python, Python 3 virtual env, right? Now this is if you are working on Linux like systems. So if you are on Mac OS, you will have to probably do brew install Python 3 virtual env. If you are on Windows, you will have to uh, I think the default installation of Python that you get, the default exe that you get to install Python automatically involves the in, installs the virtual environment. All right. So if I hit enter over here, currently it is already installed on my system. So it will ask me for my password. I will quickly enter my password and it is automatically, it is already installed on my system. So it will not really install anything new, but on your system, if it is not installed, it will download and install this package. Now, once this package is installed, we can come over here and we can specify something like virtual env. If I run this command, I will get a large output back. Notice that I'm getting an output back and not an error back. I'm getting an output that is telling me that, okay, you're supposed to pass some extra parameters to this command, which you have not passed. Now we will be using this virtual environment command to manage our Python installations, not really Python installations. We will be using this to manage the virtual environments. Okay. So bear with me over here. Let us do run a quick command first. What we are going to do is we are going to do virtual env minus p. So minus p stands for the Python installation over here. And we are going to specify the path to our Python installation. So user lib python3. Right? After that, we are going to also give it a directory name. So let me create or give it a directory name called vn. Okay, so what this is going to do is it is going to create a virtual Python installation. It is going to create a virtual Python installation inside this directory, vn, right? And that virtual Python installation will be a copy. Right? It will refer to this Python. It will use this Python executor. So as soon as I hit enter, uh, 
interesting. User lib Python 3. Let me quickly see which Python 3. OK, it's not user lib Python 3. It's user bin Python 3. Right? So my bad. I entered the path incorrectly. So it is user bin Python 3. When I hit Enter, it will create a virtual environment. So notice that the output says created virtual environment using this C Python, right? using the Python 3.8 interpreter. Apart from that, it also tells me several other things. It tells me that these all things have been installed. Right? These all things have been installed. So let us quickly see what our directory looks like now. A new file, a new directory called vnf has been created. All right, a new directory called vn has been, has been created. And if I try to do a tree in this, I will see that inside this vn directory, there are lots and lots of things. Right, so inside this vm directory, there are tons and tons of things. Inside this vm, there's a bin in which we have several files over here. There's a lib in which we have tons of other files over here. Right, so this is a virtual. This is an isolated Python environment that has been installed for you. Right? Now, it is not activated yet. So for example, if I do Python 3, if I try to run Python 3 right now, the Python 3 will be executed from this location. Right? That is not going to help me. To activate this environment, what I have to do is, I have to enter something like this. I have to say, so notice that this is the name of the virtual environment. I have to say source vnf bin activate. Right? So inside this vn folder, there's a directory called bin. Right? Bin stands for binary. Inside this bin directory, there's a file. There's an executable file called activate. So what I have to do is I have to execute that file and I have to, I have to basically source it in my terminal. Right? That will make sure that whatever exports, whatever things uh, the file has changed, whatever environment variables that file has changed, my current terminal takes them over. Okay? So if I execute this, two things will happen. So first of all, you will see your prompt has changed. Okay? So earlier my prompt said pragya adds in. Now notice that my prompt is saying pragya adds in and it is also showing me that I am, I am currently working in this VM. Right, I'm currently working in this VM. The second thing that has happened is your virtual environment has gotten activated. So now if I look at which Python 3 will be run, if I try to execute Python 3, instead of getting that user bin Python 3, instead of getting that user bin Python 3, the Python 3 that now will be executed will be inside this VM. Right, so this is my home folder. This is my uh, this is my home folder. Inside this, I have this directory, project organization. In that, I have created this virtual environment. And in that, inside bin in Python, there's a Python installation. So if I try to run Python 3 now, this Python installation is called. Now in this Python installation, by default, there is no library installed. So if I try to import PQDM, it gives me an error. If I try to import matplotlib, it gives me an error. Notice that in the default Python installation, in the default Python installation, all these libraries were available, right? But in this new Python installation, these libraries are not available. So let me quickly exit. And let me also try to see by pip3 list. Let me see what libraries have been installed. And in these libraries, these are some default libraries that will automatically be installed, right? But anything like TQDM, matplotlib has not been installed, all right? So currently I'm working in an isolated Python environment. If I want to install something, if I want to install something, suppose I install TQDM in over here, or pip install TQDM, my bad. This TQDM library will be installed in this current, in this current virtual environment. Right. As long as this virtual environment is activated, this TQDM library will be installed in this virtual environment. Now, if I do pip list, now I will see that TQDM has been installed. All right. And the, the nice thing is that whatever packages, whatever libraries I install in this virtual environment, they will remain in this virtual environment. It will not affect any other virtual environment or it will also not affect my global installation of Python. Right. So that basically allows us to isolate our dependencies, to isolate our project and libraries. Okay. So currently the virtual environment is activated. If I want to get out of the virtual environment, I have to enter the command deactivate. Notice that this command will work only when the virtual environment is activated. If you try to execute this command otherwise, so currently I'm out of this virtual environment. You know that because my prompt has changed back, right? My prompt has changed, gone from virtual environment back to just plug it. Right? So if I try to active or if I try to run this command now, it will give me an error. It will say that, okay, deactivate command not work. This command will only work when you are actually inside the virtual environment, when you have actually activated the virtual environment. Now, if I try to run with Python 3 again, I will see that I will get user bin Python 3. Okay. Very quickly, once again, if I do source vn bin activate, and now if I run with Python 3, once again, my Python installation has changed. And to deactivate, I can do deactivate, all right?
Perfect. Yes, this is so. Pratham has a very nice point over here. Pratham is saying that this is like an incognito mode for Python. Uh, Pratham is saying that this is like an incognito mode for Python. Exactly. All right. Perfect. So uh, I want to leave you with this over here for, with respect to the virtual environments. There's a lot more to uh, working with virtual environments, managing dependencies, right? Installing and shipping dependencies to other people, right? There, there are things like Docker. There are things. There are several other things that. Uh, that you use as a seasoned software developer. But we are not going to discuss all of that today. If you want to learn more about that, feel free to go to once again python.org and you will be able to uh, get much more information over there. All right? Now let us quickly switch gears once again and let us go back to the data structures that we have been discussing. Okay? So let me quickly go back and let me create a new file over here and let me save this as data structures.py. And let me save this in the Python organization folder. Perfect. So, so far in the last class, we have discussed about the most basic data structure, which is a list in Python. Yes. Does everyone remember how to create a list? So if I want to create a list with the numbers one, two, three, and four, I can say my list or something like my list equals to, and what is the syntax? This square brackets, right? One, two, three, and four. Right? Now I can come over here and print my list. So if I try to execute this, Python 3 or ds.py, if I try to execute this, I will get that list printed out, All right? If I want to, if I want to create a list of all the numbers from one to 1000, how can I do that? If I want to create a list from one to 1000, then how can I do that? Will I have to type everything one by one? Not really, right? I can use this range, this range function that we have discussed. So this range function takes three parameters, the start, the end, notice that this end will be excluded. So 1001 will not be part of my result and the step, right? So it will increment and steps of one. So if I say uh, my list two equals to range 101, if I try to print my list two, I will get a weird output. Right? If I try to print this, I will get a really, really weird output. It will say that my list two is range one to 1001. It doesn't really give me the list. If I want to create a list, I will have to explicitly convert it into a list. The reason is that this range object, this range function gives you back a range object, which is sort of a lazy object in Python. Now you don't have to worry about what lazy and what eager competition right now is, but just understand that this range function, when you call this range function, it will give you back a range object. If you want to actually see what's in this range object, you have to convert this into a list explicitly. So if I try to execute it now, this huge list will be printed out. All right. Perfect. So this was the basics about list. Yesterday we also saw how to index into lists, how to find things from lists and so on and so forth. Right? Today, let us talk about some other data structures. So let us talk about tuples. Tuples are very, very much like lists. Right? So tuples are almost exactly like lists. There's one crucial difference between tuples and lists though. The difference is that lists are mutable are mutable. Basically, once you have created a list, you can change it. Okay. On the other hand, tuples, tuples are immutable. Okay. Once you have created a tuple, you are not allowed to change it. Right. It is can't change, not changeable, right? You can't change it. You can definitely create a new tuple. You can definitely come and create a new tuple. But if you have already created your tuple, you cannot change it. Right. So let us look at an example. Just like this list has the syntax of square brackets, just like that, a tuple has a syntax of round brackets. Right? So I can come over here and I can say my tuple equals to one, two, three. Right? So this will be a tuple and I can print my tuple. Right? So let me, let me remove this huge list from here so that we don't uh, clutter our terminal. So if I run this, I will see that the list has been printed and this tuple has been printed. All right. Now let me quickly show the difference between lists and tuples. So if I try to change this list, if I try to change this list, my list of let's say zero, if I take this first element, I can change it to something like hundred. If I run this, then after, after this has changed, after this has changed, my list will be, the first element of my list will be hundred. But if I try to change, if I try to do the same for the tuple, if I try to do my tuple zero equals to hundred, then let us quickly see what happens. Let us quickly see what happens. 
when we when we try to execute this line, we got an error. The error said tuple object does not support item assignment. Basically, for any index in the tuple, you can't assign a value to it. You can't change the value. All right. So tuples are immutable. Is that clear? Perfect. Now, if you want to create a list, if you want to create a list that has just one item in it, suppose the number one, then how do you do it? You can simply come over here and say my list equals to one. Yes, you can come over here and say my list equals to one. Right? So this will give you the list, just one. But what if you want to create a tuple with this one value in it? What if you want to create a tuple with this one value in it? My tuple. Will this work? Well, let us quickly see what happens. Let us quickly see what happens when we execute this. We get a list back, but this just looks like the number one, right? This just looks like the number one. In fact, if you print the type of my tuple over here, if you print the type of my tuple, then we will see that it is not a tuple at all. It is an integer. The reason is that this bracket notation, right? This round bracket is also is also used to club expressions. Right? These brackets are also used to club expressions together. So to distinguish to distinguish a tuple with one element with just the number one, what we have to do is we have to have a leading comma over here. We have to end it with a comma. Now, if I try to execute this, now if I try to execute this, this tuple will actually be printed, and you will see that the type is now tuple. All right. Perfect. So tuples are exactly like lists. It is just that tuples cannot be mutated. So whenever you are looking for a list that others cannot change, you will use a tuple. Other than that, the indexing and everything else remains exactly the same. Now, once again, when you were creating a large list, you could say my list equals to list of range of 100. And that will give you a list of 100 elements. If you want to do the same with a tuple, you can say tuple of range of 100. This will give you a tuple of 100 elements. All right. So firstly, we get a list of 100 elements. Then we get a tuple of 100 elements. This is a tuple because it is uh, it is delimited by these brackets or uh, by these round brackets and not the square brackets. Okay. Prakash is asking why this extra comma is there. Right? So back when we did this, my tuple equals to this. Right? Why did we have to include this extra comma? Right? That is the question. So let me quickly once again answer it. So suppose that we are doing something like one times two plus three. Right? Suppose that we are doing one times two plus three. We've all studied what mass. Right. We have all studied what mask or peg mask, whatever you call it. So what will be the order of these operations? Multiplication has higher precedence than addition. Right. Multiplication has higher precedence than addition. So one times two will be executed first, then three will be added. So the result over here will be five. If I want to overwrite that, if I want to say that, no, please execute this thing first. Right. If I want to say, please execute, let me, let me make this 10 perhaps. Right. So the current result will be 23. If I want to execute this thing first, then I will have to explicitly put this in brackets. Yes, I will have to explicitly put this in brackets. Well, this will give me the answer 50. Well, what if I do something like this? What if I do something like this? This is just saying take the number one and this number one is in brackets. Right? This number one is in brackets. So basically, we are not really doing anything. Right? I could I could come over here. I could write one plus three. One plus two is the same as this one plus two. Right? So these brackets are not really doing anything. These brackets will be completely ignored. Now we want a tuple over here, right? By these brackets, we are not seeing the mathematical expression one. We want to specify a tuple, and to distinguish the syntax between a mathematical expression and a tuple, we have to we have to give an extra comma at the end. All right. Perfect. Cool. So this was very briefly about tuples. You will use tuples whenever you want to use a list, but you want the list to be immutable. Let us quickly move on to something called sets. All right. So if you have heard of sets, set is set is nothing but just a collection of objects, right? A set mathematically, a set is just a collection of things, right? In Python, sets mean a little differently. So sets, once again, they still are a collection of things, but they have some other properties associated with them. The most important property is that sets are implemented as hash sets. So if you're not familiar with what hashing is or how hashable works, don't worry about it right now. When you actually take a data structures and algorithms course, you will be able to understand how hashes work and how hash sets work right? and why they are important. But uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, Python sets are implemented as hashes, which means that 
a lot of the operations, indexing into it, checking if a value is there or not, inserting and deleting into it, or not indexing, not indexing, inserting, deleting, and checking if a value is there, they are amortized constant time operations. Right? Now to create a set, we have a different notation. So once again, this is for a list. This is for a tuple. For set, we have to use this notation. This notation is for a set. All right. So let us quickly see how set works. So I will say that my set equals to one, two, three, and this will create a set. If I try to print out my set, if I try to print out my set, let us quickly see what gets printed out. So one, two, three has been printed out. Let me just remove this thing. Uh, let me just remove the previous code over here. Right. So this one, two, three will get printed out. Okay. Now, just like list supports a lot of different uh, operations, sets also support a lot of different operations. To actually see what all operation sets support, what you can do is you can go inside your Python REPL. You can go inside your Python REPL and you can type help set. Right? And it will tell you all the different things that set supports. So it will tell you that, okay, this class has many, many different methods. So if some of these, these are called magic methods. These mag uh, methods are uh, start and end with underscore. These are called magic methods in Python. Right? But apart from that, it has some methods like add, clear, copy, set difference, difference update, and so on and so forth. Right? Set in set in the section, checking disjoint, checking subset, and so on and so forth. All right. So very simply, if you want to insert something to, into a set, you will say my set dot add. Let's say the value ten. And now if I print my set, the value ten will be included in the set. All right. So the value 10 is included in the set. Now notice, notice the thing that when I added the value 10, the value was added towards the front. Right? The value was added towards the front. It was not added towards the end, which is surprising. Right? If I try to add perhaps another value. So let us say that I try to add the value 123, right? this I some, some random value. And if I try to print it once again, hmm, now the 10 has been added after 3. In the previous run, the 10 was added before 1. Now it has been added after three. That's weird, right? So the point over here is sets are always unordered. Sets are unordered. You can never, never rely. You can never ever rely on which order the elements will come out. When you insert something into a set, the set tries to ignore the order. It does not try to remember the order, which is why it can do some operations much more quickly, right? So if you are looking, if you're, if you want the order to be preserved, don't use something like a set. Instead, use something like a list or a tuple. All right, so sets will always be unordered. The order can change arbitrarily. All right, perfect. Now let me quickly show you why sets are so powerful. So suppose that I have a list, my list. So let me erase everything. Let me create my list, and I have a very very large list. Right, so I have a list of all the numbers from let us say one to one million. Right, one hundred thousand and one million. Right, this is my list. If I try to find if a particular element is in my list, then how should I do it? How should I do it? I should, I should, I can do something like print uh, some element like uh, 9999 in list, in my list. Okay. Or perhaps 9999 in my list. Yes, I can do come over here and something like do something like this. So let me run this code and we quickly get the answer true. Right? We quickly get the answer true. Let me try to increase this value. Right? Let me try to increase this value. Let me define an n. Or not in 10, I will just say n equals to 100, 100, right? So suppose this is my uh, this is my n, which is basically 10 million right now, 10 million, right? And let me define the number uh, value equals to n minus one, right? Or let me just write it over here. So I will check if n minus one is inside the list, right? Because I'm creating a list of all the numbers from zero to n, excluding n, n minus one will be in my list, right? So I should always get true value. Let me try to run this once again. Hmm. It took some time. Right? It didn't execute immediately. It took some time. Let me add one more value over here. Let me add one more zero over here. Let me see how many times, how much time this takes. Now. So it is taking much more time. Right? It is taking much more time. So the reason it is taking time right now is because it has to do a lot of memory allocation. Right? The time currently is not just constrained by this operation, by just checking. It is also constrained by the time it has to spend to create this particular memory. So instead of doing this, let us create a smaller list. Let us create a list of just 1000 items. 
let us just create a list of thousand items, but let us do this thing again and again. Let us do this loop again and again. So I will I will do for underscore in range one thousand or ten thousand. I will do the thing. I will do this thing ten minutes, ten thousand times. Right? N minus one in my list. It will it will just check if n minus one is present in my list or not, and it will do that ten thousand times. Right? And finally, I can print done. Right? So let us see how much time this currently takes. Let us see how much time this currently takes. It was done very quickly. Okay, let me let me try to increase the uh, number of iterations. Let me try to increase the number of iterations. And now we see that this takes a very very long time. Okay, now this takes a very very long time. The reason is that in lists, if we have to find a particular value, if you have to search for a particular value, that searching is linear time. Okay, that searching is linear time. On the other hand, if we are looking at sets, if we are looking at sets, then the search is order of one time. Amortize order of one time. It takes this constant time. So if I if I do this with a set, you will see that it gets done very very quickly. Right. So once again, if I do this with a list, if I do this with a list, this will take a long amount of time. So it it is taking several seconds, and uh, finally it will be done in some time. It is taking quite quite some time. Now it is done. But if I switch this to a set instead of a list, if I use a set over here, then it will give me back the answer immediately. Right? Because checking if a value is present in a set is very fast. All right. Perfect. Now, just like we have sets, we have something called dictionaries. We have something called dictionaries. Right? So once again, this was used to denote list. This notation was used to denote tuple. This notation was used to denote set. Well, for the dictionaries also, you have the same notation. This is also used to denote dictionaries. Right now, dictionaries are maps. Dictionaries are mappings. So dictionaries, they are not your. They are not the dictionaries that we see that we actually hold. Right? They don't have word meanings. These dictionaries are mappings. So they have some key and they have some value. For example, I can come over here and say my dictionary, or let us say squares, squares of numbers right? equals to, and now I can. I have to use a different kind of syntax over here. I have to use a key colon value syntax, right? So I can say that the square of one is one. Then I can say the square of two is four. I can say the square of three is nine. I can say the square of four is sixteen, and so on. Okay, so basically, what I'm saying over here is that if you look at the square of one, that value is one. Right? If you look at the square of one, that value is one. Now, how do I get the square of a particular number? If I want to get the square of three, I can do something like square. Of uh, squares of numbers, and now I can give it a key. I can give it a key. So these things on the left of colon, all the things on the left of colon, these are keys. All the things on the right of colon, these are values. If I give it some key, if the key exists in my dictionary, then this will pull out the value. Right? This will pull out the value. So if I just try to print this, we will see nine getting printed out. Right? We will see. Uh, I guess I misspelled the name. Right, you will see nine getting printed out. All right, so dictionaries are very powerful if you want to store mappings, if you want to store a key value pair. Now, just like sets, just like sets, dictionaries in Python are also implemented using something called hash tables, which is why the indexing, or not the indexing, uh, basically the indexing. Yes, in this case, the indexing is there. Uh, indexing, searching in a dictionary, right? All these things are very very quick. Inserting, deleting from a dictionary are very very quick. All right. I suppose that we can end it at this point today. Uh, I wanted to go into much more depth of all these data structures, but unfortunately, we do not have the time. All right, so let us complete that some other time, and let us like the end the lecture with this. Okay, so once again, if you go into the video description, you will be able to find a link to uh, some questionnaires. You will be able to find a link to a chat. Where you can basically go and discuss with your peers, with all the people who are watching on YouTube, you will also be able to discuss with the instructors. So I will also be present in the chat. If you have any questions, you can go over there and ask. So the links are in the video description. If you want to see the previous videos of this series, the links for that is also in the video description. All right. So I hope to see you the same time tomorrow. All right. So 6:30 p.m. to 7:30 p.m. tomorrow, and tomorrow we will be looking at some more advanced concepts of Python. basically why do we need to operate with files so basically we want 
to write down whatever data we have in python to some kind of permanent storage right which we can retrieve at any time so the program that you will run in python that will be working in the uh, random access memory right that will be working with the ram but you want something to be uh, stored like stored uh, permanently that is in a non volatile kind of memory right where it will not go away so that's wh where you want to write to disk files right so basically uh, what all operations do you need to work with files so you need to open a file and then you will have to perform the operations that you need so let's say perform read or write operations depending on the kind of uh, program that you are writing and third step you have to make sure that you close the file that was open right so this is the basic flow okay yeah about json files we'll discuss and yes we did not have any class yesterday so we are taking the part of yesterday today right so let's continue these are the three operations that we will be needing to perform when working with files so first of all let's uh, do one thing let's try to create a file so let's say i create a new file in this folder let's name it uh, name this as hello.txt and let's say we have some text here so there is some text here this is let's say line number 2 and let's say here we have some mathematical string 2 plus 5 is 7 right so this is our file hello.txt right so now first of all we want to open this file so how do we do this in python basically there is a function named as open so here you provide the file as you can see here you provide the file and then you provide the mode so in which mode and then the encoding and like there are some of these optional arguments so basically let's just first provide the file name so we are having this file1.py in this folder day5_life so we'll create the uh, file name here as hello.txt so because this is a relative path from this directory where we have this python file right does that make sense till this point so then basically what we can do next is we'll provide the read a uh, read mode so we are currently reading it so we'll say we have the read mode read mode is specified using r r keyword so that's how we will open this file and this will return a file handle so basically the file handle is here f right so now whatever operations we need to do we want to read it so we can use this file handle that is return file object or handle right so let's try to read something so let's say f dot read and let's try to print whatever is the output so this read function is basically what we will use so let's see what will be the output for this right so yeah let's wait for the terminal to open up okay so let's go to the day5_life uh, directory and let us try to run this program so let's say python3 file1.py so you see that if whatever was there in the text file you could read it does that make sense so this read function basically is returning everything what is there in this file right so let us say we want some specific characters so if you if you have noticed earlier like when you are writing so it takes an n that is an integer as an input so let us say we want to access only the first five characters in this file so let's try to run this now so you see that only the first five characters were input uh, were read, uh, were read from the file right so basically optionally you can provide the number of characters in case of a text file right otherwise it will read the entire file does that make sense till this point okay so basically just keep your questions and we will take them up once we have understood how to read and write the text files uh by default we are working on text files so by default uh, whenever you use open command it works on text files so <clears throat> that you can just remember now <clears throat> uh let us say that we want to read line by line so how do we do that so we can say that f dot read line so read line is a function that will read a single line let's try to print the output so if you see that after there so there is a file pointer that is being moved when we read something from the file okay so the open function basically returns the object of the file that we can use to access the file contents or modify the file contents so f is basically file object used to access or modify the file contents yes rohit there was no session yesterday okay let's continue so uh, what do you notice that the output was 
first of all there that is why because we read the first five characters now you see we get whatever is there after this so you see we get the space and whatever is remaining in this line right so basically why this happens is like let's say we comment this line comment this first line so you see then we will get the entire first line so what is happening is there is a file pointer that is getting moved once we read something the file pen, uh, file pointer will get shifted and the read process will start from that particular read head right so we can also know that where is our current file position so let's just try to see there is a function f dot tell so if we say print f dot tell it will uh, provide us the file pointer so let's try to see so you see that when we are at the start of the file it is at zeroth position let's first read five characters and then try to print it so then you will see that it has moved to the position 5 so that is so like this is the position 0 1 2 3 4 and this is the position 5 where this space is happening so after all this the entire line will be read so i hope you have understood everything till this point so this will give us the current position of file read head right so uh, that is uh, till this point now let us say that we want to move our file pointer to the starting of the file so that also we can do there is a function f dot seek so here we can specify let's say it asks two things one is the offset and one is the whence parameter so this whence parameter is used where we want to tell from which position like from the beginning or from the end let's uh, not consider this at the moment you can just look up at the documentation for this let's just provide the offset to be zero so now let us try to print where is the pointer and let's try to run the program so you see that it moved to the position zero so f dot seek zero will basically move the file pointer to position zero and we see that we get the entire first line right so does that make sense to everyone so also now let's say we want to read the next line so our file pointer after f dot read line would have moved to the next line so let's try to print that so you see that it is at the 24th character so now if we again do f dot read line it will print us the next line so let's try to see you see that uh, okay let's uh, try again if the thing here is the second line contained just this end line character so if we have to do it once again then we will get the next to next line that is what we require that is this is line number 2 so basically every end line is counted as a single line so what actually will be stored here would be a single end line character right so that's why the next time you see a end line character let's just remove these end lines and try to uh, do it again so now you will see that you get all the three lines right so also one thing you notice is there is one extra end line coming here so that is because this f dot read line in in itself contains an end line character and this print additionally prints one more end line character so to remove this what we can say is we can use the space as a separator or let's just use nothing so this is not a space this is just a blank character right so if you will observe now you will get whatever you had in the file you will get all these three lines right and these are the file pointers let's just comment them right so you see that uh, let's also comment this part you see that whatever was in the file we have read that entirely right so if we, let's say i give one more end line here then you will observe we will get one more end line right so i hope this makes sense to everyone now any doubts so i'm taking up any doubts you have till this point about reading from the file so if reading is clear then we will move to writing to a file so anyone has any doubts till this point okay let's assume there is no doubt one more thing uh, since i did not get anything let's just see that there is one more function that will give us all the lines in the all the lines in the file so <clears throat> let's just comment everything so there is a function that is f dot read lines so let's say we want to get all the lines so we can simply say f dot read lines and let's just try to print the lines so yeah group f is the file object that you are using so basically f is the file object yeah f dot tell we will uh, use once again right so first let's just see that the f dot read lines function will basically 
give us all the lines that we have as a list. So you see, it is giving you a list of lines. And in each line, you can see that there is an end line character, right? So uh, Rohit, I'm not answering that question right now, how to reach the end of the file. You can explore it once. So let's just go to f.tell once again. Yeah. So let's now try to call f.readline. So that is a good question. Uh, Dyapa Shravan is asking, what if we do f.readline at the end? So let's just see. So you see that we will just get blank line. So let's just see. Try to do it multiple times. You see that we'll just keep on getting a blank line. Uh, so no, f dot read lines will basically read all the lines. f dot read lines will read all the lines. So so basically, f dot seek function will be used to get to the starting, and then if we do f dot read line, it will give us the first line. You see, there is some text here, right? We get the first line. Now, f dot tell function will basically print what is the current position of the file head, where we are, which are we are using to read. So f dot tell will tell the position for the file head. You can see it is at character 24. So if you count, there are 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So 23 characters in total, and one will be the end line character. So that's why this character T is at 24th index. We are using zero based indexing, right? So does all of your doubts are uh, cleared now? Yes, Keshav, you can try to think how you will do that. Okay, so let's now continue. So we now know how to read from a file. One more thing before we go to writing. So you can also loop at, uh, so let's first go to the zeroth position. You can simply loop at this file object. So we can say for line in F, print line. So this F object, when you loop over, it will iterate over each of these lines. So let's just comment the entire code. You see that it simply loops over every line. So you can simply do this if you want to loop over the lines, right? Does that make sense? OK. Uh, there is no attendance link. Like for the certificate availability, you will have to give a test. That will happen after the end of the series. We'll share the details in the end session. So Richa, you need not worry about that. So let's continue. So let's now think about how we will be writing to a file. So once we have discussed about reading to a file, now let's uh, go back and see how we will write to a file. OK. So uh, <clears throat> let's just open another file. Uh, one more thing. So let us say we try to open a file. Let's uh, just one second. So let us say that f is equal to open uh, demo write.txt. We are opening this. So now we have to open this in a write mode that we can say using the W keyword. So let's now try to run this program and see if anything happens. So you see that this file does not exist. So this file named as demo write.txt does not exist in our page. So let's try to uh, run this Python 3 file one dot py. So this file does not exist. So what happened is this file got created. So you can see demo write dot txt file got created, right? So did you ob observe this thing? Okay, let me take up uh, a few questions. So Ravi, it is giving a new line because uh, there is a new line in the uh, line itself. And one new line is for the print statement itself. That is why. Yes, Dhruv, you are exactly correct. These two things are for the same purpose. Uh, Saurabh, I do not know about the shortcut that you are asking. Uh, Ravi, you can try that thing once and let me know what happens. OK, so uh, let's now try to see uh, the file got created. So basically, if file does not exist, it got created. 
so let's just do one more thing so and one one more thing is like basically once you open a file it is a good practice that you close the file at the end so because what happens is the, the resources are being allocated that will be working on that file so you need to use the f dot close function that will basically close this file right so let's now try to see if we have something in this demo write dot txt so hello this is a demo line demo write file so now let's see if we run this code so what do you think will happen will the file contents be overwritten or what do you think would happen let's now try so if you open this file demo write dot txt you will see that whatever was there got erased so this write mode simply opens this file in the write mode and if file exists it basically clears the content exists then basically it overwrites the content right does that make sense okay so dapa is asking what if i will print the character f so let's just see what happens let's just see so you see that it is a file object so see that it is a text io rep io dot text io wrapper mode is w encoding is utf8 so uh, this is the file name so you see all the attributes associated with this file right i hope that answers the question okay so let's now uh, not take any further questions so we'll take uh, so just um, i'll uh, take the questions after some time right okay i have already answered that question the certificates will be provided and like uh, you will have to attempt a test for that okay so now what we want to do is we want to write something to this file so again we have a function f dot write and let's say it takes in any string as the input so let's say uh, this is line 1 and let's again say f dot write this is line 2 let's just copy this uh, i'll use the shortcut and let's say 3 4 5 6 right so let's try to run this program and see what happens sorry file1.py so if you will go to this file let's open the file demo write.txt you see that everything got written without any end line so all of this has been written in a single line so just make sure you understand this thing so we have to give the end line character by ourselves so we have to say that here we need to say that backslash and character by ourselves right so let's now try to run this so if you will see now you will see that all the new all the lines are basically written in a separate line so that is because we have provided this backslash and character right ravi is asking if i want to write integers like 1 2 3 4 etc in the file can i write using dot write or only string is allowed yeah so basically it will allow only string so let us say you have some integer let's say you have uh, let's say you have x equal to 1 you try to say f dot write x so that will not work so you will see that type error write must be a string write must have the arguments as string so what you can say is you can simply type cast this to a string right so let's try to run this now so you will see that you will get the uh, string uh, character 1 right so you have to convert whatever you are writing to the file to a string right so now that we know about how to read and write files now let's also see we also know that how to close the file so this is basically required why because uh, you want to free up the resources so what the um, there is a garbage collector in python inbuilt so but the issue is that will be doing its operations based on some interval of time that is like dependent on the platform and like dependent on some other factors right so uh, it's better to be safe that you close the resource otherwise uh, if it's left open there might be some corruption in your file so just make sure whenever you open a file after you are done with the operations you just close the file so the three steps that you have to follow are first open the file second is perform read write and third is close the file so i hope everything is clear till this point uh now uh, let's just see one interesting thing so let's try to open a file which does not exist so let's try to do this thing so let's say i say f is equal to open i say hello2.txt and i try to open it in write mo uh, read mode 
so if we we already saw it in the write mode it will get created let's now open it in read mode so let's see what happens so you will see that no such file or directory hello hello2.txt so now to handle such cases where you get exceptions during the run time so this is basically known as, as as an exception so the errors which you get during the run time are known as exceptions so you need to make sure that your code is handling these exceptions so we have some kind of exception handling mechanism so what we can do is we can have a try block so inside this we will try to open this file so exception handling is basically trying to catch the errors which can happen on run time right so now uh, once we try this thing so there is an accept block as well so here basically you will handle the exception so here you will have the uh, whatever you are writing the instructions to be executed and here you will basically in the accept block basically you will catch these errors so let us say that print some error occurred right so let's now try to see what happens so you see that whenever we went to the first the program flow is it will go into the try block it will try to open this file but there will be some exception occurring right and then it will go to the accept block so let us say that we are trying to open this hello.txt which already exists so you see that no exception will be occurring so this code will not go to the accept block and now finally there is one more block you can have that is the finally block so here you can say that this will be executed in all times so here you can simply say f dot close so if the file was opened you can simply close this but you can you should simply check if f exists so if f is existing so let's say if f is not equal to none then we can say f dot close right so now uh, let's also try to print here print that file is closed so you will see that file is closed let's now try to do the same thing with hello2.txt so you will see that here also some error occurred and still the file is closed why because uh, let's try to print what is in f so you will see that it uh, okay i think that uh, the previous resource was not closed let's try to comment this thing and try to run this piece of code so we are trying to run only the lines from 70 to 80 i'll take up the questions in a few minutes so you see that f is not defined so let's now try to see okay f is not defined basically here so uh, let's not do this finally block in this case we should do it only when this was open right uh, f is not defined so you i leave it up to you to think about this part how you will handle this case right so uh, what we generally do is we instead of writing these things like try accept and finally f dot close so once again let me just take up the questions before continuing so here we have taken up uh, let me just take up some questions so okay attendance and uh, assignment so we don't have any assignments uh, can we read the text from image using python just uh, try to research on this that is a good question uh, overwrite happens if the file is already existing and we are trying to write so using the write mode and we are trying to open it in write mode so try basically is a block where we will write some instructions that will get executed and in the except except block you can just catch the errors so like let's say that you do not have some anything like this and you try to open hello2.txt so you will get some uh, okay let's not we cannot have simply the try block we need to have the except block as well so you will see that file not found error so you got some error during the run time so to handle that case there are exceptions right Uh, rohit you can just try to think about that okay so now that we are clear with some of these things so we want to make this thing uh, so f dot clause is working if uh, so f is defined right here f is defined then only f dot clause is working 
so let's say we have try we have accept print some error occurred and then we will say finally f dot close let's do one smart thing here let's say we have one variable error occurred equal to 0 so we can simply set it to 1 so if if not error occurred then only we will close the file right so that is how you can handle this case right uh, okay sorry we need to say if not error occurred yeah so now you can see that some error occurred because hello2.txt does not exist also our code will not go inside this closing file because f is not existing right and not uh, error occurred is set to one so let's say if we read this file hello.txt then it will be closing this file right so i hope you get this idea uh, let me take one two more questions before we continue uh, pavan you can try exploring that thing uh, f dot close is working basically f is defined in this case so hello dot txt is basically existing right so if i see that hello dot txt file exists right uh, we get will we get error if file doesn't exist and we open the file in write mode so uh, techno techno ram we have considered that case earlier so basically that file will be overridden a new file will be created in that case okay so now to handle all these cases, what we have is we have something known as a context manager in Python. So let me just tell you that part. <clears throat> okay. So basically to make our code cleaner and to not handle these things manually. So there is something known as a context manager. So that allows us to manage the resources effectively. So basically allows us to manage uh, using and closing of the resources effectively. So basically, let's say how we want to open a file. Uh, let's say we forget closing the file, right? That might create some issues. So for that purpose, you have the context manager. So you can say that with keyword is used to uh, use the context manager with open hello.txt in the, in the read mode. And let's say as file, as the file keyword, let's say F, we are opening it in the read mode, right? So now we can simply perform the operation. So let's just say print f dot read lines. So in this case, you need not basically handle this, handle this scenario of closing this file. So let's just try to print the uh, what is the f object storing outside of this. So you will see that it stores this thing, but uh, the Python will handle this. The context manager will handle this thing for us that it will close this file as soon as uh, the operations have been done right so uh, you see that it is an effective way of working with files just make sure that you use this context manager so that you will not have to worry about this try accept and finally kind of blocks right okay so now uh, i think we are done with the first part of working with text files so if you want to work with binary files so then you can use the op mod f work with binary files. You can use the mod p e as well. So let's say you want to open a file in the read mode, open a binary file in read mode. So how will you do that thing? So you can simply say with open hello.txt, uh, sorry, hello, uh, let's say some binary file, some binary file. And let's say we can simply append the modes that we are using. So if we have more than one mode, so we can simply write them like this. So RB simply stands for read mode and binary file as F, right? So here you can see that here you can say F dot read something like this, right? Okay, so uh, you can try exploring more about binary files and about this context manager uh, through the official Python documentation. So just Google it, you will get the official Python doc documentation. Just try to explore more about these things. So now let's come to working with CSV files. Just taking some questions and coming to working with CSV files. <clears throat> Dhruv, try to see what will happen. And uh, Sravan also try to think. 
so rohit the with keyword with operator is simply used to open the file using the context manager so the context manager is some internal thing in python that handles opening and closing of the resources so it will automatically close this file for us whenever uh, whenever we are uh, done with working with the file it will see the suitable time when it should close the file right so it will make sure that we do not get into any trouble uh, i have just now explained the context manager again just try to explore more about this right that would give you more idea okay so let's now uh, go with working with csv files <clears throat> okay so now we will simply see how do we work with csv files so a csv file is something like this so let me just uh, create a file let's say so basically let's create a file here demo csv dot csv so it simply looks something like this so let's say we have uh, we want to create a file that will store the name serial number uh, roll number name and the marks of a student so let's say we will have some keyword uh, some uh, first row as roll number and let's say name and then the marks let's say one abc and let's say one uh, and 97 we say two def and let us say 99 so this is a csv file uh, so pavan we will not be able to use a csv a uh, user file after it has been closed by the context manager just try to explore more on this part right uh, so okay let me take that question so deepika is asking what is the difference between read and read line so the read function is basically used to read the entire content of the file read line is used to read a single line at a time so a csv file is what i am talking about currently uh, okay so it simply stores uh, basically the uh, full form of csv is comma separated values so as you can see there are some elements here which are separated by comma so this is basically a csv file okay and it is generally used where we are working with spreadsheets so if we are working with spreadsheets let's say if you have used google sheets so you can ex export that file in a csv format right so it basically allows us to create uh, let's say store some data in a structured manner so there are some uh, columns here the columns are roll number name and marks and the rows are basically the entries so it is a tabular data if you can see it is a tabular data right so csv is basically used to work with tabular data right so now we can use the open keyword and open this csv file but now you have to do some processing right so let us say we uh, open this in the read mode right so let's say with open as f and let's just try to print f dot read so if you try to run this python 3 file 2 dot py so you will get all the data in this file but let's say we want entry by entry so we want the first entry right or let us say we want to convert it to a dictionary where we can access the roll number name or marks using the keys so the uh, csv library is there that will basically make all these things easier for us so what we can do is we can simply import the csv module that already exists in python that will make most of the things easier for us so now what we can see see what we can say is let's we will create a reader here so we can simply say reader is so uh, reader is csv dot reader so this will return a reader object that we can use sorry here we have to pass the file also so uh, the syntax is the csv module name and we are using the reader function of this module that takes in the csv file and the dialect uh, so dialect is something you can explore not something very important right now and then some additional parameters that are optional so after this you can simply work on every row in this reader so for row in reader you can simply print the row right let's now try to uh, see what is the output here so you will see that we can get every row in the form of a list so the list will basically store the entries column wise right you get the first column comma second column right wise so it becomes easier to operate on the csv file so let us say that 
you want to get the name of all the students so you can simply say that print row of one so now you will get the names of uh, all the students that are a b c and d f let's say you want the marks so you can simply say row of two because you know it is the second column right yeah it is like an excel file right exactly so that's how like you can read from a csv file now let us say that let's uh, try to see if let's say our csv file had some spaces here after every comma let us say there were spaces and we try to do the same thing so now if you see we will get some extra spaces here as well so you see you are getting these extra spaces here as well right so what you can do is there is an optional argument that you can specify here right you can specify here an argument that is skip initial skip initial space is equal to true so now let us try to see so now you see that you will not get any space here right so there are a lot of things that this csv module will make very easier for us so uh, let's say like if you if your csv had quotations around some of the around the uh, elements so then also there is some quoting uh, parameter that you can specify so i leave it that leave that to you to explore right so that's how you read the file <clears throat> now uh, one thing is like let's say we are specifying this parameter uh, let's say there were some multiple parameters that we had so now this dialect solves that problem for us so basically uh, just try exploring on to that i have written about this thing in the notes try exploring on this dialect yes so we are getting the header also so just try to see so we can simply uh, skip the first row so pavan has a good question just try uh, we can skip the first row just try exploring more on that part how you can use the csv module to skip the header part so now we know how to uh, read from csv files next uh, let's now also see how to write to a csv file so it will be very similar so like we are creating a reader object here will be creating a writer object right and we will be passing the list to that so let us say that again i want to open a marks.csv file and we will be opening this in the read mode uh, sorry in the write mode because we are writing to a csv file as file so i'll take up questions at the end uh, let's now see we will create a writer object this time writer is csv dot writer and we pass in the file object right and then we can simply say writer dot okay writer dot write row and simply we will pass in what is the row here so we will pass it it will be a list so the list contains row number name and then the marks keyword so there are three columns here and then we can simply say that writer dot write row so here we will specify the row number that is one the name that is abc and then the marks let us say marks will be an integer so 97 then again we can say writer dot write row we specify the list for the second entry right so here we can say two and def and let us say that 98 so now this will simply write down all these three rows to our csv file let's now try to uh, do this python3 file2.py so if you will see that uh, if you will see a marks.csv file has been created so that contains all these three entries right so i hope you have got a basic idea how we can operate with csv files you can try exploring some of the operations and go through the official documentation of csv module right so that will make more sense right so similarly there is one thing you can explore how to get this uh, get uh, the content in a dictionary so there is a dict reader uh, dict reader keyword as well so you can simply say here is dot dict reader so just uh, let's try to see now now if you will see we will get dictionaries instead of lists right so let's say you want to print the row number for every entry so you can simply say that now now one thing if you notice is you did not get the header row so pavan now you are getting only the uh, entries so you can simply say row of 
roll number. Do you see that the roll numbers are one and two? Similarly, if you want the names only, you can say this thing. So you get A, B, C, and D, F, right? So now I think you have got enough idea. Uh, so basically, why we are doing this thing is because reading and writing CSV files is common thing when you will use. Let's say you want to automate the report generation. Let's say you have some particular analytics module, right? There you have some data that you want to extract to CSV file. So you can write a simple script that will automate these things. So it will automate the reading and writing part to a CSV file, right? Let's say you have a big database and you want to generate CSV files using script or you want to manipulate and work on the data. So you can have these small Python scripts that will work on the work on the data, right? Which is stored in the CSV file, right? Okay, so I, uh, there is one additional library that you can explore. So there is a pandas library that we use very often in data analysis and data manipulation. Just try exploring on this. There are a lot of uh, good official documentation. You just go through that. You will uh, see that we can do a lot of things more easier, right? We can do a lot of analysis very easier. We can generate uh, graphs as well, graphs, charts, and a lot of things. So let's say you wanted to find out how many students or basically you want to uh, group the students, uh, group the marks in basis of grades. So you can use the uh, some of the things that Pandas provides, right? OK. So any doubts till this point? OK, so I might have missed out on some questions. Uh, let's now continue. I think those were answered. OK. So uh, uh, now uh, there are two things like here you have to explore. One is the dialect keyword, and one is the pandas library. Now let's uh, start with working with JSON files. So we are done with two parts of our today's session. That is working with text files and CSV files. So now we will look at working with JSON files. So what JSON is basically, this is a very popular format. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So it is a very popular information interchange uh, format that we use frequently. So when working with APIs, so if you have heard about the terms, so that, uh, just uh, don't be overwhelmed if you haven't heard. So APIs are there. Uh, that are application platform. So you can just uh, explore more about APIs. And whenever we generally fetch data from APIs, so we generally do it uh, like the response basically is a JSON format, right? So uh, we need some kind of mechanism to work with JSON files effectively. So uh, how does a JSON simply look like? So it basically looks very similar to the Python dictionaries you have. So there is a key and value pairs that you have, key and value pairs, right? So uh, let's just try to uh, see how a JSON file might look like. So I'll just uh, show you. Just give me one second. So I'm pasting one uh, link here, like you can also see it. Uh, this is basically providing a uh, list of to-dos. So this is a uh, basically this URL, if you go, it gives you a JSON resp response. That is basically a list of to-dos. So tomorrow, if you see, tomorrow we'll be working on creating a to-do application using command line interface. So uh, we will be working with JSON there as well. So just uh, make sure uh, you explore more about it. I have just given you a basic idea what JSON is. So it is basically very similar to uh, very similar to Python dictionaries. So let me just copy the part here. So this will be simply a JSON here that has the key as user ID, ID, title, and completed as true or false. So this is how a JSON might look like, very similar to Python dictionaries. So you have key and value pairs. And uh, like here, you can have lists as well, right? So you can have a list as well. So this entire thing would then be again, like this is also a JSON format. Here you have a list of small to-dos, right? 
so let's say here it is two and two So there is a mapping between Python objects and uh, JSON uh, entities. So Python objects and JSON entities, you can basically have some kind of mapping. So like in JSON, so a list in the Python is basically a array in JSON. So uh, whatever you see here is a array. So it is a array of to dos. So it a list in Python is array in JSON, right? So uh, you can just uh, see more about this. what is the mapping between different things so uh, let's uh, try to basically uh, have this thing in a json file so let's create a simple json file uh, let us say i create a file uh, to do json dot json let's open this file to do json dot json and let's paste uh, this uh, json that we have here let me say here task 1 Let's say task one and let's say task two. So we want to read this file and store this in a dictionary, right? So we want to extract this information and store this in a dictionary, right? Yes, you are right, Ravi. It is an object. Uh, so a dictionary in Python is an object in JSON. So let me just confirm as well. so what is our uh, goal here is now we want to read this json file and we want to create a list like since this is a list we want to basically let's say let's say we want to find out how many tasks in our list are completed etc so we will have to effectively pass this data so there are two two operations one is serialization and one is deserialization so serialization is the process of converting python object to a json string and simply deserialization is the process of converting a json string to a python object right so uh, in different languages you must have uh, come across like if you have worked with apis you must have come across these two terms so when we will read a json file we will be doing what we call as deserialization and when we will be doing the serialization that time we will be writing to a json file so here we will be doing a write operation uh, does that make sense to everyone here we will be doing a read operation right so basically a dict maps to an object a list maps to an array list or a tuple both of them map to a array and a string basically maps to a string str is what we have in python in json we have string and int long float all these kinds of numbers map to number in json true maps to true uh, the in boolean uh, boolean things only the first character is small false maps to false and none maps to null in case of json so this is the kind of mapping we have from python to json right i hope uh, that makes sense so now let us try to open this file right so any doubts till this point let me take up some doubts json files will have json objects and json arrays right ravi right so everything in the json file is a json string any doubts till this point to anyone so the serialized uh, serialized data pavan is asking will the serialized data be a json string or a binary data so uh, the serialized data will be a json string right it will not be a binary data uh, we serialize and deserialize because we want to get the data in our python code right so uh, we will have to basically access it so let's say we want to access the information let's say we want to access how many of the uh, how many of the tasks are completed so we want to parse this data so for that we need to deserialize that is convert it to python object so the python object here would be a list right and this list will be having a dictionary so it will be getting converted to a list of dictionary in python 
whatever you see above is will will be converted to a list of dictionary right does that make sense uh vishnu we have only integers floating point uh just okay let me just not write here long intent float that makes sense right uh so python has objects right dhruv there are objects there is a list object there is a dictionary object there is a floating point or number object there is a boolean object right so we'll be mapping the object to the json entity right we are mapping the objects okay let's now go into the uh, actual action of uh, doing the serialization deserialization yes ravi you are right whatever you have said is correct okay let's continue now so first of all what we will do is we will have to import the json library right so we import the json library and then what we'll do is we will use the context manager with open to do's underscore json dot json will open this in the read mode as file so now what we will say is data uh, sorry data is json dot load of this file so it is very similar how we read the csv files so there it was a reader of uh, reader function here we have a load uh, load function that will take the file object and let's just try to print the data so you will see what happens next so let's say python3 file uh, sorry python3 file3.py so what you see is we get a list right if we just try to print the type of this data you will see that it is simply a list right class list and let's say we access the first element so that will be a dictionary so first element is simply a dictionary let's try to print what is the first element uh, data of 0 so that is simply user id id title so you see this dictionary with key value pairs is returned to us so that is how you can simply deserialize the data so you see that you see deserializes supporting file like object containing a json to a python object so this function is simply this uh, load function is simply deserializing the json data right and uh, mapping it to the python object right so that's how we simply uh, do this thing uh, there is a, symbol, a similar function that is json dot load s of file uh, sorry of string here you will pass the string not the file so you can read you can basically uh, deserialize from the string as well so you see that loads function deserializes a string bytes or byte array to a python object so this you can try exploring your own okay so now that we have seen how to read the data let's now try to see how we can write to a python file sorry write to a json file not a python file so if uh, similarly we will open the file let's say with open uh, let's say we have uh, to do uh, sorry let's say marks.json we want to have marks json uh, file we are opening it in write mode and as the file object so now what we have to see is we have to create a dictionary let's say we will be writing a dictionary to a json file so i create a marks dictionary and it is always better if you write a dictionary in python using this uh, like moving to the next line so whatever keys and values you have just write one key value pair in a single line so just say that let's say row number is 12 and let us say that the name is simply abc and the marks are let's say 99 so this is the marks dictionary and we will be writing this to our json file so we will simply say now similar to the load function we have a function that we call as dump function so we can simply say json dot dump and here you see that we will pass the object the object here is a dictionary so let's say marks of the marks dictionary and we will also have to pass the file so that is the file object so now let's try to run this code so if you try to run this code you will see that a file marks.json would have been created 
sorry, uh, marks dot JSON. Now here you see that we are getting this uh, dictionary or this JSON string that we wanted, right? So dictionary maps to a object in JSON, right? So we get this JSON object, right? So that's how we can simply uh, read and write to a JSON file. Now, one thing is, <clears throat> let's say, you want to uh, write this thing in a more cleaner way. So there are some uh, there are some uh, optional parameters. You can simply say indent is equal to true. So there is one parameter indent is equal to true. Let's see what that does. So now if you see marks uh, dot JSON, so you see that it has been well indented, right? So if you want to write to the uh, file in a more cleaner way. So this is basically we are trying to ready print the JSON file, right? There is one more parameter that we can say that will be salt keys is true. So this salt keys will simply uh, make these keys in a sorted manner. So let's just try to run this. So if you see, you will get marks, name, roll number. So all the three keys have been now sorted in a lexicographical order, right? So you can try exploring more such optional parameters. Uh, but this is the basic idea of reading to a reading from a JSON file and writing to a JSON file. Similarly, you can write to a string. So for that purpose, you can simply say that JSON dot dump s, and here you will have marks dictionary. So let's try to see this also. So let's just print what will be JSON dot dump s of marks dictionary. So you see that you get this uh, dictionary. So you get this string. So this dictionary was converted to a string now. So if you see the documentation of dump s, it serializes object to a JSON formatted string. Here also we can pass an indent is equal to true and sort keys is equal to true. So then you see that it will be a pretty printed, right? So you get the output in a cleaner way, right? So I hope uh, now you can operate with JSON files very easily, right? Uh, Ravi is asking a good question. Can I sort based on the values? Just try exploring on that file. Uh, why we use files? We use files because we try to operate on large chunks of data, right? We want to uh, store the data in some kind of non-volatile memory, right? So uh, <clears throat> if you see the databases also ultimately are storing the uh, storing whatever is there in the database in some kind of files, right? But that basically use some data structures like B trees and D plus trees. So let's not get into that, right? So any doubts till this point? Uh, so we serialize JSON to string. So we ser uh, sorry, serialize the Python object to the JSON string and deserialize the JSON string to the Python object. I hope that answers the question, uh, Shravan. Anyone else has any doubts? Okay. So one last thing before we end the session. So we will just uh, see how we can uh, work with a uh, API and work, uh, get the response. Okay. So there is one library that is known as requests library. So that allows us to work with APIs. So APIs is something you should try to explore once on your own. Uh, let's say that there is this URL from where we will get the response. So if you try opening this URL in your browser, you will get a list that is a JSON list, right? So now we want to get that here. So we can simply say response is equal to requests dot get at this URL. So we will get the data that is present at this endpoint and uh, store it in the response variable. And then we try to read this. So we can simply say here to do is equal to JSON dot load s. So now response is simply a string. So we want to deserialize the string to a Python object. So we simply say response dot text. So whatever is the text of this response, that will be a string. And we will simply convert it to a uh, Python object, right? So now let's try to print the type of to do's. If you see here, it will take some time because it is fetching the data. So it will be simply a class of list, right? 
So now let's say I want to print the first five to dos. So I can simply say print to dos colon five. So it will print from zero to four based indexing. So we are slicing the list of to dos, right? So because to dos was a list object, it will take some time. Uh, not sure why it is taking a time. Let's suggest uh, once try to print the first to do only. Okay. Or what I can do is I can just store this response in a text file. So let's uh, store this response in to do's JSON. So I have stored the entire response in to do's JSON. So now what I will be doing is instead of fitting to this URL, so this is something you can explore once on your own. Okay. So let us simply do this thing with uh, open to do's JSON dot JSON in the read mode as file. You will simply say that load the to, uh, to do's now just the thing that will change is here we will load from the file so we can say to do's dot load instead of load s we will use load function and here we will pass the file object right and now let's try to print the first to do so now you see that the first to do got uh, printed so let us say now we want to find out how many to do's are completed so we can simply have a count. Let's say we have a count completed is equal to zero. So then we will simply say that for to do in to do since this is a list and then inside we have a dictionary. So if to do of completed, so here we have a dictionary which will, which will have a completed key equals to true. Then we can simply say that increase the count completed. And at the end, we can simply print the count that is completed. Right. So you see that out of the uh, total to do's, let's also print how many we have print length of to do's. So out of 200 to do's in this file, 90 of them have been completed. So you see how powerful file handling is. So like we can operate on a large chunk of data very easily, right? We can also do any other kind of processing that we need from this data, right? Uh, this to do's JSON. So I hope now you can write down small programs that will be reading from either text files, CSV files or JSON files and writing to these kind of files and doing some basic manipulation, right? So uh, that is it basically. I am done with the uh, part that we had to cover, done with the ag agenda for today. Now there are some things that you have to explore. So there are some files, let us say you want to work with zip files. Let us say you work want, want to work with OS path, you want to uh, work with moving or renaming files, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some li uh, libraries that you can explore. So let me just name them for you. Uh, let me just do one thing. Let me share the screen. So uh, let me just uh, share a different screen. Okay, so I hope you can uh, see this. Uh, Lectures five notes file. Yeah, uh, Pooja is asking instead of to do's, can we take any other variable? Yes, we can do that. That is just a placeholder to store that uh, particular thing, particular object of uh, list that we have. So if you can see this, so you can access the notes for today's session over here. And uh, if you found this repository helpful, you can also start this repository. If you can see that at the top, you have this star and watch. Uh, so just star and watch the repository uh, so that you can keep getting updates from this repository, right? So in the end, we have mentioned uh, similar things. So you can just explore some of these libraries like pathlib, os.path, shutil. And like if you want to write Python objects to disk. So currently we have seen writing Python objects to files like CSV and JSON. So if you want to write them to disk, so there is a library pickle. So just try to explore that library as well. So if you go to this Python uh, documentation, uh, let's say uh, you want to see your current path or like you want to print the absolute path. So you can just simply say import OS and os.path.absolute path. Let's try to do import OS and let's just try to print os.path 
let's see what happens uh, okay so os dot path is is again a module so os dot path dot current directory so this will give us the current working directory you see it will print dot dot is the current working directory and let's just try to pass in some file current directory of let's say or let's just try to see if there is a okay absolute path let's just try to print the absolute path for the uh, dot directory so you see that it will give us the absolute path return a absoluteized version of the path name path so you see that it gives me the entire path till the current directory right so just try exploring these uh, libraries os dot path if you want to move the files copy the files if you want to have uh, let's say rename the files so you can just try exploring these libraries pickle is about python object serialization and we also have uh, some other libraries data compression so let's say you want to work with uh, zip files so if you want to open zip file extract zip files from a python script that also you can do so try to explore all these uh, different libraries that are mentioned over here so then you will be able to become more proficient working with the file handling right okay okay sorry the console is not visible let me share the console so basically what i did here was yeah what i did here was one second i just imported the os module and just i tried to print os dot os dot path dot so we can just try to print the current working directory so you see that it will print the current directory that is okay sorry it is a string it is not a function it is just a string object so you see it prints dot and let's say we want to get the absolute path so this abs path will basically return the absolute version of a path so here let's say let's go, uh, get the absolute path for dot so it will print the entire path for this right so that is how like just try exploring these libraries just try exploring the uh, os libraries path library shutl pickle all these kind of libraries right so you can see uh, them in the python repository scalar academy slash intro to python right so you can just see it over here just start this repository watch this repository you can just keep getting updates directly right okay so that is it any other doubts do you have that is it for today's session uh, if we recap we covered working with text files working with csv files json files and also the next steps right okay any doubts now so uh, ravi is asking just before we end let's take one more question what is the way to explore all the libraries just go to the official documentation that we have linked in this uh, in this lecture notes just go to the documentation and try to read just see any function that you want to use and just try to explore right great so uh, see you tomorrow then in tomorrow session uh, we will be learning or basically tomorrow session will be applying the concepts that we have learned today so basically in tomorrow session we will be learning the applying the concepts that we have learned till now we'll be creating a to do application in command line so that will be working in command line so uh, that is it for today see, see you tomorrow everyone then and uh, head on to the instagram page and start answering the quiz right away so see you tomorrow bye so today's agenda is basically we will be creating a to do application as we had uh, discussed yesterday so today we will be applying all the concepts that we have learned till now completely we will be applying all the things we have learned uh, starting from the uh, starting from the flow control loops and uh, file handling and uh, even structuring uh, structuring our code into separate files so we'll be building a complete application that we will be using in our command line so just to give you an overview uh, we will be creating a to do application where you can create some to do lists and in those to do lists you can have some uh, to dos that you can mark as complete or incomplete so uh, once we get started it will be more clear
okay so uh, let's get started yesterday's class was there it was on file handling as you, and you can see the link in the video section of scalar academy channel okay let's uh, start so uh, basically <clears throat> what we want to achieve first let's write down some things let's create a file let's say uh, readme.md so i have created a file here where i'll be listing down all the requirements that we will be needing so in this to do cli application let me first structure our today's session so how we are going to uh, basically go about creating this small to do application so first of all we will be finalizing the use cases and like how we will be using how we will be running our application so what will be the final commands that we will be running in the command line right then we will be basically structuring our code into separate files and then finally we will start the implementation and then we will be doing the uh, implementation along with testing and finally we will be able to run our application run and use it so that is how the total flow will look like for creating this to do application uh, cli stands for command line interface so we will be able to run our application right here in the command line so what we want is we want to create some to do lists and inside each of them list each of the list will be having some to dos and those we can see we can add update delete or we can mark them as complete right so you can use this application to track uh, the to dos that you have right so it will be a great learning experience let's get started so any any doubts till this point uh, so the structure of our today's session is will be uh, first of all clearing the functionalities we need in our application so we will be able to figure out what all commands we will be able to use at the end and then we will be starting with the structuring of code and finally the implementation right so does that make sense to everyone okay fine so now let's look at what all are the uh, use cases so basically what we want so let's write down the use cases so we want that we should be able to create a yeah uh, ravi is asking to do's in the sense that it is task to be done exactly to do's means the task we have to do so we'll be able to create and update retrieve all the things we'll be able to do all the things through command line so we'll be having a end to end application which we can use sounds great right so we'll be able to create a to do list so what all we want from application to create a to do list right and basically to show all the to do lists that we have and then we should be able to add edit delete mark as complete incomplete etc right the to do items present in those lists so basically you want to have multiple lists and in each list there will be some to do items right so uh, let's say you have one list for your academics one list for your projects etc etc right so you want to able be able to create multiple lists and add to do items in those particular lists right uh, so you also want to show all the to do items in a particular list right so these are the four basic functionalities that you will kind of need right you can add any extra functionalities that you can think of later so we will start with these four functionalities and we will try to uh, see how we can uh, implement on top of it any extra requirement that we get right does that make sense to everyone so now let us also see what will be the commands that we will be using so the commands to basically use our application so if we are clear with how we will be using our application it will become more easier for us to write the code right so commands to use the cli application so uh, priyant we are using python so we'll be creating this application end to end in python so this is an introduction to python series and that is why we are building this thing in python in the next week you will do the same thing using the django framework in python does that make sense let's continue so the first command that we will kind of need will be to have some list so let's say we will use two prefixes 
so we'll have some prefixes for the commands that are basically list and to do so for some particular list we will use the prefix list and for the commands to do uh, for adding updating deleting the to dos we'll list use the prefix to do it will be more clear once we uh, see this thing so uh, this part we are not going to deploy this will be a command line application we will be able to use it directly in our cli uh, the deployment part we will see for the django application we will build in the next week hope that makes sense so we will be able to uh, show all the lists that are available list show so this command will basically show all the to do lists that we have right then we will have a command to create a list so list create the list name so this will basically create a list with the given name that is list name right then we will have a command to basically use a particular list so we will be adding to do items in a particular list so we should be able to use that particular list so we can say that list use and the list name right so this will basically select a particular to do list Uh, then we will have the commands for to do part so we should be able to add a particular to do so to do add in the to do title right then we should be able to see all the to do so let's use to do all to basically show all to dos in the selected list this will be uh, to do add to do title will be used to add a to do item in the list right uh, just ask any questions you have right away so we should be able to take up questions at that instant only okay yeah vishnu is asking what is to do here to, to do is basically a task that is to be done is basically a task that is to be done so it could be like uh, it could be something like example example basically learn loops in python right so this might be a to do right example could be uh, watch the previous lecture again right so you can have some tasks that you have task that you have to complete that is basically termed as a to do and a list will be a collection of to dos so a list is simply a collection of to dos does that make sense now so you can group your to dos in some particular lists so let us say you are studying five academic courses in the current semester so then you can have one to do list for each of the courses right then you can have some items in each of them like prepare for the next exam build the next project example etc etc uh list use list name so aniket are you asking about this thing yes ujwal the code will be available uh, vidhan i have repeated that let me know if there is any doubt aniket a to do use is uh, nothing uh, a list use command is there that will be used to select a particular to do list so let's say you have four lists for your four academy courses you are enrolled in this semester right yes so dhruv is asking what is meant by list use so list use list name will basically be used to select a particular list so let's say let us say that you have these lists let's say you have some courses course 1 for course 1 you have a list for course 2 for course 3 now inside course one you can have some multiple to dos it could have some to dos which could be like let's say read topic a it could be like attempt test x example etc right similarly course two can have some to dos does that make sense now so we have to select a particular list before we start doing any to do operations before we start adding editing deleting or marking as complete right a uh, list is at ravi has a good question so ravi is asking list is a keyword so basically this command we are not executing in python so this we will execute in our command line so like you say python 3 app.py so this will run the app.py file now once it starts executing we will be able to enter these commands so consider them as some of your custom commands which you can run on top of the python application so these are the commands that you have created yourself so you will actually have to parse these commands 
and actually run the particular function in python file right okay ravi got it anyone else has any doubts okay so then also you need to have to do edit to do remove and let's say to do complete to mark it as complete and then let's say to do incomplete so now my question to you is for all of these four commands what all extra information do you need yes exactly ravi it is command like ls pwd etc so we will be able to run our application through the command line we will be giving commands right right here itself my question to everyone is for these four commands do do we need any extra information so let's say to do all will give us give us the id and title of to dos so what all should we pass in these four commands as well so which to do are we editing which are we removing which one are we marking as complete so we need some identification here what is that thing so what do you think should we use should we use the id should we use the title what do you think would be a better idea yes so uh, we need the list items <clears throat> but uh, should we use the id or the title great most of you are saying id so we should use id ideally because it will be a particular identifier two to dos might have similar names but that is also not quite feasible not quite realistic right so we can use either one of them uh, in this scenario so let's uh, stick with id at the moment so let's say we are using the item id right let's say we are using this thing so all of these commands will have the item id as an additional argument right so till this point anyone has any doubts uh, also we need one command that will be help command so it will basically print all the print all the commands we can use in our application and one command should be there to quit our application right so this quit command will basically used to exit the application so what we will be doing is we will be running our command prompt so like you see this command prompt appears so if i if i do python so then okay let's use python 3 so you see that this command prompt keeps on appearing so let's say we give some uh, command 1 plus 2 that is 3 so now again this command prompt ap appears so we want something very similar so our application should be giving us the prompt after every command and until we type quit so in this case we will be typing exit until we type quit the application will be running right so does that make sense to everyone okay so uh, basically complete will basically mark the item as completed mark the to do item with item id as complete and this will let's say mark the so let's say you want to track your progress how many items how many to dos have you completed from the given list you want to know that statistics so you want to have a boolean variable with every to do task that you will say whether that is completed or incomplete so uh, this incomplete will similarly be used to mark the to do item with item id as incomplete right and this is basically used to edit the item with item id one more thing so this edit isn't complete so here we need one more thing here we need the new title as well so let's say by mistake we uh, typed some incorrect title so after uh, when we are doing an edit we need something else we need the new title as well for that uh, particular to do task right does that make sense and in this case basically we will remove the item with item id right so with id equal to this let's say so till this point anyone has any doubts so we have basically figured out our requirements so we are done our done done with our first step so this was basically figuring out the requirements requirements and the uses of our application so that is how you should basically proceed uh, when starting with building a project from the scratch first of all figure out all the requirements and how the end user will be able to use your application so let's now move to the second step that is structuring our code yes dapa i am saying that it will only edit the title so the to do edit item id new title will only edit the title because we are just storing one information for our to do right now that is title yeah that is the rename functionality exactly 
yes we will be using the list so we will figure out now how we will basically structuring our code and how we will be implementing so basically we also have to figure out where we will be storing our data so here we will need to figure out a few things where to store the data and how to manipulate the data right so let's uh, think about this now so we have listed down the commands we need for lists for the to dos and uh, some of the trivial commands help and quit right yes we have that uh, prakash we have this so we have to do remove item id okay uh, that we have considered prakash <clears throat> great so uh, now how should we implement so the thing is uh, we need somewhere to store our data so right now we are not aware of the databases that we can use we will cover that part in django so right now what we can do is we can have a json file so yesterday we learned about how to store data in a json file how to retrieve data how to store data in a json file so let's have one file for the list that will be simply so let us figure out where we will be storing the data so we can have one file that will be let's say lists.json right so now it will simply store so there are two options here like either it stores a list of to do lists so basically let's say it could be something like storing uh, the name here let's say it stores list 1 it stores list 2 so it could be a list something like this right yes uh, ravi has a good question if we are uh, if we want to implement removing an entire list so we need to have additional functionality so that is what i am saying let's go with these these four use cases in the beginning then you can add on top of them any extra use case that you might consider right yes ashish we will see that part ashish we will see that part how will be getting the id so that is a very good question ashish we will be seeing that part so ashish has asked a very good question so we will be seeing this part how we will be extracting the id that is a really good question so uh, one approach was this we have a list but now the issue with this list is so let us say we want to check uh, we want to check whether a given list exists so in our code there will come a, a come a, a condition where we will have to check whether a given list exists or not right so before this command if you see before the list use list name command you must be sure whether that list exists or not right so we need to have this functionality to check whether a given list exists so uh, now if we are doing this in a list we have to iterate over all elements so using the above approach we need to iterate over all elements so need to iterate over all list elements so we need to figure out a more optimal way right so what we can do is instead we can store it uh we can store it as a dictionary of to do list so store it as a dictionary of to do lists so it could look something like this now so it will be having a dictionary and each each it will be a dictionary of dictionary and to do list is also a dictionary and we, where we will store the title and the created at the time so let's say we will also store the time at which we created that dictionary so this also might be useful in some analysis part so we also store the created at part so we can uh, remove this for time being if you say but let's use this part as well so we will have it as a dictionary of dictionary here we will have the title and let us say here we will give the name and then the second part of this dictionary will be the created at key and here we will store the time instant when we created this particular list so this is the structure we will be using to store our list.json file so any doubts till this point yes so if we store it as a dictionary the thing that will become easier is we will be able to find whether a particular list exists in our uh, in our database or basically in our json file so we just have to check uh, sorry we need, we forgot to give a key here the key was the title 
so the title is the key and the value is again a dictionary so uh, you might say that this is a bit redundant here that we are storing title as the key and inside that also we have the title as the key so to uh, handle this part what we can have is we can have here the file name so the file name will store the name where we will actually store that file so what we will do is for every for every list we will store a separate file so a separate json file for each list so we will try to segregate the files so for every uh, to do list we will have a separate json file does that make sense so here we will store the file name right so now we can simply check whether a given to do list exists by checking if the key equal to title so if the title key exists or not right okay so the purpose of dictionary of dictionaries is we want to store some information about each list so basically this to do list has some information right so let us say we want to know when that to do list was created so we can simply say let's say this is our data so we can simply say data of let's say this title is simply list 1 so we can say data of list 1 of created at so we can simply extract any kind of information let's say after some time you want to have some additional data here as well let us say you want to have some more data like uh, maybe you want to have uh, used instances like how many times you have used used count so this could be some integer right so let's say any time you want to modify or add some extra data on top of it so then it will become easier so our json file lists.json file is basically a dictionary of dictionary so it is having a dictionary which in which inside have a dictionary so each dictionary element refers to the list item so by a particular key you can access the particular dictionary of that list it will store two things at the moment the file name and the created at time instant does this make sense till this point Yes, Ujwal has a good question. Key can be ID as well, but let us use the list name at the particular instant. Yes, uh, Dyapa Shravan also has a good point. Why to use multiple lists? So we are just doing this as we are starting out as a beginner. So we want to segregate our code or our data into multiple files so that it becomes easier for us to visualize the things. Right. So that was a good question. so uh, let us just start with this now uh, we have figured out how our to do list will look like so how a particular list dot json file will look like so let us say how this list one dot json will look like right so here we will simply store a list of to do items right so it would be something like a list which will have a particular item and each item will be let's say a dictionary so here we will have the information title let us say it is the name we have the created at time instant let's say it is some time and then we will have the completed uh, key that will store true or false so it could be let's say false initially right so it will be having such multiple to do items does that make sense okay so basically now we have figured out how we will be storing our data into files right so each to do item is simply a dictionary so does this point make sense till now yeah file name will simply mean, mean the to do name only so let's say it would be let something like list1.json yes we will be doing everything using python program so we will not be doing anything manually here so ravi has a good question we will be writing code for each uh, each and everything okay so anyone else has any doubts till this point otherwise we can continue so now we have figured out how we will be storing our data and manipulating the data 
so for manipulating the data we have to simply read the json files and simply uh, serialize and deserialize the data so as we uh, learned about yesterday serialize and deserialize the data right so rohit try to think about this rohit has a good question rohit try to think about that okay so now we are clear with the requirements and how we have to uh, store the data let's now start with implementation and structuring our code so what we will do is we will simply have a file that will be let us say app.py so i have created this folder to do cli live so inside this folder we will create a file let's say app.py so this will be our main file okay so let's open this app.py so this will be our main file that we will be using right so is this clear till this point about the requirements and storing the data okay so now uh, what we will do is as you have learned earlier so we want to have a main function here so if you remember how we structured different files so here we will be having different files in our code so uh, let's have the uh, let's use the double underscore name and which we call as dunder name so we'll check if this is equal to double underscore main dunder main so then we will basically have a main function that we will call so let's create a main function that we will be calling it takes in some arguments let us say which are nothing right now no arguments so here now we will simply say that started the to do application right so now what we want to do is we want to take input from the user command as input as long as the user does not hit the command quit so let's simply type uh, let's simply have a while one loop so this loop will execute it will take the command as input right and then we will have to parse this command also let's give the uh, command prompt as well and uh, let's simply say that if command of 0 sorry uh, let's simply say if command equals to quit then we will simply break out of this while loop so does this point make sense till this point let's try to run this program yeah while one or while two both are uh, both works let's try to run our application so see our application would look something like this it will start the to do application then it will ask for the command prompt it will ask from uh, user the command as input so we will be giving some commands let's say we'll give to do to do uh, lists or show this will show all the to dos that we have we'll give some command like to do create we'll say that list 1 so right now there is no functionality here so we will have to impl implement this uh, pratham i use the dollar sign just because it is clear to the user that we have to give some input here right that is the main uh, uh, reason for giving that thing does that make sense okay so now what we will simply say is let's say quit here so it will simply break the uh, application so we went out of the application so that's how uh, <clears throat> yes so ravi as you are saying that we can consider the case also so that we can do uh, as the ex extra functionalities right we are just building the basic application right now so now uh, it is better to have a function that will simply parse our command and return the command name and arguments so as you saw that there were some commands that are that are having some arguments so what we will do is so let's try to structure our command syntax so first of all we have the command type command type could be a list command or a to do command then we have the command name that could be show create use add all edit something like this and then we have some extra arguments so the way we will be structuring our command syntax is we say that there are three things here one is the command type other one is the command name and other thing is the command arguments so we'll try to extract all these things so we'll have to split this input so we'll get some strings separated by space so split the strings string separated by space right so let's have a separate function uh so basically what we'll do is we'll get the command name and the command arguments 
from a function that will call the parse function. It will take the command as input. So let's define a parse function that takes the command as input. So just see that how we are structuring our application into different functions. And after we uh, complete this parsing thing, we will get go ahead to basically structuring the commands into different module. So uh, let's uh, do one thing. Let's not implement this thing right now. Let's start with uh, seeing how we'll be implementing the commands. So what we will do is, uh, let's say this will return the command name and command arguments. Here we will be simply checking, uh, we'll be having some conditionals. So something like, let me uh, complete this part. So it could be something like if command name is quit, then we will simply break. Else if the command name is something like. So there, there could be a scenario where the user enters an invalid command. So we'll handle that case as well. Here we'll simply print that. Please enter a valid command. Right. And something like else if command name is. So uh, there was a command use. So uh, I'll tell you that we'll have to handle separately. So we'll see about this thing. Let's simply write down to do here. And <clears throat> else if it is a command of the type to do. So this also we'll see. Okay, command dot split. So uh, here what we can simply do is we can simply say that command type is command dot split of zero. So the first thing will be the command type. That is after we split the first element in that list, list of strings. So else if command type is to do. So I'm writing these use and to do things here separately. I'll tell you in a bit of moment why we are doing this thing. Uh, let's simply skip it for the timing. Then uh, any other command that we have will simply be having a command dictionary. So what we will do is instead of hard coding each of the things. So let's see how we'll structure this thing. So we'll just complete this function later. So this function will simply take the command as input and returns the command name and arguments. Okay. So let's create, let's create a, fun, uh, a folder that will be storing commands. So we want to segregate our commands from our application. Uh, so parse is a function group that we'll be using. So it will simply be returning the command name and arguments. Okay, I'll try to go a little slowly here. Uh, so Ashish, the underscore underscore name is equal to main simply means that when we run our application, this variable will be set to this main uh, underscore underscore main. And this will call the main function. You can just go through the uh, day three of our Python series. This was explained in more detail. Okay. So let's create a folder. We'll create a folder that will be commands folder, right? So now inside this command folder, we will have three files. So let's have one file as underscore underscore init dot py. So this will be the first thing that will be running when we import this commands directory. So we will be using this commands as a module that will be importing. And one thing we'll have is list.py. This will be for working with the list commands. And one thing, one file for the, uh, for working with the to do commands. So to do's.py. So now if I open all of these things, I have these three more files. So in the init, init, uh, dot py file, uh, so parse is not an inbuilt function. So parse is a function uh, that we will be implementing. So we'll be implementing this. We'll uh, get to it after we structure the rest of the rest of the application. So uh, there are some things I might go a little bit fast over here because we will be, uh, we, it is mostly that you will have to implement yourself after we uh, finish this session. So. Let's just uh, increase the pace somewhat. Don't uh, feel overwhelmed. You will be able to understand most of the things. So here we will have a dictionary of commands that will simply map the command name to the function. So it will simply basically map the command name 
to the command function so then we will be having uh, a very ease to use that function so we will be able to understand this thing in a while so let us say we just we will here import the lists as well so we will import commands dot lists so this will simply import the lists dot py file all the functions that are there in that file we will also import the commands dot to do's file so just see that we are we have to file the uh, pass the folder name as well so whatever imports we do in our project we will be doing this from the uh, main the root directory so this to do cli live is the root directory so here we have commands directory so that is why we say import commands dot lists so this will import all the functions that we have in the list dot uh, py file so here we have some function let us say def show list it will take some arguments let's say just we are going to print the arguments we'll have some function as create the list we'll take some arguments here we'll simply print the arguments similarly we will have some function let's say use the list so here we'll pass some argument print the args right so in list we'll have these three functions right so now we imported all these three functions so now we can import we can map this show key to the function so we can simply say lists dot show lists so now when we will be calling this function we can simply use this dictionary so what we'll do is we'll import this dictionary in our app dot py file so what we are doing is we are trying to uh, get rid of hard coding these things so that we can simply use the function directly by mapping it with the key as the command name right so a uh, next thing is we'll have the let's say use command here we'll be using list dot use list we have the create command lists dot create list right then we'll have some command for to do's so let's say here we have def add add item so we take in some arguments simply let's say print the arguments for time being and let's say we have def show items it will simply show all the to do's that we have available so let's just uh, skip uh, rest of the functions let's just go with these two by the time being and these three functions so we can simply map the all function all command to simply uh, to do's dot to do's dot show items right and the add command to to do's dot uh, sorry to do's dot add item right so we simply imported these functions by using this import statement and we are mapping the command name to the command function so it will become very clear in a moment in a, in just a moment let's make it very clear so what we'll do is here we will simply import the commands so if we import the commands module this will simply run the init.py file this will simply execute the init.py it will create this dictionary and you will be able to map use this command name to map to the command function then you can execute this so it will look something like this so here you would be able to say something like let me just show it to you be able to say commands uh, okay let's do this thing uh, what we'll do is more specifically we'll say from in, from commands import the commands dictionary so then we can simply say here is commands dictionary of uh, the key we will be having is command name and then we can simply call this thing so this is basically a function this is a function that we can simply call with the arguments so here we can pass in the command arguments right so you see that this is a very uh, good way of calling a function so we are trying to generalize our thing so that we have to not write many more cases here so we don't have to hard code each of the cases right so whenever a new command comes then we have to simply create a mapping over here right so does this point make sense now so this will simply be used to call that particular command so we don't have to hard code the command uh, name directly so we can uh, use this init.py file add any extra command that we have here directly right so uh, any doubts till this point
okay so it seems like there is uh, no doubts uh, it will become more clear uh, okay so this part will become more clear in a moment so let's just try to run our program till this okay what is parse parse is also going to be clear in a moment so in the interest of time let's just uh, let me just use this thing so the code uh, is basically available in the github repository let me just use this parse function let me just uh, copy this thing sorry so yeah so here let's just go through this parse function first so it will split the command then this will return a list then the command type is simply command list of zero then if the command type is help or quit so these are the two commands which are separate so we can simply so see that we are re returning the command name and argument so here we return command type as the command name and there are no arguments so we return an empty list otherwise the type could be a list type or a to do type so it is a list type then we extract the command name then the command name has to be in either show use or create right so then we return the command name and the arguments will be whatever is following the second index so whatever is after the second index so the first index was simply list and second index could have been something like use and after that it could be something like list one right so does that make sense so in this case uh, cmd list of two onwards will be simply storing this list list one right will be storing this list of strings right and otherwise we can return that it is an invalid command and empty arguments otherwise if the type is to do type then we will simply uh, take the command name and now it has to be between it has to be in the uh, list that we have that is add all edit remove complete incomplete so for the time instant we are implementing only the we are implementing only add and show functionalities right so add and all so only these two uh, rest of you uh, you will have to try that as an assignment so first let's uh, just try to run whatever we have created till this point and in the else cases will return invalid and here also we return invalid right so uh, let's now see what happens if we run this so just uh, skip that uh, these two commands for the time being use and to do let's try to run our python program python3 app.py okay uh, there has been some mistake here in the line number 42 okay let's just have something here print use command so let's try to run this now okay so there seems to be some uh, mistake here as well okay we uh, miss missed out the comma here right so now let us try to see let's try to uh, see what command we have so we'll see that uh, we say that let's say list show okay command dict is not defined okay so it has to be uh, it has to be commands dict i just used command here right so let's try to run this list show so if you see that the arguments are empty if we say list add or sorry list create if we say list add it would give an invalid command so please enter a valid command why because for the list type of commands we just allowed the show use and create uh so vidhan we will go through everything once again let's try to add the functionalities right now so uh, let's say that if we say list create list 1 so you will see that the arguments here are list 1 so why because see see what happens is okay command arcs you did not understand vidhan so let's go one by one once again so first of all we take the command as input then we uh, find the command type then we call the parse function with the command name it will return two things so it will return the command name and the arguments 
so let's go to the parse function then it will simply uh, have the command list and the command type now uh, so let's uh, let's see the list commands so here we have list and we use the add functionality so list add so the command type would be list so we will get to this else if part now the command name is simply add so add is not in this list so we will simply return invalid so you saw that we got please enter a valid command and if it was a create command then it is inside this list so we will return the command name that is uh, list command sorry create command and the command argument so arguments here would be list one right so arguments is whatever is after the first uh, after the first thing here right so uh, you see that then this gets returned so we get back here so you see it is not a quit command it is not invalid command it is not a use command it is not a to do type command but it is the else command so what will happen is the commands dict will have a mapping so it will have a mapping so they create maps to list dot create list so this will simply be so commands dictionary of command name this part this part if you see this part will map to list dot create list so it will map to list dot create list and here what you can see is here we will call this create list function that is simply printing the arguments right so we are passing the command arguments and that is simply pre, uh, printing the arguments so does this make sense how we have structured our code and how it is working let's try to run this let's say list create list one so it will simply show the arguments let's say list show empty arguments let's say list use list one it will uh, it will say use command why because we are printing that thing over here okay okay it makes some sun, uh, some sense so uh, let's continue so uh, one thing is one thing for the time being is let's uh, make some simplifications here so that we'll be able to finish on time okay so let us make some simplifications at this time instant so that is uh, let's say that we are working with only to do type of commands so uh, let's also call this thing here commands dictionary of command name and command arguments so let's first quit from here so now uh, let's try to say to do add so let's just uh, so i am making some simplifications right now to make it easier so we are not having multiple lists for the time being for the time being that you have to do as an assignment what we are having is we will be working on a single to do list so you can just add some functionalities here that we are skipping so that code is available if you want to see that particular thing that will be available in the github repository so currently we are working on a single to do list so we will have some commands like to do add the uh, task one so you see that it will print the arguments so currently it is going to this to do's dot py and the add item function so let's also try to print here inside add item function right so let's exit here sorry quit here and let's try to run now we'll say to do add task one so you see that it prints prints that we are inside the add item function right so what we will do is let's say uh, we will be working with a single file that is let's have this file as list1.json so let's have this file list1.json that has simply an empty list so we have created that thing manually for the time being so uh, that part would have been done in the uh, in the code that is available in her github repository uh, for the time being let's work with this list1.json right so now uh, what we have to do here is we will be getting inside this function add item and we simply have to open this file so what we have to do is we will open this file with open so with open let's say list1.json 
and here we can simply say that uh, the mode is read mode sorry we have to open it in read plus write mode so for that we will use r plus mode that is read plus write as uh, as to do list right and we will import the json module right as we as we uh, discussed yesterday and we'll simply say that data is json dot load and we can simply say here we'll pass the to do list so let's try to print the data that we have and same thing we will do in the show items also so here also we'll say that with open uh, let's just copy this thing for the time being so we can make our code more modular we can have this thing in a separate function that will simply return the data so what we can do is let's also do that thing so let's simply say that get data function is there that simply takes the file name list name so we can simply uh, do this thing we'll open this thing uh, let's currently say that list name is list1.json and we will have uh, read mode only since we are just extracting the data and let's say that the data is an empty list and finally we will return the data so what we'll say here is uh, data is simply get data of this uh, list1.json right we'll copy that part here as well and next time we'll be opening this in the write mode why because will have to add this particular to do item that will be given so how will extract the title so the title will simply be arguments of zero right that is the title arguments will be a list containing uh, the title right so we can simply extract it like that and uh, then let's do one thing let's simply add this so we'll say that data dot append so uh, what we will be appending is a dictionary right so that dictionary is simply having a title that is simply uh, this thing title and the created at time instant so let us uh, say that let's just use the string here for the time being so we'll try to modify that thing as an enhancement that you can uh, do as an exercise so the current time will have to be uh, taken from the time library so that you can uh, try exploring once right so next thing that we will do is now we will simply say that here we will say uh, json dot dump so now we'll have to write this thing so we can say json dot dump the object is simply data and the file of file pointer is simply to do list this thing we discussed yesterday uh, that we will uh, rohit that you can just explore in the official python documentation how to use date time that code is also available in the github uh, github repository that we have where we have already uh, implemented this to do app and uh, next thing that we do is uh, we will pass let's say sort keys is equal to true and indent is equal to true so these are some additional parameters that we are giving as we discussed yesterday yes for created at you have to use that date time module okay so now in the show items function what we will do is we will simply get this data so let's say uh, now what we'll do is we'll iterate over uh, every to do item in this data and then we will simply uh, just print it so there is one thing so there is one thing that is for uh, index comma to do item there is a function known as enumerate function so this simply returns two things the index as well as the uh, list item so in this case we want the id as well so as uh, some someone asked that question how we will get the id so the id will simply be the index index of the to do item so this particular uh, thing will give us index and the to do item let's simply print the index comma will print the to do item uh, let's use index plus 1 and to do item of the type uh, the key of this will be a title so to do item is a dictionary that contains title and created at columns right so we are printing the title at this instant uh, one thing that we can do is if uh, if length of data is zero then we can simply say that uh, print 
no to do item in this list and we can simply return right so uh, that is how we will simply operate with these files will be adding data and will be uh, extracting the data let's now try to run our program we will be getting some errors let's try to see and debug them so it's very hard that everything will work in the first go let's quit this thing okay so now let's try to run this so we'll say that python3 app.py so we simply say to do show so this is not a valid command because the valid command is you see it is to do all so show is for lists which we have not implemented so to do all so it says that no to do item in this list let's now try to say to do create and let's say that we create some to do item task 1 okay so this is also not valid because create was for lists for to dos we have add command so let's say to do add task 1 so it does not it does not print anything so that must have been created so as a better uh, better user experience we should have given some output that it was created but now let's try to see it manually in the list1.json so if you see the list1.json file you see that we got this task created for us right let's try to create one more task let's say that we say to do create task 2 okay sorry it has to be to do add task 2 then you will see that task 2 has been created right then now let's try to be, uh, say uh, say to do all so it will give us all the to dos that we have one task 1 two task 2 so now let's also try to see how we'll get the time so uh, one second so we can simply use the uh, from date time import the library that is date time so we can simply say here created at and we will have date time dot now so let's try to see in uh, in the python terminal here python repl so uh, from date time import date time so let's try to see what date time dot now gives so it is some kind of object and if you see date time dot now gives up gives us an object that contains year month day time hour minute seconds etc right so we have to convert it so i am just using a, a formatter so there is a function strf time that will format this thing so if you see this will give us the formatted time so just try exploring on this strft time function i am just using it at the time instant and one more thing that we had to use was the completed uh, key so this will simply store false at that at this particular instant right so this has to store the false variable right so does this make sense to everyone now how we are doing this thing now uh, let's just empty our list for the time being uh, let's just empty that thing okay so now let us try to see also let's add one functionality let's also show how many items have been completed how many tasks have been completed so let's say that completed variable is zero so we can simply check if 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 uh, to do item of completed if this key is simply equal to true then we can simply increment the count completed plus equal to 1 and outside this we can simply say that print so we will use format string so uh, hash of okay uh, completed out of total is how much length of data tasks have been completed right so that is how we'll do this thing so let's now try to run this uh, to do application that we have built in till now so we'll simply say uh, to do all so it will say that no to do item we'll say to do add let's say task 1 let's say to do add task 2 now let's try to say to do all so you see that we get listed all the tasks and zero out of two have been completed 
So let's also say to do add task three. Now let's try to say to do all, right? So now do you understand how this to do application is working? So we have only implemented the minimal functionalities till this point. That is showing all the items to do items in the list and creating all the uh, creating or adding a particular task, right? So now uh, on top of it, there are a lot of functionalities that we listed down in our requirements that you have to implement. So edit functionality, remove, complete, incomplete, and simply you have to work on this list functionality also. Currently, we are just having one single list, right? So let me give you a demo of how our, how our final application should look like. So let me give you a demo of how our final application will look like. So uh, we are going to. Uh, so there is. Uh, so if you will open the repository that we have, uh, if you will open, let me share the link with uh, you as well. So if you will open this repository, we have implemented uh, everything here, but just try to build it yourself from scratch. That will give you the most of the learning. Uh, so let's now run this application. So let's see what all commands are available. So if you if you will run the help command, you will see that all these commands are available. List show, list use, list create, list, uh, and then the we have the to do type commands and the uh, uh, quit command. So let's try to see how many lists we have currently. Let's say list show. So we don't have anything. Let's try to create one. So list create list one. So it will say successfully created the new list. Then we can say list uh, show. It shows the list. Then we'll say list use. And let's say list use list one. So it will say successfully chosen this list. Okay. Now let us try to work with the to do's. Okay. Let's uh, try to uh, go back once again. So I'll say list use list one. Then I'll say to do, add, or basically to do all. Okay, to do all. So it will say no to do's in the list. Why don't you add one? So let's say to do, add, task one. Let's now say to do all. So it says zero out of one completed. Let's say to do, add, task two. Let's now try to say to do all. So it says that zero out of two completed. Let's now mark the first task as completed. To do complete one. Now let's try to say to do all. So now it will say that one out of two has been completed. OK, so also let's see how the files are uh, visible. So if you will see that also, uh, uh, let's see the file. Yeah, so we have one list.json file. It stores that there is a list one which has the created at and title. So this is the same structure, the dictionary of dictionary that we looked in the beginning, right? And there is a list folder that will store a particular list one.json that stores all these to do tasks. It has completed, which is true, completed at in the title, right? So that is how it is happening. You can just look at the source code. So the structure is very similar. We have app file, then we have uh, commands. In that, we have init.py, very similar. And then we have list.py. And then we have to dos.py. So the structure is the same. Just try to build it yourself once. It will give you more clarity. So uh, let me also uh, share the screen showing the repository. So do you have any doubts till this point? So mostly I am done with this thing. Uh, so Rohit is asking a question. Why do we have to use all the commands in one go? Uh, why we can't use all the commands in one go? Okay, so Rohit, we can do that. I was just exiting the console so that it was visible to you uh, clearly. So why? Because uh, everything was coming in the bottom part, right? So just for that purpose. Okay. Let me share the screen uh, showing the GitHub repository. Just give me one minute. I am opening the GitHub repository. Yeah, it seems a little complex at the moment, but uh, just try to build step by step. Like, let's once again, we'll recap the process. 
and then uh, you try to build it yourself we'll recap the process so i hope you can see the screen now okay so if you go to the introduction to python uh, scalar academy slash intro to python repository you will see that we have updated the lecture 6 uh, notes here you if you click here then you will get to this to do cli application readme file so uh, so the first step is you just list out the use cases of your application list out the commands list out the json files that you will be using so uh, then uh, let's go to the code so then we had this app.py file so if you go to app.py file we have simply two functions one is for the parsing of the command and one is the main function where you simply uh, take the command as input parse it and simply uh, simply run the command so for running the command you are using this commands dictionary so which you have imported from the uh, commands module right and then if you go to the commands module then you simply see that there are three files uh, are you able to see the screen okay there you go to init.py and here we just listed out the commands and mapped them mapped uh, them to the functions right so for example this show lists will map to uh, to do cli slash command slash list dot py dev show list right let's go to that function okay so here we are simply uh, opening this file and listing listing out uh, the list that we have right so just try to uh, create all these functions and try to implement them one by one right so that will be a good uh, step by step procedure just try to uh, first of all complete the to do's part we just implemented the uh, add item and the show item functions just try to work on edit item uh, work on remove item complete item and incomplete right so just uh, try to go function by function and it will become very easier so uh, just uh, try to build this thing from the scratch and if you are stuck then look at this repository if you are stuck then only look at this repository so dhruv you have to uh, dhruv you have to simply uh, pull the so you simply have to pull from this uh, this particular origin so just you can search about how to update a fork so dhruv just google about how to update a fork or you can simply uh, do a fresh fork of this particular repository so just go to this repository just uh, just also google about how to update a particular fork that will also be useful so i would recommend everyone to watch this uh, watch this repository and fork it so that you can simply uh, take a copy of this code just uh, go to this to do cli and try to build this application from scratch right so we are done with the session do you have any doubts we are done with the session any further doubts you have so let's quickly recap so we went from the first step that was figuring out the requirements to structuring our code then we implemented it and we kept on testing the functions as we implemented them and finally we are we were able to run some part of the application right so just follow this step by step procedure and try to build this application and just try to figure out if you can make any extra enhancements to this application right just try to make your own version where you have any extra features that you can think of right so we basically used all the concepts that we learned till now that is the flow control the loops Uh, structuring of the code importing the modules and uh, basically uh, working with json files etc so i hope it was a great learning experience right and today we will be going over quite a bit of python interview questions right now these questions are going to be about the core python language and these questions are going to be questions that were asked in top tech companies like google flipkart amazon and other places that use python extensively all right so we will begin with very simple questions about what python is and how things uh, go and then we will dive into a little more advanced questions about the python language now note that python is a very big language and python is not alone right so python comes with a large ecosystem with itself so uh, you might have heard of things like uh, numpy 
you might have heard of pandas you might have heard of matplotlib right and you might have heard of uh, things like keras and tensorflow now if you are interviewing for a python position it is very likely that the place you are interviewing for uses some of these uh, technologies right uses some of these libraries especially it is very common for places to use things like django or flask right now today in this particular session we will not be covering questions on these ecosystem topics we will be conducting another session to cover questions on these today we will be covering questions on core python language questions that are extremely important questions that you will invariably be asked if you are going to any python interview right so we are going to look at that and for these particular things we are going to have for those sessions okay now uh, if you want to some more questions if you want some more practice material uh, apart from this session you can always go on to interviewbit.com or slash python interview questions this link right here and over here you will see a large repository of python questions along with their explanations right and you will also see some uh, multiple choice questions at the end that you can try on for yourself so we keep on adding things to this particular repository so it is always nice for you if you can keep updated if you can keep in sync with this particular web page okay uh, the the questions that uh, you see here they are not tied to any particular rule whenever you go to a top company right or a company that uses python as its core technology uh, for example companies like de shop a large part of the code base is in python at least like google python is not the core language they extensively use java however a lot of systems in google use python like places like instagram places like dropbox they use python extensively irrespective of where you are interviewing for as long as you have python written down in your resume somewhere if you primarily use python as your coding language and if you are interviewing for any position that requires python then you can expect that you will be asked some of these questions cool so let us dive into the very basic questions let us start with a very simple question uh, what is python like what is python so well python is a very high level language it is an interpreted language it is a dynamically typed language it has a lot of features which has a large ecosystem right and there are various advantages to using python especially python allows you to write code very quickly and it has a very high throughput for the developer so whenever you have an application in which the developer time is more important than the computer time you use a language a high level language like python also python allows you to very quickly experiment with things which is why it is used extensively in the academia so places like data science places you have to write large pipelines of data you have to experiment a lot python is used over there it is also a very good academic language so for teaching students python is a really good language cool so let us dive into some details about python please let me ask you a question as an interviewer so what do you think is python a high level language or a low level language well python is a high level language now can someone give me examples of high level languages and low level languages low level would be things like c assembly cobol high level languages would be like c++ java python it is not a strict delineation about what high level and low level is but python is usually classified as a high level language okay what about things like strongly typed versus dynamically typed so first of all what do these things mean what does it mean for a language to be strongly typed or to be dynamically typed and once we know that what sort of typing does python use so python is a dynamically typed language uh, not not a strongly typed so we have multiple categories so we have strongly typed and weakly typed and we have statically typed and dynamically typed now python is a strongly typed language and python is a dynamically typed language now what do these terms mean so a strongly typed language is one in which every particular variable or every particular data that is in memory has a strict type associated with it for example in python if i do something like as follows so if i do something like the string 1 plus the number 2 if i do something like this in python i get back a type error i get back a type error saying that i cannot concatenate a string with an integer so that means that this particular piece of data this particular piece of data number 1 and this particular piece of data 2 these have strong types associated with themselves and python does not automatically convert the types as and when it wants so there are some constraints about what types can be used with what other types and what operators can be used with what other types contrasting this is weakly typed language things like javascript for example if i quickly open my console over here and i go to the javascript console 
In the JavaScript console, I can once again type something like one. So this is a string. I can type something like two, which is an integer. But I can also do one plus two, and this surprisingly gives me back the string twelve. So this for a programmer might not make sense. JavaScript is a weakly typed language. The string one and the number two, they have the types associated with it, but they are not strongly typed. Types can be converted between any of those. So uh, here we see that Python is indeed a strongly typed language. Now, what about a dynamically versus statically typed language? Well, you might have heard of languages like C and C++ or Java. In those languages, we usually write statements like this. So we say int i equals to 10, or we say float b equals to uh, 20.3, or we say things like boolean uh, flag equals to 2. Right? Now, these are languages which are statically typed. At the time of writing the program and at the time of compilation, the compiler knows what the type of each variable is. On the other hand, in a dynamically typed language, the compiler need not know what the type of each variable is. For example, in Python, you can simply say i equals to 10. And later on, you can also change the type of i. You can say that i equals to 2. So the type of variable i, it is not bound to something. At this particular point, the value that i is holding is an integer type. But at this particular point, the value is a Boolean type. So Python, as we see, is a dynamically typed language. All right. Now, that does not mean that Python does not support static typing. So there is something in Python called MyPy. So let me just add a new note over here. So there's something called MyPy in Python. MyPy is a static type checker for Python. So even though Python is dynamically typed, it supports optional static type checking. So you need not use it, but if you want, you have the liberty of using it. And what this does is, before you actually run your program, it will go through your entire code and it will tell you if you have made any mistakes related to the types. Okay. At the runtime, this does not have any effect. It is just before the before you run the program, it will check your code statically. All right. Now there's one more very important distinction between Python and other languages, or one more important property of Python. So is Python a compiled language? Or is Python an interpreted language? Interpreted language if I can spell it. Well, Python is actually an interpreted language. Now, if Python is an interpreted language, haven't you come across things like the Python bytecode? Or haven't you come across files that look like this, .pyc files? These are Python compiled files. What are these? If Python is interpreted, what the hell are these things? So, an interpreted language versus a compiled language is not that simple to distinguish. In a compiled language, you have an explicit compilation step. Whereas in an interpreted language, you don't have an explicit compilation step. What happens in Python is you have some uh, non-explicit uh, compilation. So what happens in Python is you have your Python source code. That can be something like some file, some file dot py. This is your Python source code. Now, when you actually run this, so you are using something like the C Python interpreter. When you actually call Python some file dot py. What happens is the Python interpreter, the C Python interpreter reads all the code in your file. It compiles it down. It compiles it down to a Python bytecode representation. It does that automatically. You don't have to compile it yourself. And once it does that, it starts executing it. Executing it from top to bottom. Right? In a step by step manner. Now, so this basically means that there is no distinction between the compilation phase and the runtime in Python, right? For you as a programmer, it doesn't really matter what phase you are in. You are either coding or your program is either run. You don't see that compilation phase yourself. On the other hand, for languages like C++ or languages like Java, in these, you explicitly, you explicitly compile your program. And you might have to make some changes while compiling your program. So if you see a compiler error while compiling your program, you will go back to your code and make some changes. So you can have compiled time errors and runtime errors in these languages, C++ and Java, where in Python, you only have runtime errors. There's no compiled time errors in Python. All right. Can you tell me the difference between things like C Python, Python, uh, PyPy, things like that? So what are the difference between these things? So this is a very common interview question that a lot of you will come across. And it is very important to know the distinction between these things. In fact, this is not just important for interviews. This is also important if you are doing any sort of online competitive coding. So it might have been the case that you went to interviewbit.com or you went to codechef.com 
and there while you are coding if you choose python you will see many interpreters so you will see something like python 3.5 you will see something like pypy you might also see cypher right so what are these things these are actually different python interpreters and they are also sometimes different different variations or different styles of python right so let me go over a few of these so by default when we go to something like python.org right all of you are familiar with this website that we usually go to python.org and we download python from here what we are actually downloading is the c python interpreter right now python itself is the language specification python is the language specification just like c++14 is a language specification c++14 is not a compiler the gcc compiler is a compiler right c++ is just a language specification similarly python is a language specification and the c python interpreter which we usually see at python.exe on most systems or just the python file uh, on unix system that is an interpreter that basically implements the python language specification when we usually talk about python we are talking about the c python interpreter however this is not the only interpreter that is available to us we have many other interpreters so for example things like iron python right or things like jython now these different interpreters they are written in different languages for example the iron python makes use of the dotnet framework and it allows very nice interoperability between dotnet code and python code so you can import dotnet code in your code you can you can export you can call uh, dotnet functions from your python code similarly uh, jython runs over the jvm right so over the java virtual machine or uh, jython basically allows you to call java code from within python now if uh, you understand these that might give you the hint that c python the default python interpreter this actually is implemented using c and it allows you to easily access c code so actually in python you can use c types and you can make use of c code you could write a function in c and you can call it via python however these are not the only interpreter we have several other interpreters things like pypy now this might give you the hint that hey this is pypy so this is probably python written in python itself in fact it is so pypy is python is a python interpreter that is written in python right if you all understand that hey python is a really slow language so pypy must be ridiculous people on the other hand on the contrary Py pypy is actually way faster than c python the reason is that Py pypy has something called a just in time compiler right okay? this is called a jet so what pypy does is whenever it is reading your file it will identify hot parts of your code parts that are very fast loops or parts that are being used very frequently and it will compile it down to machine code on the fly so that will cause a lot of speed up for your code now there are other versions of python things like brighton things like typescript these are not strictly different interpreters of python these are different styles of python so apart from uh, providing the core python syntax and the core python library they provide you other interpretability for example typescript is kind of a mix between python and javascript brighton is a python runtime in the browser other things like that all right cool so please please understand this very carefully that there is a difference between c python python pypy python and things like that and this is a very common interview question all right how do we write python in python itself well by writing python in python itself what we mean is that you have what does a python interpreter do what does a pypy interpreter do it takes some files right it takes your code files it basically reads them it parses them right and basically it creates an abstract syntax tree out of them and then it executes them line by line it executes them now this entire process you can you can code this entire process in any language that you want so if you code this process in the language called c uh, there is one such interpreter called the c python right if you if you code this entire process in the python language itself then you will get a python interpreter written in python all right cool so let us move on to the next questions then now let us dive into some more the nitty gritties of python uh, you might have also heard of things like python 2 and python 3 so this is a very very important question for almost all of you a lot of the times when you go to an interview uh, what what you see is that people have something like this written in their resume so they have this skill section in their resume and in this skill section they, they write python 2 and python 3 now whenever an interviewer sees this in your resume a very common question comes up uh, in the interview and the question is can you tell me the differences between python 2 and python 
and guys this is very important if you are writing if you are mentioning both python 2 and python 3 in your resume and if the interview asks you to tell the differences you better know the differences right if you do not know the differences that clearly states that you actually don't know the differences between python 2 and python 3 and then it does not make any sense to write both the versions in your resume the same goes for if you are writing things like c++ coding right in your resume uh, a very common question that comes up is, what is this coding? What does this coding mean? Can you tell me the differences between C++ 14 and C++ 17? Or can you tell me the differences, I mean, what's new in C++ 14 that is not part of C++ older versions? So it is very important for us to understand the differences between Python 2 and Python 3. Now, there have been a lot of differences between these two versions. Perhaps the most important ones were the Unicode support. Right, so Python 3, in Python 3, in Python 3, the string data type, the string type, the inbuilt string type, by default supports Unicode. Whereas in Python 2, it does not. In Python 2, you have to use something else for the Unicode support. There are many other differences. So the most common difference that you know in Python 2 versus Python 3 is, it's the print function, right? So everyone knows that in Python 2, you write print something like this. So print hello from Python 2. Whereas in Python 3, you will write print something like this. So print is now a function. Whereas in Python 2, print was a statement. This is a statement, not a function. Whereas in Python 3, this is a function. Right? So this is one of the more common differences that you will find in Python 2 and Python 3. Whenever you're trying to port code from Python 2 and Python 3, you will see this. Now, whenever you answer this in an interview, the very next question that will come to you is, if you, are, if you are coding in Python 2 and you still want to use the print as a function, can you use print as a function in Python 2? Well, we can. There is something called the futures module. So you can do from future import print function. And that will allow you to treat the print as a function in Python 2. So whenever you're dealing with legacy code in company, it will be very important for you to always have this sort of import at the top of your code so that uh, if the other person, if some other developer runs your code in Python 3 instead of Python 2, your code still works. All right. By the way, uh, let me just give you a quick link. You can actually go to this thing. So wiki.python.org slash, yes, this particular link. So I will just paste that link over here so that everyone can see it. You can always go to this link. And this has a lot more details about the differences between Python 2 and Python 3. Now that we know that we have two versions of Python, Python, Python 2 and Python 3, which Python version do you think we should use? Well, Python 2 is kind of dead. Python 2 is no longer supported. Uh, there are no more security updates coming for it. So you, we should always use, always use Python 3 when possible. So whenever you are uh, working at these large companies like Google or Amazon, a lot of their legacy code might be in Python 2. So just saying that, hey, I completely work with Python 3 and I do not know anything about Python 2 or I do not understand the differences between Python 2 and Python 3 is not going to cut it. Even though Python 2 is dying and even though you should always begin a new project in Python 3, it is still important for you to understand the differences between Python 2 and Python 3. All right. However, please always use Python 3 when possible. And if you are forced to work with Python 2, Always use the future imports whenever you can. Always use modules or libraries that allow you to interpose between Python 2 and Python 3 code so that if some other developer uh, runs your code in a different Python interpreter, the code still works. Moving on, let us dive into some more questions. Now we will be uh, going into more of code, code related questions. So first of all, is self, is self a keyword in Python? Well, turns out self is not a keyword in Python. So a lot of the times we will see code something like this. So we will have some class. So let us say class foo. And in this we will have some function. So let us say dev spam. In the spam we will have the first argument as self. And then apart from that we might have some several other arguments. Right? Now if I print this self, the self, self is a reference to the instance. But it turns out that I can rename this to anything. I can say some other variable name, other name over here as well. Right? I can totally say some other name over here as well. Also, I can do something else. So for example, I can come over here and I can say self equals to three. And this code works. 
So over here we see that self is not a keyword. How do we know that this is not a keyword? Well, whenever we have a keyword, we cannot use that keyword as an identifier. We cannot use that keyword as a variable name. For example, I can't do something like this. I cannot do something like if equals to three because if is a keyword. I cannot use that as a variable name. If I do this, I will get a syntax error saying invalid syntax. Similarly, I can't use something like none equals to three. Similarly, I can't use something like async equals to three. Right? These are all keywords. Now, if you want to get a list of all the keywords in Python, well, Python provides a very nice library for that. So there's import keyword. You can import the keyword. And from this keyword library, what you can do is you can print the keyword dot kw list. And this will give you all the keywords that are defined in Python. Now these keywords will change from version to version. For example, the async and await keywords were only recently introduced in Python. These were not available before Python 3.5. Similarly, a lot of the keywords were recently introduced in Python and uh, the, the number of keywords in Python will differ from version to version. But irrespective of what Python version you're using, you can always import the keyword library and you can print the list of keywords directly from it. Now, now that we're talking about keywords, let us quickly go over what each of these keywords are for. Okay, so what is the false keyword for? The false keyword is the inbuilt data type, which is a Boolean, right? So we can have A equals to false. Similarly, the two keyword over here, B equals to true. These both are Boolean types, the inbuilt Boolean types, all right? What about the none keyword? So the none keyword is in fact like a null or a nil value in Python. Right. So if you're coming from other uh, languages, you might have seen a null or a nil value. In Python, we use we call that the none value. And none has the type none type. Right. So I can come over here and take it as some value equals to none. So now we have false, none, and true none. What about and? So we have several keywords over here. So we have this keyword and, we see this keyword or, we see this keyword not. So we, we see these three keywords, and or and not. What are these keywords about? Well, these keywords are the conditional statements, right? So these are the Boolean logical operators. Right? So for example, you can come over here and say X equals to true or false. What is true or false? Well, if you look at the Boolean tables of the or word, then you will see that true or false is in fact true. So if I print X over here, it comes out to be true. Similarly, we have and and we have not. So if I say X equals to not or false, well, that will turn X into true value, all right? So far we have covered false, none, true, uh, we have covered and, what about as? What about as? So where do we see this as keyword? We see this as keyword typically in context managers, right? So for example, you might have seen something like, with open uh, some file name dot txt comma read as f. So what this is basically doing is it is creating this object and it is signing that object to this variable f. So this as keyword is often used in context manager. Let us look at the next keyword, assert. Assert is used to basically, is used a lot in things like unit tests. So what assert does is, assert basically tests Boolean conditions. So you can say something like assert two equals to equals to three. This is called an assertion error. Because two is not equal to three, it will raise an assertion error. You can also put an optional message over here and then the assertion error, error will come up with a message. Assert is used a lot in unit. Now we have async and await keywords. These are used with respect to coroutines in and asynchronous programming in Python. We have the break keyword. Well, break keyword is used in loops. So if you want to break out of a loop prematurely, then you can use a break keyword. Break keyword is valid both in for loops and in while loops in Python. The class keyword is to define classes, right? To define the object oriented programming uh, class in Python. The continue keyword once again is used in loops. Def is used to define a function. The del keyword is used to delete a particular variable. So currently I have x defined over here. If I say del x, now x is gone. Now if I try to print x, I will get a name error. That x is not defined. Del is used to delete a particular variable. Apart from deleting a particular variable, it can also delete values inside a variable. So I can come over here and I can say x equals to, uh, let us say a list one, two, three. And I can come over here and delete x of one. This will basically do is it will delete the value at the index one. All right. So the del keyword, as we see, is overloaded. It has multiple uses. The else if keyword and the if keyword. Once again, these are just the control flow operators of Python. The if and else. Similarly, the else thing. 
except is used for as we can understand exception handling finally is also used for exception handling we will come over finally again so in the later questions we will see what finally is for for is for looping what is for, from used for in python from is often used for importing something right so you can say import random i can import the random module or i can say from random import the run in function right this will import one particular variable from the random namespace right so from is used for that global is used to basically tell the python that the current variable that i am using so uh, is is belonging to the global namespace for example i can come over here and say a equals to 10 then i can define a function def foo and over here i can say global a now if i change this value if i change this value so i can print a i can call foo and if i print a again i will see that this particular a this particular a this global a has been changed so this is done by specifying this as a global variable over here i can if i if i remove this particular line then we will see that a was not changed it remained 10 so that is what global is used for uh we have covered if import is definitely for importing things in is used once again in for loop is keyword we will look at that later on is basically is used to do identity checking lambda functions we will cover this non local once again we will cover this in the scope part we have already covered not we have already covered or what about pass this is a very common interview question what is pass in python i mean this seems like a very simple question but it is quite often asked in interviews yes so pass is basically used as a placeholder so whenever we have some syntax in python let us suppose we have an if block so if condition right so if 10 is less than 20 right now if inside this if block i do not want to do anything then i cannot leave this blank so i can't say print okay i'm done over here if i do something like this i will get a syntax error i will get a indentation error it says that hey i i don't understand i don't understand this over here there should be something inside this if block if i don't want to do anything over here but i still want to have it be syntactically correct i can use the pass if pass is the no operation statement of python so if i just do pass over here then this thing works all right so pass is just a placeholder keyword that we use when we want to make sure that we are syntactically correct when the python syntax expects a block but we do not want to do anything right so pass is just a no operation in python okay let us see what other operators we have raise raise once again is used for exception handling return is used to return a particular value from a function try is used for exception handling while is used for looping with is used for context managers so we will take questions over the context manager things later on yield is used for generators once again we will see this in some times all right cool so that was all the keywords in python we are not going to cover all these particular concepts in detail in in details in this particular uh, session so this session is for the python interview questions we are not going to teach you python over here however whenever we come across a good interview question we will explain that in depth okay so if you want to learn any of these things more in depth you can always reach out to our interview with page and there you will find explanation or you can always reach out to me personally on linkedin and ask for help regarding any of these and i will be very glad to help you out okay let us move on what is raise raise is basically used to catch and raise exceptions for example i can come over here and i can say so i i could be doing something so suppose i write a function def divide right i am writing this function so uh, i get the numerator and i get the denominator now over here i can check if the denominator is zero then i want to raise an error i want to raise an exception because hey the denominator dividing by zero is not valid so i can come over here and i can say raise exception i can create a new exception object and i can raise hey you cannot divide by zero right so raise is used in this context otherwise i can just return num divided by denominator so if i call this function if i call divide of 10 comma 20 then this works but if i do if i try to do something like divide of 10 comma 0 an exception gets raised and my custom exception gets raised right my exception hey you cannot divide by zero that gets raised so that is what raise is used for so whenever we use raise we usually pass an exception with it but it is not necessary that you pass an exception for example i could also come over here and say try try to divide this if we find an exception if we find any exception then just re raise that exception Right, so raise can also be used without any exception. So what this does is 
whatever exception your trap block currently caught, it will just re-raise that from the context. Okay. The raise keyword is same as true in Java. However, the raise keyword is kind of overloaded. For example, as we just saw, we can use raise keyword without an exception. We could always, we could also use something like raise from, right? So we can catch this exception as E, and then we could raise a new exception from E, right? So a lot of, so raise is kind of overloaded. It has multiple syntactical uses. Apart from the normal raise exception thing that we usually see in Java, we have other variants of this raise keyword as well. Yes, we have covered all the keywords. Now let us move on to some built-in data types. So here's a very, very famous, very common interview question. What are the built-in data types that Python supports? What are the most common data types that Python supports? So if you're talking about languages like C and C++, or if you're talking about languages like Java, you have several built-in types. So you have things like arrays, you have things like integers, you have longs, you have floats, you have booleans, you have strings, you have byte, and things like that. What about Python? What built-in types does Python support? Well, yes, Python supports a large variety of types. So we have things like integers. So let me do something. Let me do come over here and let me define a list. So let me say different values. Let me define a list of different values. And over here, I will have an integer. I can have something like a float. So I can have the value of pi, for example, an approximate value of pi. I can have a true and a false over here. So these are Boolean types. I can also have a none type over here. Then I might even have a string over here. Or uh, then I might have something like a tuple. So one comma two comma three. Or I might have a list a comma two comma five. Or I could even have a dictionary. So one to one, two to four, three to nine. Or I can even have something like a set. So one, two, three. This is a set. I can have something like a range. 2 to 5. I can have things like a frozen set. So 1, 2, 3. So these are all the different values. Now let me quickly loop over each value for value in value. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to print the type of this value and I'm also going to print the value itself. So we will see what the different types of these values are. So we see that 10 is an integer. 3.141 is a float. True is a boolean. None has a type, none type. Python is a string, right? This particular thing in the code is a string. This is a tuple. This is a list. This is a dictionary. This is a set. This is a range. And this is a frozen set. All right. Apart from that, we have uh, something that is not commonly seen in other languages, a complex data type. So we can, I can do something like 1 plus 2j. And what this represents is a complex number. So 1 plus 2j is in fact a complex number. All right. So these are all the different data types that Python supports. Okay, now uh, what is frozen set? A frozen set is just a set which is immutable, which is immutable, right? So basically, if I have something like a set, so I can say set one, so I can say value one equals to set, right? Or I can say value two equals to, I can also define a set using the, using this particular notation, right? So both value one and value two are set. Now what I can come over here and do, what I can do is I can say value two dot add, some other value. So what this does is it changes. It changes this particular set. It adds something to it. Oftentimes we would like to have sets which are not changeable. So if you want a set that you cannot change, but you can still do set intersection with it, you can still find the length of that set. We want everything that behaves like a set, but you cannot change it. That is called a frozen set. If I just say frozen equals to frozen set of one, two, three, if I say this. Now I have a frozen set. Now if I try to add something to it, if I try to add something to it, I will get an attribute error which says that frozen set has no attribute called add. I cannot add to a frozen set. All right? Cool. So let us look at some more questions. So one very famous question is this. What is step eight? And why it is important? Why is it important? So first of all, what is this thing called step? Steps are actually Python enhancement, enhancement specifications, right? So Python enhancement proposal, there's a huge list of this. So I, what I can do is I can go to uh, python.org and we can also go to the step uh, 008 over there and see what this step is actually about. Triple zero eight, my bad. Right, so this is the pep8 and what pep8 is, it is a style guide for the Python code. 
So it basically tells you how your Python code should look like, what the indent issue should be, do you use tabs or spaces, what should the maximum length of line be, uh, I mean, what type of string should you use, how should you properly import things, how should you have comments, how should you uh, specify documentation strings, and all these things. So this basically tells you what beautiful, what idiomatic, properly formatted Python code is. Right, so PEP8, PEP8 is a Python, is a Python enhancement proposal that basically gives you the guidelines. So once again, these are not rules. Right? The PEP8 does not give you rules. It gives you a good set of guidelines that you should follow to make sure that your Python code looks good. It is formatted properly, right? To make sure, to make sure your code is formatted properly, right? That is what PEP8 is. Now, a lot of the organizations will follow some format of PEP8. They might not follow PEP8 strictly. For example, PEP8 says that whenever you are dealing with Python code, the Python code should not have more than 80 characters in any line. Now, this was enforced way back in the 90s when, when we were working with terminals. Terminals usually had an 80 character width. So if you had any Python line, that any code line that was more than 80 characters, then it would either scroll or it would wrap down. Right? So that is where this particular uh, guideline comes from. Now, in on modern systems, it is very common for your monitors or whatever system you're using to have support way more than 80 characters. For example, if I try to write down how many characters this particular screen can support, I will be able to fit way more than 80 characters. So limiting your code to just 80 characters width is probably not something that you should be following right now in this modern world. So a lot of the organizations will follow PEP8, but they might violate some of the conditions of PEP8 and that is basically fine because PEP8 is a set of guidelines. It is not a set of rules. However, if you want your code to be idiomatic, to be properly formatted and to be readable to other Python developers, it is strongly recommended that you follow at least some basic guidelines of PEP8. All right. And that is why PEP8 is important. Now, there are a lot of formatters like black. There are a lot of linters that basically lint PEP8 errors that will basically automatically make sure that your code is PEP8 compliant. All right. All the modern ID support PEP8 for compliance. And if you are using something that is not an ID, something like Vim or something like VS Code or something like Sublime Text, you can always add add ons that will make sure that your code is still PEP8 compliant. All right, cool. Now, uh, with PEP8, there's a common question that comes. And that question is what things, I mean, what are these things? So, what is PEP? What is, is PEP the same as PEP? What is PyPA? Right, so these are all very confusing names and it is important for you as a Python developer to understand these things. These can very well come in as an interview question. Right, so these things are different. PEP stand, it stands for Python Enhancement Proposal. Right, this is what we just saw. Right, so PEP 8 is one of the PEPs. There are many, many PEPs. All right, PEP is the default uh, packer. So this is a package installer for Python. Right, so let me quickly open up a terminal for you guys. So what we see is uh, we have, let's say that we have Python 3 over here. And currently, if I try to import this module, TLDR, I won't be able to import this module. Right? So I hope that you can see this code. So I tried to import this module, TLDR, and it says that, hey, no module named TLDR. So what I can do is using pip, using pip, I can install this particular module, TLDR. So it will basically install this module for me. Uh, if I go back to Python 3, now I can successfully import this module from my command line. Okay, this does not work. So let's let's try something else. So maybe I can try importing PQDM. So basically the pip module, so pip minus minus help. This is a Python package installer. This is a package installer for Python. All right. Cool. What about PyPI? Well, PyPI is the Python package index, right? Whatever modules or library that you can install via pip. They are available on the PyPI index. So you can go to PyPI.org and PyPI.org. So as, as you see, this is the Python package index. And this lists down all the different packages that you can install via PEP. Right? So this has thousands and thousands of packages. Uh, so if, if you, you over here, you can see this has 240,000 or different projects. And you will see all sorts of things over here. So all, all things like Flask and things like Django, all these different modules will be available on the PyPI. All right. Yes, so uh, PIP is just like NPM, so it is a package manager, and PyPI is actually the index where all these packages are stored. All right? Cool. Moving on, let us dive into some actual code of Python. All right. Now, one very common question once again is, what is the difference between tuple 
versus lift in Python. Okay, so what is uh, the difference between a tuple and a lift? So for one thing, tuples are immutable. Right? So basically, if I define a tuple, I cannot change it. For example, if I say uh, a equals to one, two, three, right? I can print the type of a. So the type of a is tuple. And if I say, if I try to change the second value of a, then it will give me an error saying that tuple object does not support item assignment. Right? Tuples are immutable. On the other hand, a list, let us say l equals to one, two, three, lists are mutable. So I can print the type of a list over here. So this is a list in fact, and I can come over here and say list of two equals to a, and this will work. So this has changed the list. So lists are mutable. So that is one of the key differences of tuples and a list. There are several other syntactical differences. For example, you must have already noticed that if I'm defining a tuple, so I define the tuple using this parenthesis syntax. So one, two, three, this is a tuple. Whereas for a list, I use the square bracket, right? For a list, I use the square bracket. So this is the syntactical difference. Or uh, there's one more important difference. For a tuple, for defining a tuple, uh, I can sometimes omit these parentheses. So I can also come over here, I can omit these parentheses, I can define the tuple as one, two, and three. Right? If I do that, then by default, so the type of T will be a tuple. Right? So omitting this syntax leads a tuple. I cannot do that with a list. If I try to define a list, one, two, three, like this, then L will in fact be your L will in fact turn out to be your type tuple. Alright? So for tuples, I can omit these uh, parentheses. Now this is very important because this allows us to very easily form tuples, combine values, and use those values. So I can, let us say I have a function over here. Uh, I can define a function foo that takes a value a and takes a value b, and it can return a, a plus b, and maybe a minus b as well. So this function returns three values. So if you were doing this in something like C++, you would have something, uh, you would have done something like who returns a type of pair of pair of int comma int with an int, right? You would have done something like this to return three values. In Python, you can do that very simply by just returning a tuple. Okay, so that is the core differences between a tuple and a list. All right. Now there's one common mistake that people uh, come up when talking about tuples. So for example, if I do something like this, so of a comma b, and I try to return a minus b, but I have a leading comma over there. Okay, let us try to see what this does. So if I call print, so if I let me say value equals to two of ten comma five, right? And if I try to print the value, or if I try to print the type of value, I will see that the type of value is a tuple. Even though I have supposedly I return an int, but the value is a tuple. That is because I have this leading comma. Right? So just by putting this comma, I have converted this into a tuple. If I want to make sure that this is an int, I better not have a leading a leading comma over here. So if I do this, now the value will be an integer. Is that clear? So be careful about that. All right. Now this is a very common question and this is a very important question. So the question goes something like this. Uh, suppose you wanted to, so if you have to print the elements of a dictionary in the order of insertion, how would you do that? Yes. So basically what we mean is let us suppose I define a dictionary. So I say D equals to some dictionary over here. Right? This is an empty dictionary. Then I can come over here and say that D of A equals to 10. I can say that D of C equals to 20. I can say that D of X equals to 30. Right? And I can also say D of B equals to 40. Now what I want to do is I want to somehow iterate over this dictionary in the order of insertion of values. So basically, what I want to do, so let's let's quickly see what happens currently. So if I do something like for key comma value in D dot items, print key comma value. So let us see what happens over here. So it prints A, C, X, and B. Hmm. It seems that it actually printed things in the order in which the elements were inserted. Right? So E was inserted first, it printed out A first. C was inserted next, it printed out C next, X was inserted next, and so on. So this seems to be the correct way of printing the elements of a particular dictionary in the order of insertion. Is this correct? Well, this is a tricky question. So let us look at some history of Python. So currently the version of Python I'm using, so I quickly do this for you guys so that you can see that I'm currently on Python 3.8.1. And in 3.8.1, yes, this is true. In Python 3.8, yes, this is true that the dicts are inherently ordered. 
However, in older versions of Python, this was not true. Okay, so basically, in Python 2, in Python 2, all the way to Python, I mean, in all the Python versions up till 3.5, in every Python version less than or equal to 3.5, right? Bits were not ordered. What does this mean? This means that if you have a dictionary and you insert keys in the order of A, in the order of A, B, C, D, E, F, right? You insert keys in some order. And if you try to loop over this list, so if you try to do something like for key in dict, right? If you do something like this, it is not guaranteed that you get the keys in the same order. You can get these keys in any order or in any particular order. And that particular order is basically determined by the hash value of these keys, right? So depending on what the value of hash of A is, you will get the keys in the hash order and not the actual insertion order. Right? That was true for a lot of Python versions. Now, this was a common pain point for a lot of Python developers. A lot of the novice Python developers, they assumed that whenever you iterate over a particular dictionary, you will get the values in the same order of insertion, which was not true. Which is why in some particular, in some Python, in some Python versions, what the dev said was, let us randomize. Let us randomize the order, right? So for example, in several versions of Python, when you try to loop over a dictionary, you will get the same value again and again. You will get the same order of keys again and again. That order will be different from the order of insertion. However, that order will not change. Okay. So if your order of insertion was this, let us say that this was your order of insertion. It could be the case that when you iterate over the dictionary, you get this in this order. You get this in this order. But no matter how many times you iterate over the dictionary, you will always get this in the same order. You will always get this in this order. This was true when Python was using the hash value of the key right, to determine how to iterate over this. Now, in some versions of Python, what the developer said was, the developer said that, hey, people are trying to abuse this, right? People are misusing this particular feature. So let us randomize the order so that people will see that whenever you try to iterate over the dictionary, it comes out in random order, right? So that people are discouraged from using this property, okay? In some Python version, the, the order might be even random. Now, from Python, 3.6. So what happened? Let, let's talk about Python 3.6 for now. In Python 3.6, what happened was the dictionary was still unordered in Python, right? For the Python specification. In the Python specification, there was no change. Right? The dictionary was strict, still unordered. However, in the C Python interpreter, right? In the C Python interpreter, the dictionaries were ordered ordered in the order of insertion, all right? This was just an implementation detail. This was just the fact that CPython was doing it this way. If, if you go to Python 3.6, and if you try to do the same in PyPy, you might not get the same result. In CPython 3.6, this was just an implementation detail. However, from Python 3.7 onwards, dictionaries are always ordered, right? And this is now a part of the Python specification. So basically, no matter what interpreter you're using, as long as that interpreter is talking about Python 3.7 onwards, it is guaranteed that a dictionary is ordered in the order of insertion. All right. Now, this is a very common interview question because whenever you're working in an industry, this bites a lot of people a lot of the time. For example, let us suppose that you are developing some code, right? So you are at Google and you are developing some particular piece of code that you intend to run in Python 3.8, right? Now you intend to run this code in Python 3.8 and you understand that in Python 3.8, the dictionaries are always ordered. So you use this fact, right? You use the fact that dictionaries are ordered. However, one of your colleagues tries to execute your code and that colleague has Python 3.5. That colleague of yours has Python 3.5 installed on your system on his system, right, on his or system. So what will happen to that particular person? Your code, which worked in Python 3.8, might break on the system because they were using Python 3.5 and in Python 3.5, bits are not ordered, okay? So even though this is true, even though you know that in Python 3.7 onwards, the dictionary is always ordered, please make sure that you never rely on that, okay? And in fact, if you still want your dictionaries to be ordered, you can use something like the order dict. So order dict is available in Python. Order dicts are guaranteed, are always guaranteed to basically possess the insertion order. 
all right and this is true irrespective of the python version that you use so if you want to rely on this property of this then please use audit this do not assume that the person will be using python 3.7 or a higher interpreter it could always be the case that you are because you are not coding alone you are writing some code for a large organization and you cannot guarantee what the other person is using right what interpreter the other person is using all right and this is a very common interview question okay let us see if we have any questions so far and then we will continue uh all right okay uh siddharth says uh, i am confused with c python pypy etc can you please take two more minutes uh, on it sure so once again c python so let me quickly uh, tell you the thing so c python so python is the language specification right what the python language specification tells you is it tells you things about things like syntax it tells you things like semantics it tells you things like what the library function should do right what the libraries are available what the library functions do and so on and so forth now this python specification this is just some text right this is just some rules and some guidelines that you have laid down by itself python cannot do anything right python is just a book python is just a piece of guidelines that is laid down that hey this is python it is just a concept okay so python is a language now if you want to enforce that language or if you want to be able to do something with that language you have to implement that language right basically you have to implement some sort of a compiler for that language or maybe you have to implement some sort of an interpreter for that language right so for example let us say that we are talking about c++ so c++ once again is a language specification now if you want to implement this language you can have a compiler a compiler like gcc that compiles c++ code all right similarly in python we have several interpreters because python is not a compiled language python is an interpreted language in python we have several interpreters for python right now the most common interpreter the default interpreter that you get for python is called c python so whenever you go to python.org and you download python from there or whenever you are on say ubuntu and you have the default python installed in your system on ubuntu or mac or even on uh, windows that is the c python version so this is the c python interpreter now c python is not the only interpreter there are many more interpreters of python namely things like jython iron python pypy right brighton stackless python and many more okay so there are many many interpreters of python now where these interpreters differ is though so all of these interpreters they at least follow the python specification so these interpreters at least follow the python language specification where the differ is what additional things they provide so for example in c python c python allows you to allows you to import and run c libraries and code right from python on the other hand jython this allows you to use java iron python allows you to use dot net code right pypy pypy has a just in time compiler right so it runs very fast brighton allows you to run python in the browser right stackless python and so on and so forth they have other such features is that clear now cool so one more uh, common question that we have over here is what is wrong so what is wrong with import asterisk right so all of you know how to import all the things so you you see import asterisk in java as well so for example what i can do over here i can say from random import asterisk right so this is a way i can import things this is a way i can import stuff from module the question is what is wrong with this why is this bad well if you import everything from a particular uh, from a particular module what that does is it pollutes it pollutes your namespace right for example let us say that i have my function over here so let us say that i have my function randint over here and what this randint is supposed to do is it is supposed to let's say return the value 4 and you can say chosen via a dice roll right so let us say that we have this randint function if i import everything from random what will happen is if i if i call this randint function now if i call this randint function now uh, i will see that i am getting a type error this is weird right my randint function is not supposed to accept any parameters 
my Ryan function is not supposed to accept any parameters, but I still can't call it. The reason why I can't call it is when I inputted everything from this random module, turns out that this random module also had a function called randint. And when I imported it, it basically overwrote this particular function, right? So this the random inside the random module, it overwrote my function. So this is a common thing that we see. So whenever you're talking about code, it could be the case that you have multiple variables or multiple functions that have the same name, right? But do different things. So how do you differentiate between these two things? You differentiate between these different variables and different functions using something like something called namespaces. So basically what we say is we say random dot random is different from some other module, some other module dot random, right? Both the functions have the same name random, but since they live in different namespaces, I can still treat them differently. Python understands that they are different. If I import everything from a particular module, first of all, this pollutes your namespace. Right? So now whatever if you have overlapping names in your namespace, they will all get overwritten. That's the first thing. The second thing is it becomes difficult, difficult to understand where a function is coming from, right? where a function is coming from. So let us suppose, let us suppose I do something like this. So suppose I have some code, I have some uh, values equals to 1, 3, 1, 4, 3, 2, uh, 5. Uh, let me do something like this, right? And I have import random. Right? And I can do print random dot choice values, right? And what this will do is it will select one value at random from this list and it will give it to me. Now contrast this code, contrast this code from this code. Random import asterisk values equals to one, four, three, two, five. Print choice uh, values, right? Now these two pieces of code, they do exactly the same thing. They take one random value from this list and they print it out. However, if my code is very large, right, if I have a lot of things over here, then to someone who is reading my code, they might not be able to understand very quickly where this function comes from, right? They might try to look for this choice function in this code. So currently it is still understandable that, hey, I don't have choice defined over here. So it must be coming from a random module. But what if I have other modules? Well? So let us say from request, so what if I say something like this, right? Now, how do I know where this choice model method comes? It could come from random. It could also come from request. So this code very quickly becomes unreadable, right? So it becomes difficult to identify where these values are coming from, where these functions are coming from, which is why this import asterisk syntax, it is frowned upon. It is bad syntax, okay? It is always better that you do not import everything from a module. You just import the name specifically, and then you can refer to things by using the dot operator. So you can do random dot choice. All right. Okay. Cool. Let us quickly take a couple more questions and then we can end the session. All right. So here's one common question. So the question is, what is the difference difference between something like a list comprehension and a tuple comprehension? Right. So before we are able to answer this question, we should first know what a list comprehension, what a dictionary comprehension, and maybe what a tuple comprehension is. So basically what a list comprehension is. So let us say that I have the list of squares, right? So what I can do is I want to store the squares of first 10 natural numbers in this list or the first 10 whole numbers in this list. So what I can do is I can say for I in range 10 and I can say squares dot append I into I, right? And then if I print squares, this is what I will get. I will get all the squares of all the whole numbers from 0 to 9, okay? This is a very common pattern, right? A lot of the times, what we see is we define an empty list and we add elements to that empty list, right? We keep on appending elements to that list. Now, Python provides a different syntax for this called a list comprehension. Comprehension, right? What a list comprehension allows you to do is it allows you to write the same code in a different manner. So now you can come over here and say, you can say squares, equals to i times i for i in range 10, right? So this is what a list comprehension looks like. And at the end, you get the same result, right? You get the same result. Now, it is important to understand what the syntax of this list comprehension is. So whatever you have over here, that will be appended to the list, okay? Uh, this for loop looks very similar to this for loop. Apart from that, we can have several other things. So I can maybe 
have the squares of only odd numbers, right? So I can say if, if i mod 2 equals to equals to 1, this will give me the square of only odd numbers. I can also come over here and I can nest the loop. So for I can say for j in range 10, so this will give me repetition. This will give me every previous value. It will be repeated 10 times, right? So these are list comprehensions. You can go and uh, read more about list comprehensions and dict comprehensions on your own. Now, just like these list comprehensions, we have things called dictionary comprehension. So I can come over here and I can say square equals to, so I can, let me say, let me say cubes this time. I can say cubes equals to the key to a particular value, i to the power three for i in range 10, right? So if I do this, if I do this, and if I print out the value of cubes now, I will see that this is a dictionary which holds the key and the corresponding value. So I see over here that the cube of two is eight, the cube of six is 216 and so on, right? Similarly, so this is a list comprehension. This is a dictionary comprehension, comprehension. Similarly, we have something called a tuple comprehension. Now tuple comprehension behaves a little differently. For example, let us say that I come over here and I say the whole number, whole number. So I say something like this. So I say I for I in range 10. So what I'm expecting over here is I'm expecting, what I really expect to see is I expect to see this thing, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way till 9. So this is what I expect to see in the output. But let us see what we actually get. We get back a generated object. This is, this is really surprising. So in fact, this is not double comprehension. This is a generator expression, right? This is a, the correct terminology for a tuple comprehension is actually a generated expression, all right? Now, this, these generated expressions, they come handy in a lot of different scenarios. Basically, what this generated expression does is, it generates these values one by one. So let me quickly show you an example of that. So let us suppose that I have a large list, right? Large list. Let us say I have all the numbers for i for i in range in one e7. So I'm going to create a list of all the numbers from zero till 10 to the power seven minus one, right? So let us see how much time this takes. So I'm going to execute this now. So I just executed this and let us see how much time this takes. So this took fraction of a second. So let me try to increase this value. So now I am now I'm generating 10 to the power eight different values. So that is one crore different values. And we see that this is taking a considerable amount of time. It is taking a large amount of time to generate this list because it is actually going on. It is going to the memory. It is creating all these objects in the memory. It is actually going to create this list. So if I do length of large list, large list, I see that this list is actually this long. On the other hand, what I can do is I can say a generator list. I can say generator list equals to i for i in range. And it doesn't really matter how large a value I have over here. I can even have 10 to the power 20 elements over here. And when I execute this, it returns back immediately. Right? It returns back immediately because in fact, it did not create a list. It did not create the entire list in memory. It just said that, okay, you want this list? Let me generate this list whenever you need it. So this is basically what is called a lazy computation, lazy computation. So whenever we are using this generator expression, what this gives us back is a generator object. Right? They give us back a generator object. So what I can do from here is I can say, I can say next of generator, generator list. If I do this, I will get the next value in that generator list. So I can keep calling next again and again. I will, I will keep getting the next value in this list, all right? So similarly, I can do maybe the squares of values. So now if I do, I will keep getting the next value. So I get one, then I'll get four, then I'll get nine, then I'll get 16 and so on. The entire list is not created on the fly. So for example, I can't do something like this. I can't do the length of generator list because this list is not created in the memory. If I try to call the length of this, what it will actually do is it will try to create that list. So this is taking time, right? Creating that generator list did not take time. Taking the length of this is taking time because it is actually going to try to create that entire list. And finally, it tells me that, hey, the generator object does not support this length operation. All right. So that is the difference between a tuple comprehension and a list comprehension. There is basically nothing like a tuple comprehension. It is actually a generator expression. Right? So let me correct this. This is actually a generator expression. Now, generator expressions come a lot of the time very handy. For example, let us suppose that I want to add all the values from one to 100, right? So how do you propose I do that? I can do something like this. I can say that, okay, uh, total equals to zero. Then I can say for I in range 100, and I can say total plus equals to I, and then I can print I, print total, right? This is one way 
to add all the values from 0 to 100. On the other hand, what I can also do is I can do something like this sum of i for i in range 100. Now, basically, over here, I used a list comprehension. Right? I created this list and I used this list comprehension. However, when I'm creating this list, can you discuss the memory requirements of both these pieces of code? The memory requirement of this piece of code is just order of one. Right? This takes a constant amount of memory because I have only have a couple of variables at any time. I have total and I have i. On the other hand, for this piece of code, I am actually creating this entire list first in the memory and then I am calling the sum over this. So the memory requirements of this are very large. On the other hand, if I use a generated expression, if I use a generated expression, then the memory requirements of these become the same as the previous code. Now we see over here that this code actually did not run uh, because the, the reason it did not run was because I missed a parenthesis over there. So now this code, this will uh, use a generated expression and it will actually not create the entire list in memory. Now the cool thing about this is that you can omit these braces. So what I can do is, so notice that if I had a list comprehension, I would have this thing over here, right? Or uh, similarly, if I want to have a generated expression, I should ideally, instead of this uh, square bracket, I should have the round bracket, right? But turns out I can actually omit these. I can actually omit these completely and I can still do it. So this thing still gives me the same answer. For generated expressions, I can omit the brackets as long as I'm calling them inside a function, all right? I guess let us take uh, just one more question. So one very common question that we see in Python is, so the question goes something like this, that what sort of garbage collector, garbage collector does Python use? Or basically explain, explain how the Python GC works. Or in fact, this, this can come in several other ways. So a lot of, once I was asked in a particular interview, I was asked this question that, hey, you are noticing something. Right, so you notice this, that you are running your Python code and you are you're monitoring how that Python code is running. So suppose that your Python code is printing some values and you see that it, it continuously prints some values. However, after some time, it suddenly pauses, right? The printing of the value suddenly pauses and then after some time, it resumes again. So it could be the case that you are doing something like this. So you have some particular piece of code. So you have some values over here. You have a dictionary over here. You have a loop for i in range, let's say 10,000. And you are doing something over here and you're printing some value over here as well. So what you are seeing is one gets printed, two gets printed, three gets printed, and it is running smoothly. However, at some particular value, at some, let's say 1490, some, some particular value, there's a pause. There's a sudden pause. After that sudden pause, it pauses for a couple of seconds and then it continues. So it continues with 1491 and then it runs smoothly again, smoothly again. So this was running smoothly. There was a sudden pause, then it was running smoothly again. Then again, after some values, there was again a pause and then it starts running smoothly again. So what is what is going on over here? It, it could be the case that this does not work for your use case. Right? So suppose that you are using some sort of, a, you are working on some sort of a producer consumer problem. Right? Now what happens if your process, so suppose you are a consumer, right? you are working in a consumer process and your consumer suddenly pauses. What can happen in that case? So well, what can happen is your queue can overflow, right? If suddenly all the producers keep producing, but all the consumers suddenly pause, then your queue can overflow, right? So you do not want this to happen. So what can you do over here? Right? So this, this is basically caused by the garbage collector of Python. So this is a very common way in which this question is posed. So let us quickly talk about the garbage collector of Python. So first of all, what does garbage collection mean? So in a lot of languages like C++ or C or C++, we have manual memory management. What this means is, that either you have a variable like int array of size 10 that the compiler knows whenever your code is being compiled, the compiler knows that, hey, you're talking about an array of size 10 and it will allocate some memory for it on the stack. On the other hand, if you do something like this, int, if you declare a pointer of AR and then you say AR equals to malloc, right? You allocate some memory using the malloc command. If you do something like this, what C++ will do is it will allocate the space on the heap. Now, once it has allocated the space on the heap, C++ is not going to free that memory, not going to free that memory automatically. You have to do it manually. You have to free the memory manually. Now, of course you can do that, but this has a lot of tricky business. So for example, what if you forget to free the memory? What happens then? Well, this is called a memory leak. And a lot of the times, if you notice that you have a very simple program 
or if you're coding in C++, for example, you have a very simple program, but the memory usage of that program keeps on getting larger and larger, even though it is, it should not be using so much memory, but it seems that the memory requirement is continuously growing up. Then that suggests that you have a, some sort of a memory leak. Uh, there are other cases as well. What if you free the memory, but you then try to use it? That can totally happen, right? So for example, consider a situation like this. I, I declared an array, right? I declared an array and I said, let me allocate some memory. Let me allocate some memory into this. So I call this function func with AR. And then I decide to free this memory location AR. Let us say that I'm doing something like this in C++. What can happen is, I am thinking that, hey, after this point, I won't need the AR so I can free it. However, it could happen that function, this particular function, pass this memory location to some other process. Right, or some other thing, some other particular piece of code that will try to use this AR, this memory location after I have freed it. So if I do something like this, I can get, I can run into all sorts of weird segmentation faults, right? Or because I'm trying to basically free a memory location that does not exist, that I do not own. Manual memory management runs into all these sort of weird problems. Now, for this reason, several languages that try to be more programmer friendly, I mean, I cannot say that Manual memory management is bad and automatic memory management is good, nothing like that. But manual memory management is tedious. Automatic memory management is a little easier for us. For beginner programmers, automatic memory management is a little easier. So languages like Python, languages like Java, languages like JavaScript, right? languages like Ruby, all these provide something called a garbage collector. All these provide something called a garbage collector. And what this garbage collector does is it handles, it handles the task of freeing memory, freeing memory for you. So you, you can only allocate memory. So in Python, you can say L equals to, let's say list of range of 100. So over here, when you do this, some space is allocated in your memory. However, you cannot free it. So one more question that frequently comes up is, if, if I call del of L, if I do del of L, am I not freeing the memory up? Well, in fact, this does not free the memory, right? What del of L just does is it says that delete, basically unbind the local variable L. Right? This is all it is doing. It is saying that there was a variable X, there was a variable L that was pointing to some location in memory. Just remove that variable. That memory is still allocated. That memory has not been free. Just unbind that particular variable. That variable does not exist anymore. That memory is still being allocated. All right. So del of L does not actually free the memory. Well, if del of L does not freeze the memory, then don't we have a memory leak? Well, yes, we do have a memory leak, but we don't have a memory leak because the garbage collector will handle it for us. Now, let us quickly see how the garbage collector works. So let me, let me take an example. Let me say that I have some variable over here. So I have x equals to 10. Okay, I have x equals to 10. Now, let me import the sys module. Right? So in this sys module, we have a function called get ref count. So what I can do is I can use this function and I can say sys dot get ref count of x. What this will say is, this will basically tell me how many different variables in my Python code are referencing this same particular memory location. So let us quickly break down and see what is happening over here. So when I do x equals to 10, what actually happens is, what Python says is, let me take this value 10 and let me put it in some memory address. After that, let me create a variable called x. So I have a memory address, let's say 1024. And in this 1024, I put the value 10. Right, this is what I have done. When I say x equals to 10, what happens is x is now pointing to this location 1024. Okay, this is what happens when I say x equals to 10. Now, what else could be that there is another variable, let's say y, which is also pointing to 1024. There is another variable z, which is also pointing to 1024. This get rest count will tell you, this will tell you all the different variables, this will tell you the number of different variable names. Right, this will tell you the number of different variables that are pointing to this memory location. So if I look at how many variables are pointing to the memory location in which the value 10 is stored, I get back that, hey, 161 different variables are pointing to that. Now, I mean, I just declared 10, right? So how can 161 different variables be pointing to that? Well, it turns out that Python does some caching. For some smaller int, Python does some caching. On the other hand, if I do something like this, if I have a large random number, and now if I try to get the count, I see that the count is just two. So if I do something like, or something else over here as well, so hello from Python, Right. If I do this, I see that the count, once again, is just 2. Why is the count 2? Well, for one thing, I'm using this x over here. And for other thing, I'm passing this x in the function as well. Right. So there are two particular references to x. 
first reference is this particular local variable x the second reference is in inside this function inside this function where it is accepting a particular parameter x that will also be pointing to the same memory location which is why i see that the reference count of this is 2 okay so what python basically does is for every object it keeps a count of how many variables are pointing to it pointing to it okay so basically what i am going to do is i am saying that okay since the get reference count x let me do one more thing let me say y equals to x now when i do that i see that the ref count of x has increased so ref count is now 3 because there are three variables x pointing to it y pointing to it and the local variable and the parameter of get ref count is also pointing to it. now if i delete y let us suppose i delete y and once again i get the ref count of x now what will happen the ref count of x will drop to 2 again because now the one count has decreased for the value y y is no longer pointing to it. so basically what python garbage collector will do is it is a ref counting it is a ref simple ref counting garbage collector so what it will do is whenever the count of any particular memory location whenever the count drops to zero that means that there are no variables referencing to it if there are no variable referencing to it that means that nobody is using it and if nobody is using it then i can free that memory up does that make sense so what the gc basically does is it keeps track of how many variables are referencing a memory location and whenever the count drops to zero it frees up that memory location right this is what the garbage collection does so this is the basic garbage collector of python however that is not the complete story so let us look at an example so let us suppose that i have something like this so say that i have a list l and in this list i have a value 1 2 and 3 so what i can also do is in this list itself so let me let me basically print versus dot uh, get ref count of l Okay, so let us see what we what we see over here. We see that there are two uh, values referencing this. Okay. Now, if I say l dot append l itself, so what this does is in the list itself, in the list itself, it is appending the same list. Okay. Now the reference count of this particular list has increased to three. But let us ask ourselves this: even if we delete the variable l over here, even if we delete the variable l over here, will the ref count drop to zero? No, it will not. Why? Because the list itself has a reference to itself right the rest the list itself contains a reference to the same memory location so the reference count of this particular list can never drop to zero right if it can never drop to zero then the garbage collector will never be able to collect it and that will cause a memory leak which is why almost all the garbage collectors do something else as well they basically after every some while so after every short amount of time right some time they will go over all the particular variables and they will see which variables are reachable they will see which variables are reachable so think of this like a graph you have several variables you have several uh, variables that are pointing to some memory locations all these all these memory locations are therefore reachable now if these memory locations if the values stored in this memory locations are also pointing to some other memory locations other memory locations then those other memory locations are also reachable however it could be the case that there is some memory location m which is pointing to memory location n and this n is also pointing to n there is nothing outside of this particular loop if there is nothing outside of this particular loop that is pointing to any of these memory locations then these memory locations form a connected component right they form a connected component in the memory graph nothing from the outside is referencing them however they can't be garbage collected directly the what the garbage collector does is it periodically runs certain cycle or certain loop to check if there are any such self referential memory locations and it will free all those self referential memory locations that are otherwise unreachable all right and this periodic check is actually what causes this periodic slowdown right so we saw over here that this code was running smoothly and after some time there was a sudden pause then it was running smoothly then after some time it was a sudden pause so these sudden pauses are caused usually by this garbage collector by this cyclic checking of this garbage collector okay now python garbage collector has several other things so python garbage collector is a generational garbage collector what this basically means is it basically has three different has three different queues or three different generations in which different memory addresses can fall you can read more about the generational garbage collector this is just an optimization that different garbage collectors do to make sure that they are not trying to check the same memory location again and again okay you can go and read more about this but this is a very common question once again in, in interviews that how does the garbage collector work or why do you suddenly have pauses in your python program and this is the basic answer all right
If you want to learn more about the garbage collection of Python, you can always look up resources. You can always go back to our the interview bit website as well, and you will be able to find more examples over there. All right. Thank you, guys. In this particular video, we'll be talking about how we can connect various platforms with Python to fetch the data. Also, we'll be talking about various basic operations in Pandas, like adding a new column, how we can rename a column, and various other operations. Before we start this video, don't forget to subscribe to our Scalers YouTube channel. Let's understand how to get data from a CSV file into Pandas data frame. So first of all, what we will do, we will import the library pandas as pd and if you want more details regarding the basic of pandas we have already created a video on this so you can refer to that video now what we have to do we have to read the csp file and the function read underscore csp takes input as the location of the file as you guys can see, uh, I have placed my CSV file, which is titanic.csv, in the same folder in which I am running my Jupyter Notebook. Now, if you have the CSV file in the same folder where your Jupyter Notebook is running, you don't need to uh, you don't need to provide the exact path. All you have to do is just write the name of the file with the extension that is titanic.csv and you are done. Okay, so that is not df.read underscore csp, that is pd.read underscore csp because pd is the library pandas. So here you can see that we have the data. We will preserve this data in the variable df which is data frame and now we can check the head. But what if this particular file is not available in the same folder. So let me just quickly do one thing. I'll go to the same folder where I'm having my Titanic file and then I will copy it somewhere else also. So uh, over here in the folder scalar, I'm having this file, I'll copy this. And now I'll go to desktop and I'll paste it over here. Over here, I'm having the Titanic file. Now, how we can read this file into Pandas data frame? First of all, we need the location of this file. So I'll go to properties and here you have the location. I'll copy this and I'll close this. And now we write pd dot read underscore CSV and we will paste this location. Together with this location, we also have to provide the file name with the extension. So titanic.csv. Now if I try to run this, I'll get error. Now this error is because of a very simple problem. The problem is actually this is not the problem. This is one of the functionality of pandas or maybe Python. In Python, if I say print Sumit slash n shukla you will find out that due to this slash n the characters or maybe the string that is after this slash n is getting printed in the next line so this is basically the new line character and that is what is happening over here this slash character is considered as an spatial character in python so due to this, in this particular string where we have defined the path of the file, this slash character is not getting considered as separator, but as a spatial character. So what we have to do, we have to make this string as raw string. If I want to make a particular string as raw string, I only have to put this R in front of the string. So once you put this R in front of a particular string, this string is now considered as a raw string and all these spatial characters or maybe the spatial uh, operators that you have in this string, which act differently, are now getting considered as characters only. And that is what we are going to do over here. 
I'll just put R and we are done. Another thing that you can do is you can make this slash as double slash. So I can make, I can add one more slash and this will be finally done over here. Now, what if I have to read the data from any other external source? Please remember your pandas read underscore CSV command takes input from your local system. Also, it can load the file from online repository also. So there is a online repository known as data.word and here you will find out that you have so uh, the platform looks something like this. Basically, it is a online repository which comes with a huge repository of open source data. But there is one uh, limitation that is you have to create your account. And once you have the account, then you can simply copy the link and paste it over here and use this data, whatsoever data you wanted to use from this platform into this local system or maybe your local Python notebook. So I'll go to sign in and I quickly create one new account. Sign in with Google and let's say Sumit Shukla. I'll continue and now we are ready. I'll search for the Titanic data. And here we have the Titanic data. Uh, this is not the best one. So Titanic, I'll search for the one which is having the original Titanic data. Uh, this one looks nice. I'll click on download. I'll click on share URL. And here you will find out the URL that you can simply copy paste it over here and you are done. So here what is happening, my data is getting downloaded from this particular link, which is the online repository where we have kept the data and df.head we have the data. Now let's try to understand how we can perform filter operation on a data frame. If I wanted to filter the data, the very first thing that we have to understand is how to first of all index a column. So as we have learned that if I have to index a column, I can say df a square bracket and the name of the column. Let's say I'm using the column sex. So here I'm having the values male and female. Now, if I say a is equal to 12 and if I say A is equal to equal to 12 I'll get the boolean output true similarly if I here say A is equal to equal to male then I'll be able to get a boolean series wherever I'm having male I'll get a true while wherever I'm having female I'll get a false now I'll use this boolean series to filter my complete table or my complete data frame. So if you guys carefully observe, here I'm having, so this is my condition, which will return me Boolean series, which is true false. And here we are using this Boolean series to index my data frame df. If I execute this, you can see that we only have those rows where I'm having the sex as male. Similarly, if I have to apply multiple filters, now I'll quickly go to my uh, presentation and I'll try to explain the normal formula or maybe the normal code structure. So let's say I'm having this kind of data frame where I'm having let's say passenger ID followed by sex and followed by the column, let's say fair. 
this is my data that I'm having right now. Now this data frame is having values like male, female, male, female, where is like 10, 12, 15, 5. Now if I have to filter on one condition, it will be data frame, a square bracket, condition. This is the general code block to write one filter, one filter. But if I have multiple filters or multiple conditions, multi-condition, then it will look something like this. DF, square bracket, round bracket, condition one, and round bracket, condition two, and round bracket, condition three, and so on, and close the bracket. So if I have to declare and, we use one time ampersand for or we use the pipe operator. Uh, let's say I have to filter my this data frame df on mail. So I'll just simply say df square bracket the condition df sex is equal to equal to m. This is my condition. Now here in this particular code, these round brackets are optional. Even if I don't use them, that's not a problem. But for writing a filter with multiple conditions, square brackets are very compulsory. DF square bracket, condition one is, let's say I have to find out all females. So sex is equal to F. And here I need to use is equal to is equal to is equal to F round bracket close and second condition is DF fair is let's say greater than 10. So here if you closely observe, I'll just use a different color these round brackets are compulsory that's one of the thing and this is my condition one this is my condition number two and we have these outer brackets that is for indexing my data frame df so that is how we filter a particular data frame on multiple conditions. Let's quickly go back to our Jupyter notebook and let's see one demonstration. So let's say I want all the females with the fare greater than let's say uh, $50. So DF round brackets DF sex is equal to female and df fair is greater than 50. Let's execute this. And here you can see we have the data. What if I want the count? I'll just simply say shape and you will get the number of rows and columns. And if you want the count, you have to first of all index one additional column. So let's say I index passenger ID. And now I'll say dot count. And here we are done. We have 87 such passengers. Now let's try to understand how to add or delete a particular column in the given data frame. So let's say I wanted to add a new column in such a way that wherever I'm having embarked, or let's take an easy example first of all. So I wanted to create a new column, let's say double price. This is my, the name of my new column, which is equal to the current fare multiplied by two. That's how easy it is. We have the value this particular operation, which is df fair into two, 
will generate a series with new values. Over here you can see. Now we wanted to preserve the series in a new column which is named as double fair. And if I execute it, if I go back and check df.head, here we have the double fair. But what if I have a condition? What if I wanted to apply a condition and based on the condition I wanted to generate a new column? Now the method is to first of all create a function. Let's create a function that can take the input which is the embarked, the category of embarked and then based on the category it assigns a number. So let's first of all check how many categories are there in embarked. So df embarked dot value underscore counts. Here we have three categories S, C, Q. Now if I want to write a function, I'll say def, the function name is M, E, M. It will take X as the input and I'll write the condition if X is equal to S then I want this function to return let's say um, let's say 1 lf x is is equal to c then I want this function to return 2 else I want this function to return uh, let's say 1 or 0 or maybe 3 but there is one problem uh, we have to make sure that the embarked column is not having any missings so let's quickly check that and I believe that embarked column is having missing embark dot is na dot sum and where we here we have two missings so in order to make sure that for missings also we are not getting three let's write one additional lf statement so lf x is equal to equal to a then write sorry it's q not a q then return i want three else i want zero now i wanted to apply this function to the column embarked so i'll take the column embarked and i'll say dot apply so if we wanted to apply a function the the particular method is apply and then the function name am and now here you can see we are getting one two three we wanted to preserve this in a new column so df let's say em b em binary or em category and here we have the output so let's check the data frame df.head and now i should get the new column emc which is over here but if you wanted to use a lambda function that is also great if you do not want it to use the def functionality so how we can use that df embarked dot apply and the, the way we write lambda function is lambda input x I need the output uh, I need the output 1 if x is equal to equal to s then else I'll initiate another if block I need 2 if x is equal to equal to c else I'll initiate another if block I need 3 if x is equal to equal to q else I need 0 let's run it again we are getting the same output let's preserve it maybe we have already preserved it so no need to preserve it again but I hope you guys are able to understand how to create a new column based on condition using defined function and using lambda function. Now let's come to the third point 
where we have to understand how to delete a column. If you wanted to delete a column, we may use the functionality known as drop and the function drop can help you to drop both rows and columns. So let's quickly understand df dot drop. Now the drop function takes the input as index, which is the row number columns, which is the column name. And you can also use it with access. Let's see all the ways. First of all, we will try to delete a particular row. So I'll say df dot drop index is equal to three. So I'm saying drop the third row. Here you can see I'm having zero, I'm having one, but I don't have three. But remember one thing, this particular drop functionality will return you a new data frame with the particular operation applied. So if I go back and check my data frame DF again, it will not be having the same operation. This operation has not been permanently applied to a, to a particular data frame. So how to make sure that this is permanently applied? All you have to do is write in place is equal to true. And now if I check df.head, you will find out that the third row has been permanently dropped. Please make sure that these operations are irreversible. So once you have applied it, you will not be able to get your original data back. So make sure when you're using in place, you're using it when you are 100% sure about it. Now how to drop a column? df drop instead of writing index now i will write columns and now i'll mention the name of the column let's say i want to drop this double price column so double underscore price so you will find out that the column double price has been dropped but again this is not a permanent operation so in place is equal to true and we are done. There is one more way which in which you can use drop. If I say df dot drop one. Now what is the meaning of this one? Is it a row or is it a column? In order to make sure that pandas is able to understand that this particular input is a row index, I have to define the axis. So I'll go to markdown and I'll just write down uh, a note for you guys axis is equal to one means we are referring to columns and axis is equal to zero means we are referring to rows. So here I'll say that this is axis is equal to zero. So I'm saying to my pandas function drop that drop row number one and how pandas will be able to understand that this one is referring to row number one because I have written axis is equal to zero which means row. Here you can see that I do not have row number one. Similarly, if I wanted to drop a column, df dot drop, I write the name of a particular column, let's say uh, em underscore or hyphen c, and then I'll say axis is equal to one, because one means I'm interested in dropping a column. And here you can see that I do not have that particular column. I hope you guys are able to understand some basic operation with pandas library. And here we are going to take example of MySQL database. But if you understand this process, you will be able to connect any kind of database with Python. Here we'll be first of all connecting the SQL database, which is MySQL database with Python. And then we will be loading the content of a table into pandas data frame. So let's understand how we can do this. First of all, we need a particular library known as PyMySQL. PyMySQL. So let's install it. And the way we can install it using Jupyter Notebook is you have to put exclamatory mark, then write pip install and py my SQL. Now you have to execute it and this will take around one minute of your time and it is done. So based on your system configuration and your internet speed, 
it will accordingly take time but for me it has been done now now let's proceed with connecting a sql database with python so here i have a open source server now this server is running on this particular host name where the port is this and the credentials are guest which is by username and password is relational so let's try to establish the connection uh, my connection which is the connection variable by my sql dot connect i have to input the parameter which is host and my host name is relational dot fit dot cvut dot cz followed by the username so user now here my user is guest followed by the password and my password is relational password is relational now we have to mention the name of the database with which you wanted to work this particular open source mysql server is having a variety of database available for your practice and uh, out of all the database that is available to us we are going to only uh, we are going to only work with this database which is named as employee so let's mention the name of the database which is db is equal to employee and let's now execute this so here is there is some problem with oh we haven't imported by my sql so we have just installed it so let's import by my sql and let's now run this now you can see that we are able to successfully create the connection with the mysql database which is this particular database and now we wanted to write a query that can work on this particular database so the way we do this is by creating a cursor now a cursor is nothing but a object that will help you to perform variety of operations or maybe it is the interaction between your sql query or maybe your requirement and it will transfer your requirement to the sql database with which you are working so c dot cursor sorry c o n n connection dot cursor and this is the cursor that we have created now using this cursor i will pass my sql query so i want to first of all look into variety of tables that this particular database is having so i'll say c dot execute and i wanted to execute show tables this particular query if i execute this you will find out that this is returning me uh, the output as 6 now what is the meaning of this 6 please remember that whenever you execute a query your output will be preserved in the variable c which you have in which you have initiated over here in the line number 5 now if you wanted to look into the output you have to perform the iterations you have to iterate through each element of this particular cursor please remember this particular cursor is preserving your data in a form of nested tuples so let's try to look into the output for table underscore name in c print table underscore name and here you can see that we have various table names and we have all these table names in a nested tuple now we wanted to let's say work with departments table so i wanted to look into the all the tables or maybe all the rows of the department again we will create a a sql query we will execute c dot execute select 
a star from departments semicolon i'll execute this now we have nine so nine means we have nine rows if i <coughs> try to fetch all the rows i'll say all rows is equal to c dot fetch all and it will fetch all the details in a form of a tuple now this is your nested tuple now we can convert this into a data frame using pandas import pandas as pd and df is equal to maybe let's call this as dp department is equal to pd dot data frame and all rows now when when we look into dp this is the data frame but it is not having columns which is the column header let's assign the column header dp dot columns is equal to the first one is dp id which is department id followed by the department name so dp underscore name and dp we are done so this is how we can connect python with a particular database and using pandas we can manipulate or maybe we can perform any kind of analysis on the data which we can extract after running a cursor now let's try to understand how we can get the data from a kaggle competition directly into our google drive so that we can use that data into google collab platform now it is a very simple process and let's try to understand how this works out so the very first thing that we will do is to create a new folder in the drive of the particular google account with which you are working so i'll create a new folder and i'll name this folder as scalar underscore sumit underscore demo please try to make sure that you are not putting any spaces in the folder name because it sometimes create the problem so let's create and now i will navigate myself into this folder now the next thing that we have to do is to quickly go to kaggle platform and if you have already not logged in log in to this account so i'll sign out and i'll quickly log in so i'll say sign in i'll say sign in with your google account and then we'll go to your profile then we will click on this account button scroll down you will find out a option which says create new api token click on this and as soon as you click on this it will download a json file now this is a unique json file so for each user for example since i am the user of this particular account or i am the owner of this particular account for each unique kaggle account you will have a unique credentials which is preserved in this particular kaggle.json file now i'll go back to this a uh, google drive folder and i'll upload this file so i'll drag and drop over here now the next thing is we will launch a collab notebook so let's quickly go to google collaboratory <coughs> it is completely fine if your google collaboratory is not working in the same folder you can put your google collaboratory anywhere in your drive but since i wanted to make sure that all my content or all my material is in the same folder i am basically placing my google collaboratory on the same folder itself let's rename this i'll call this as scalar demo and now first of all i need to mount basically i need to connect this particular folder with this google collab so i have to basically mount the drive i'll go to this file option right now i'm not connected to any uh, run time or maybe any server so it is you, you can see over here it is connecting once it is connected 
click on mount drive it will ask your permission so i'll say connect to google drive i'll pro provide the permission i'll say this account so we will click allow because i want to connect this particular folder or maybe google drive with my google collab so it is basically mounting and once successfully mounted you will find out that i'll get all the content of my drive over here so let's refresh it and here you can see drive folder i'll expand it i'll go to my drive and i'll go to the same folder which says scalar sumit demo so over here we have the folder and here you can find out that i'm having uh the ipython notebook which is the google collab file and kaggle.json file which we have downloaded from the kaggle platform which is the my account page now i have to create a virtual environment basically a environment on which i can use this particular credentials to cre create a secure connection between your google collab notebook and the kaggle account so how we do that let's see i'll use the library os which is operating system and these lines of code are common for all of you like it is not unique for me if you are trying it out at your end you have to do the exact same thing so let's complete the code os dot environment <coughs> i'll create the environment uh as kaggle underscore config underscore dir and over here i'll copy the path of this particular folder place it over here now i'll execute it so what we have done over here we have created a virtual environment where we are trying to create a connection between the kaggle platform and the google drive platform so that we can directly fetch the data from the kaggle platform or the kaggle competition into my google drive now the environment has been created the next thing that we have to do is to change the present working directory so right now my present working directory is slash content i have to change it so i'll say percent cd which is change directory and then i will again copy the path of this folder paste it over here and execute this now my current working directory is changed to this particular folder if you want to cross check just write pwd execute it and you can see that the present working directory is scalar summit demo now what next we have to do i'll go to the particular competition from which i wanted to get the data let's go to some random um, data here we have data sets and let's uh, try to use bitcoin historical data i'll go over here copy api command copy this now go to your google collab and put exclamatory mark and paste this particular api command and now execute this now you can see that i was able to download the data if i go to the same folder and let's quickly refresh this okay you can see that we have a zip file named bitcoin historical data but right now the data is zipped and we cannot directly use it so we have to unzip it how we can do that you do not have to download this file unzip and then upload it using certain commands you can do it keeping the file in the google drive itself let's do it so we will use the command exclamatory mark unzip 
Now I want to unzip all the files with the extension dot zip. So I'll say slash star dot zip. And once they are unzipped, I wanted to remove them also. So I'll say and rm, which is remove all the files with the extension dot zip. Let's run it. And here you can see that this file named Bitcoin historical data dot zip has been unzipped to create the CSV file. Let's check out over here if we have the file or not. We have to wait a little bit. Let's refresh it. Here you can see that the file is now created. Bit stamp USD. This is a CSV file. If I go to over here, here also we have CSV file. Let's copy the path of this file and let's import pandas. Import pandas as pd then data frame is equal to pd dot read underscore csv and we will paste this path now this seems like a very huge file that's the reason it is taking time and now let's check the head so this is the head of the data frame let's check the shape of this file and that is having a lot of rows actually so you can see the size of this file so this is how you can connect your kaggle platform with your google drive to get the data into your google collab notebook so i hope you guys are now clear with both the topics regarding how we can get the data from the kaggle a website or maybe Kaggle competition into your Google Drive and also how we can connect a particular database with Python. So with this, we come to the end of this video. Like this video, share this video with your friends and don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you never miss any update from us. I will see you in the next video.